Talmud, Mas Abed Azara, Chapter I Mission On the three days preceding the festivities of idolaters it is forbidden to transact business with them to lend articles to them or borrow any from them to advance or receive any money from them to repay a debt or receive repayment from them. Our Judah says we should receive repayment from them as this can only depress them but they, the rabbi said to him even though it is depressing at the time they are glad of it subsequently Gemara Rab and Samuel. Differed the one quoting from this mission Ed while the other quoted Ed the one who quoted Ed is not in error nor is the one who quoted Ed in error the one who quoted Ed is not in error since scripture says for the day of their calamity is at hand so also is he who quotes Ed not in error for scripture also says let them bring their witnesses testimonies that they may be justified why does he who quotes Ed not have Ed he might say the term Ed calamity is more applicable to idolatry why then does not the one who quotes Ed have Ed he might say what is it that brings about that calamity if not their testimony hence the term Ed testimony is more apt but does the verse let them bring their witnesses that they may be justified refer to idolaters at all it surely refers to Israel as our Joshua B. Levi said all the good deeds which Israel does in this world will bear testimony unto them in the world to come as it is said let them bring their witnesses that they may be justified that is Israel and let them hear and say it is truth these are the idolaters whereupon are who not the son of our Joshua said that the one who quotes Ed derives it from this verse they that fashion a graven image are all of them vanity and their delectable things shall not profit and their own witnesses see not nor know our hand and be papa some say our simile expounded the foregoing verse thus in times to come the holy one blessed be he will take a scroll of the law in his embrace and proclaim let him who has occupied himself here with come and take his reward thereupon all the nations will crowd together in confusion as it is said all the nations are gathered together etc the holy one blessed be he will then say to them come not before me in confusion but let each nation come in Talmud Mas Abed be with its scribes as it is said and let the peoples be gathered together and the word Leom used here means a kingdom as it is written and one kingdom Uliam shall be stronger than it other kingdom but can there be confusion in the presence of the holy one blessed be he know it is only that they be not confused and so hear what he says to them there upon the kingdom of Edom will enter first before him why first because they are the most important ones do we know they are so important because it is written and he shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces and our Yohanan says that this refers to Rome whose power is known to the whole world and whence do we know that the most important comes forward first because our Hista said when a king and a community appear before the heavenly tribunal the king enters first as it is said that he maintained the cause of his servant king Solomon and then the cause of his people Israel and why is it so you may say because it is not the way of the world that a king shall wait without or you may say in order that the king shall plead before the anger of the judges roused the holy one Blessed be he will then say to them wherewith have you occupied yourselves they will reply O Lord of the universe we have established many marketplaces we have erected many baths we have accumulated much gold and silver and all this we did only for the sake of Israel that they might have leisure for occupying themselves with the study of the Torah the Holy One blessed be he will say in reply you foolish ones among peoples all that which you have done you have only done to satisfy your own desires you have established marketplaces to place courtesans there and baths to revel in them as to the distribution of silver and gold that is mine as it is written mine is the silver and mine is the gold set the Lord of hosts are there any among you who have been declaring this and this is not else than the Torah as it is said and this is the law which Moses set before the children of Israel they will then depart crushed in spirit on the departure of the kingdom of Rome Persia will step Fourth, what Persia next because they are next in importance and how do we know this because it is written and behold another beast a second like to a bear and our Joseph learned that this refers to the Persians who eat and drink greedily like the bear are fleshly like the bear have shaggy hair like the bear and are restless like the bear the Holy One blessed be he will ask of them wherewith have you occupied yourselves and they will reply sovereign of the universe we have built many bridges we have captured many cities we have waged many wars and all this for the sake of Israel that they might engage in the study of the Torah then the Holy One blessed be he will say to them you foolish ones among peoples you have built bridges in order to extract toll you have subdued cities so as to impose forced labor as to waging war I am the Lord of battles as it is said the Lord is a man of war are there any amongst you who have been declaring this and this means not else than the Torah as it is said, and this is the law which Moses set before the children of Israel, they too will then depart crushed in spirit. But why should the Persians, having seen that the Romans achieved not step forward at all, they will say to themselves, The Romans have destroyed the temple, whereas we have built it, and so will every nation fare in turn. But why should the other nations come forth, seeing that those who preceded them had achieved not, they will say to themselves, The others have oppressed Israel, but we have not. And why are these two nations singled out as important and not the others? Because their reign will last till the coming of the Messiah. The nations will then contend, Lord of the universe, hast thou given us the Torah, and have we declined to accept it? But how can they argue, thus seeing that it is written, The Lord came from Sinai and rose from Seir unto them, he shined forth from Mount Paran, and it is also written, God cometh from Taman. What did he seek in Seir, and what did? He seek in Mount Paran our Yohanan says this teaches us that the Holy One blessed be he offered the Torah to every nation and every tongue but none accepted it until he came to Israel who received it how then can they say that the Torah was not offered to them their contention will be this did we accept it and fail to observe it but surely the obvious rejoinder to this their plea would be then why did you not accept it this then will be their contention Lord of the universe didst thou suspend the mountain over us like of all as thou hast done unto Israel and did we still decline to accept it for in commenting on the verse and they stood at the nether part of the mountain our Dimi Bihama said this teaches us that the Holy One blessed be he suspended the mountain over Israel like of all and said unto them if ye accept the Torah it will be well with you but if not there will ye find your grave there upon the Holy One blessed be he will say to them let us then consider the happenings of Old as it is said, let them announce to us former things. There are seven commandments which you did accept. Did you observe them? How do we know that they did not observe them? For our Joseph learned he standeth and shake the earth, he seeth and make the nations to tremble. What did he see? He saw that the nations did not observe even the seven precepts which the sons of Noah had taken upon themselves, and seeing that they did not observe them, he stood up and released them therefrom. Then they benefited by it according to this. It pays to be a sinner, said Mar the son of Rubin Talmud. Mas Abed the release from those commands only means that even if they observed them, they would not be rewarded. But why should they not? Is it not taught? Our mayor used to say, Whence do we know that even an idolater who studies the Torah is equal to a high priest from the following verse? Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my ordinances, which if a man do, he shall live by them. It does not say. If a priest Levi or Israelite do, he shall live by them. But a man here, then you can learn that even a heathen who studies the Torah is equal to a high priest. What is meant then is that they are rewarded not as greatly as one who does a thing which he is bidden to do, but as one who does a thing unbidden for our hand. said, He who is commanded and does stands higher than he who is not commanded and does the nations will then say, Sovereign of the universe, has Israel who accepted the Torah. Observed it, the Holy One, blessed be he will reply, I can give evidence that they observed the Torah, O Lord of the universe. They will argue, Can a father give evidence in favor of his son? For it is written, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Then will the Holy One, blessed be he say, Heaven and earth can bear witness that Israel has fulfilled the entire Torah, but they will object, saying, Lord of the universe, Heaven and earth are partial witnesses, for it is said, If not for my covenant with day and with Night I should not have appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth and our Simeon Belakish further said what is conveyed by the phrase and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day it teaches us that God made a condition with the works of creation saying if Israel accept my law it will be well but if not I shall reduce you to a state of chaos which accords with the comment of our Hezekiah on the verse thou didst cause sentence to be heard from heaven the earth trembled and was still if the earth trembled how could it be still and if it was still how could it tremble but at first it trembled and subsequently it became still then the holy one blessed be he will say some of yourselves shall testify that Israel observed the entire Torah let Nimrod come and testify that Abraham did not consent to worship idols let Laban come and testify that Jacob could not be suspected of theft let Potiphar's wife testify
The Holy One blessed be he will cause the sun to blaze forth over them as at the summer solstice and every one of them will trample down his booth and go away as it is said let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us but you have just said the Holy One blessed be he does not deal imperiously with his creatures true but with the Israelites too it occasionally happens Talmud, Mos Abed Azarabi that the summer solstice extends till the festival of tabernacles and they are vexed by the heat but does not rob a say he who is vexed thereby is free from dwelling in the Sukkah granted they would in such circumstances be freed but would Israelites contemptuously trample it down there upon the Holy One blessed be he will laugh at them as it is said he that sitteth in heaven laugheth said our Isaac only on that day is their laughter for the Holy One blessed be he some connected that comment of our Isaac with the following teaching our Jose says in time to come idle. Worshippers will come and offer themselves as proselytes but will such be accepted has it not been taught that in the days of the Messiah proselytes will not be received likewise were none received in the days of David or of Solomon while they will be self-made proselytes and will place phylacteries on their foreheads and on their arms fringes in their garments and a mezuzah on their doorposts but when the battle of God may God will come about they will be asked for what purpose have you come and they will reply against God and his Messiah as it is said why are the nations in an uproar and why do the peoples mutter in vain etc then each of the proselytes will throw aside his religious token and get away as it is said let us break their bands asunder and the Holy One blessed be he will sit and laugh as it is said he that sitteth in heaven laugheth it was on this that our Isaac remarked that there is no laughter for the Holy One blessed be he except on that day but is there not indeed Yet Rab Judah said in the name of Rab the day consists of twelve hours during the first three hours the Holy One blessed be he is occupying himself with the Torah during the second three he sits in judgment on the whole world and when he sees that the world is so guilty as to deserve destruction he transfers himself from the seat of justice to the seat of mercy during the third quarter he is feeding the whole world from the horned buffalo to the brood of vermin during the fourth quarter he is sporting with the Leviathan as it is said there is Leviathan whom thou hast formed to sport there with said Arnaman be Isaac yes he sports with his creatures but does not laugh at his creatures except on that day Arab said to Arnaman be Isaac since the day of the destruction of the temple there is no laughter for the Holy One blessed be he whence do we know that there is not shall we say from the verse and on that day did the Lord the God of hosts call to weeping and lamentation but this refers to that day and no more shall we then say from this verse if I forget thee O Jerusalem let my right hand forget her cunning let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember thee but this too excludes forgetfulness but not laughter hence it is known from the verse I have long time held my peace I have been still and refrained myself now will I cry what then does God do in the fourth quarter he sits and instructs the school children as it is said whom shall one teach knowledge and whom shall one make to understand the message them that are weaned from the milk who instructed them thereto for if you like you may say Metatron or it may be said that God did this as well as other things and what does he do by night if you like you may say the kind of thing he does by day or it may be said that he rides a light cherub and floats in eighteen thousand worlds for it is said the chariots of God are myriads even thousands Sheen and do not reach Sheen and repeat it but Sheen that are not or it may be said he sits and listens to the song of Ahioth as it is said by the day the Lord will command his loving kindness and in the night his song shall be with me early by says he who discontinues learning words of the Torah and indulges in idle gossip will be made to eat glowing coals of juniper as it is said they pluck salt word with wormwood and the roots of juniper are their food Reshlakish says to him who is engaged in the study of the Torah by night the Holy One extends a thread of grace by day as it is said by day the Lord will command his loving kindness and in the night his song shall be with me for what reason will the Lord command his loving kindness by day because his song shall be with me in the night some report the exposition of Reshlakish thus to him who is engaged in the study of the Torah in this world which is likened unto the night the Holy One blessed be he extends the thread of grace in the future world which is likened unto the day as it is said by day the Lord etc. Rab Judah says in the name of Samuel why is it written and thou makest man as the fishes of the sea and as the creeping things that have no ruler over them why is man here compared to the fishes of the sea to tell you just as the fishes of the sea as soon as they come onto dry land die so also man as soon as he abandons the Torah and the precepts incurs destruction another explanation just as the fishes of the sea as soon as the sun scorches them die so man. When struck by the sun dies this can be applied to the present world or to the future world you can in accordance with our Hanan apply this to the present world for our Hanan says everything is in heaven's hands except cold and he as it said colds and heat boils are in the way of the froward he that keepeth his soul holdeth himself far from them or according to our Simeon Belakish it can be applied to the future life for our Simeon Belakish says there is no Gehenna in the future world but the holy. One blessed be he brings the sun out of its sheath so that it is fierce the wicked are punished by it the righteous are healed by it the wicked are punished Talmud, Mos Abed Azara by it as it is said for behold the day cometh it burneth as a furnace and all the proud and all that work wickedness shall be stubble and the day that cometh shall set them ablaze saith the Lord of hosts that it shall leave them neither root nor branch it shall leave them neither root in this world nor branch. In the world to come the righteous are healed by it as it is said but unto you that fear my name shall the sun of righteousness arise with healing in its wings moreover they will revel therein as it is said and ye shall go forth and gamble as calves of the stall another explanation just as among fish of the sea the greater swallow up the smaller one so with men were it not for fear of the government men would swallow each other alive this is just what we learned our hand of the deputy high priest. Said pray for the welfare of the government for were it not for the fear thereof men would swallow each other alive our Hina be Papa pointed to the following contradiction scripture says as to the Almighty we do not find him exercising plenteous power yet it says great is our Lord and of abundant power and also thy right hand O Lord is become glorious in power the answer is there is no contradiction here the former refers to the time of judgment the latter refers to a time of war our Hamabi. Hanan pointed to another contradiction scripture says fury is not in me yet it also says the Lord Reverend Geth and is furious but there is really no contradiction the former refers to Israel the latter to idolaters our Hina be Papa or our Ahabi Hanan explains the foregoing verse thus fury is not in me for I already vowed would that I had not so vowed then as the briars and thorns in flame I would with one step burn it all together this accords with the following teaching of our Alexandria what is it? Meaning of the verse, and it shall come to pass on that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations, seek among whom what the Holy One blessed be he says is I will seek their records. If they have any meritorious deeds to their credit, I will redeem them, but if not, I will destroy them. This also accords with what Rabbah said. What is the meaning of the verse? Howbeit he will not stretch out a hand for a ruinous heap, though they cry in his destruction. The Holy One blessed be he said to Israel, When I judge Israel, I do not judge them as I do the idolaters concerning whom it is said, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, but I only exact payment from them little at a time as the hand does for picking another explanation, even if Israel does before me, but few good deeds at a time like hands picking in a rubbish heap, I will make it accumulate to a large sum as it is said, though they pick little, they are saved. Another rendering is as a reward of their crying unto me, I help them. This is similar to what our Abba said, what is the meaning of the verse? Though I would redeem them, yet they have spoken lies against me. I thought I would redeem them by depriving them of monetary possessions in this world, so that they be worthy to merit the world to come. Yet they, etc., which is in agreement with what our Papi said in the name of Rabba. What is the meaning of the verse? Though I have trained yesterday, strengthened their arms, yet do they imagine mischief against me? The Holy One blessed be. He says, I thought I would chastise them with suffering in this world, so that their arm might be strengthened in the world to come. Yet they, etc., our Abba commended our Safra to the minimum as a learned man, and he was thus exempted by them from paying taxes for thirteen years. One day, on coming across him, they said to him, It is written, You only have I known or loved from all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will visit upon you all your iniquities. If one is in anger, does one vent it on one's friend? But he was silent. And could give them no answer, so they wound a scarf round his neck and tortured him. When Arab came and found him in that state, he said to them, Why do you torture him? Said they, Have you not told us that he is a great
Moment and how long is a moment? 153,848 of an hour is a moment. No creature could ever precisely fix this moment except Allah the wicked of whom it is written Talmud. Mas Abed is Arabi who knew the knowledge of the Most High is that possible he did not know the mind of his animal. How could he have known the mind of the Most High? What is meant by the words he did not know the mind of his animal at the time when he was seen riding on his ass? They said to him, Why do you not ride on a horse? And he replied, I consigned mine to the meadow whereupon the ass said, Am I not thy ass just for carrying burdens? He interrupted, She continued, Upon whom thou hast written only casually, he again interrupted, But she continued, Ever since I was thine, what is more, she added, I have carried you by day and have been thy companion by night for the word I was wont his can to use here is analogous to the word letter be his companion, so Kneth used elsewhere. What then is the meaning of he knew the knowledge of the Most High? He knew the exact hour when the Holy One blessed be he is angry. This indeed is what the Prophet is alluding to when he says, O oh my people, remember now what Balak king of Moab consulted and what Balaam son of Beer answered him from Shittim unto Gilgal that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord said, Our Eliezer, the Holy One blessed be he said to Israel, O oh my people, see how many righteous acts I did for you and that I abstained from. Anger all those days for had I been in anger, none would have remained or been spared of Israel's enemies. This too is what Balaam refers to when he says, How can I curse seeing that God doth not curse and how can I be wrathful seeing that the Lord hath not been wrathful and how long does his wrath last a moment? Riga and how long is a Riga said, Amimar, others say, Rubin, as long as it takes to utter this word and whence do we know that his wrath lasts a moment because it is written for his anger? Is for a moment his favor is for a lifetime, or if you wish from this verse, hide thyself for a little moment until the wrath be passed. When is he wrathful? Said Abbe during the first three hours when the comb of the cock is white and is it not white at all other times? At other times it has red streaks. At that time there are no red streaks in it. Or Joshua Bilabi used to be pestered by a man with taunts about scriptural verses. One day the rabbi took a cock and placed it between the legs of it. Bet and watched it thinking when that hour will arrive I shall curse him. When that hour did arrive he was dozing, whereupon he said, You can learn from this that it is not proper to act thus. His tender mercies are over all his works, is what scripture says, and it also says, Neither is it good for the righteous to punish it. Was taught in the name of our Mahir. It is when the kings place their crowns on their heads and bow down to the sun that the Holy One blessed be he at once becomes wrathful, said R. Joseph, no one should recite the prayer of the additional service on the first day of the new year during the first three hours of the day in private, lest since judgment is then preceding his deeds may be scrutinized and the prayer rejected. But if that be so, I should apply to congregational prayer. Also, the collective merits of a congregation are greater. In that case, the prayer of the morning service too should not be recited in private. That is not so, since there is sure to be a congregation praying at the same time. The prayer will not be rejected. But have you not said during the first three hours the Holy One, blessed be He, is occupying Himself with the Torah? During the second three, He sits in judgment over the whole world. You may reverse the order, or if you wish, you may say it need not be reversed while occupied with the Torah, which Scripture designates as truth, as it is written by the truth, and sell it not. The Holy One, blessed be He, will not overstep the line. Of justice, but when sitting in judgment, which is not designated by Scripture as truth, the Holy One, blessed be He, may overstep the line of justice towards mercy to revert to the above text. Our Joshua believe I said, What is the meaning of the verse? The ordinances which I command thee this day to do them, it is that this day only is the time to do them. They cannot be done in the time to come. This day is the time in which to do them, but not in which to be rewarded for them. Our Joshua believe I also said, All the good deeds which Israel does in this world will bear testimony unto them in the world to come. As it is said, Let them bring their witnesses that they may be justified. Let them hear and say it is truth. Let them bring their witnesses that they may be justified. That is Israel. Let them hear and say it is truth. These are the idolaters. Our Joshua believe I also said, All the good deeds which the Israelites do in this world will come and flutter before the faces of the idolaters in the world too. Come as it is said, keep therefore and do them for this your wisdom and understanding will be in the eyes of the peoples. It does not say in the presence of the peoples, but in the eyes of the peoples that teaches you that they will come and flutter before the faces of the idolaters in the world to come. Our Joshua believe I further said the Israelites made the golden calf only in order to place a good argument in the mouth of the penitents as it is said, oh that they had such a heart as this always do. Fear me and keep all my commandments, etc. This last statement accords with what our Yohanan said in the name of our Simeon Biohi David was not the kind of man to do that act, nor was Israel the kind of people to do that act. David was not the kind of man to do that act, as it is written, My heart is slain within me, nor were the Israelites the kind of people to commit that act, for it is said, oh that they had such a heart as this always, etc. Why then did they act thus Talmud, Mas Abed Azara, God? Predestined it so in order to teach thee that if an individual hath sinned and hesitates about the effect of repentance, he could be referred to the individual David, and if a community commit a sin, they should be told, Go to the community, and both these instances are necessary, for if the case of the individual only were mentioned, it might have been thought that pardon is granted because his sin is not generally known, but in the case of a community whose sins are publicly known, it might not be so. If on the other hand the case of a community only were mentioned, it might have been thought because they command greater mercy, but with an individual whose merits are not so numerous, it is not so, hence both are necessary. This accords with the following saying of our Samuel B. Namani, who said in the name of our Jonathan, What is the meaning of the verse, the saying of David, the son of Jesse, and the saying of the man raised on high? It means this, the saying of David, the son of Jesse, the man. Who elevated the yoke of repentance? Our Samuel B. Namani in the name of our Jonathan also said, Every good deed that one does in this world precedes him and walks in front of him in the world to come, as it is said, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Likewise, every transgression that one commits clasps him and leads him on the day of judgment, as it is said, they clasp him in the course of their way. Our Eliezer said, It is tied unto him like a dog, is it? Is said, He here can not unto her to lie by her to be with her. It is to say that to lie by her in this world would mean for him to be with her in the world to come. Said, Reshalakish, come, let us render gratitude to our forebears, for had they not sinned, we should not have come to the world, as it is said, I said, Ye are gods and all of you sons of the Most High, now that you have spoiled your deeds, ye shall indeed die like mortals, etc. Are we to understand that if the Israelites had not committed? That sin they would not have propagated had it not been said, and you be a fruitful and multiply that refers to those who lived up to the times of Sinai, but of those at Sinai too it is said, Go say to them, return ye to your tents, which means to the joy of family life, and is it not also said that it might be well with them and with their children, it means to those of their children who stood at Sinai, but did not rush Lakish himself say, What is the meaning of the verse? This is the book of it. Generations of Adam did Adam have a book. What it implies is that the Holy One blessed be he showed to Adam every coming generation with its expositors, every generation with its sages, every generation with its leaders. When he reached the generation of our Akiba, he rejoiced at his teaching, but was grieved about his death and said, How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God. Also, what of the teaching of our Hosea, the son of David, will only come when all the souls destined to inhabit earthly bodies? Will be exhausted as it is said, for I will not contend forever, neither will I be always wroth, for the spirit should fall before me, and the spirits which I have made do not take reshalate, saying to mean that if our ancestor had not sinned, we should not have come to the world, but that they would have become immortal, and we should have been disregarded as if we had never come to the world. Does that mean then that if they had not sinned, they would have been immune from death? But there are written in the Torah the chapter about the widow of a man dying without issue, and the chapter about inheritances. These were written conditionally, but our conditional passages written in the Torah certainly for our Simeon Belaish said, What is the meaning of the verse? And it was evening, and it was morning. The sixth day it teaches us that the Holy One blessed be he made a condition with all creation, saying, If Israel will accept the Torah, all will be well, but if not, I will turn the world. Void and without form the following objection was then raised the verse so that they had such a heart as this always that it may be well with them and their children cannot obviously refer to the abolition of the angel of death
My ways I should soon subdue their enemies or in the verse o that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments then had thy peace been as a river thy seat also had been as a sand etc. Our rabbis taught in the verse o that they had such a heart always Moses said to the Israelites ye are an ungrateful people the offspring of an ungrateful ancestor when the Holy One blessed be he said to you who might grant that they had such a heart always you should have said thou grant they proved themselves. Ungrateful by saying our soul of the Talmud, Mos Abed Azara be this light bread the offspring of an ungrateful ancestor for it is written the woman whom thou gavest to be with me she gave me of the tree and I did eat yet Moses indicated this to the Israelites only after forty years had passed as it is said and I have led you forty years in the wilderness but the Lord hath not given you a heart to know and eyes to see and ears to hear unto this day said Rabba from this you can learn that. It may take one forty years to know the mind of one's master Aryohan and said on behalf of Arbana what is the meaning of the verse blessed are ye that sow beside all waters that send forth the feet of the ox and the acid means this blessed is Israel when they occupy themselves with Torah and acts of kindness their inclination is mastered by them not they by their inclination as it is said blessed are ye that sow beside all waters for what is meant by sowing but doing kind deeds as it is. Said so to yourselves in righteousness reap according to mercy and what is meant by water is Torah as it is said O ye who are thirsty come to the water the phrase that sent forth the feet of the ox and the ass was explained in the Tanah Biliyahu thus in order to study the words of the Torah one must cultivate in oneself the habit of the ox for bearing a yoke and of the ass for carrying burdens on the three days preceding their festivals it is forbidden to do any business. Transaction with them is all this period necessary have we not learned at four periods of the year it is necessary for one when selling cattle to another for slaughter to let him know if its dam had been sold or if its young had been sold to be slain the same day namely the eve of the last day of the feast of tabernacles the eve of the first day of Passover the eve of Pentecost and the eve of the new year and according to our Jose the Galilean also on the day preceding the eve of the day of Atonement in Galilee in those cases where the animals are bought for consumption one day is enough but in the case where these are required for sacrifices three days are needed but are three days enough in the case of sacrifices have we not learned the laws relating to Passover should be discussed for thirty days before the Passover our Simeon B. Gamaliel says two weeks we with whom blemish is disqualifying a sacrifice abound since we disqualify an offering even because of a blemish in the eye. Lid require thirty days but for the heathen who only take note of a missing limb three days suffice and so also our Eliezer said how do we know that an animal short of a limb is forbidden to know a kites for use as a sacrifice because it is written of every living thing of all flesh to of every sort shall thou bring into the ark the Torah thus says bring such cattle whose principal limbs are living i.e. sound but is not this phrase needed to exclude such animals as are trefaso that they were. Not brought into the ark Trefa is excluded by the phrase to keep seed alive this answer holds good according to the one who is of the opinion that an animal which is Trefa cannot bear any young Talmud, Mos Abed Azara, but according to the one who holds that a Trefa animal can bear what answer would you give this the word spoken to Noah or thou shalt bring with thee which implies such as are like thyself but how can we tell that Noah himself was not mortally affected because he is described as perfect does this not rather mean that he was perfect in his manners that is implied by his being described as righteous but does not this phrase rather mean perfect in his manners and righteous in his deeds it cannot enter your mind in any case that Noah himself was mortally affected for were he so affected with the divine law have bidden him take an animal similarly affected and keep out whole ones well now that we deduce this from the phrase with thee wherefore do we need the phrase to keep seed alive with thee might mean such as could just keep him company even if they be old or castrate therefore the divine law had to indicate to keep seed alive the question was asked does three days mean inclusive of the festivals or apart from the festivals come and here our Ishmael says on the three preceding and the three following days it is forbidden now if it should enter your mind that the numbers given are inclusive of the festival itself our Ishmael must be taken to include the day of the festival both in the preceding and following days not at all it is only because he uses the words three preceding that he also speaks of the three following come then and hear the comment of our Talafabi of Dimi in the name of Samuel according to our Ishmael it should always be forbidden to transact business with idolaters because of Sunday now were we to take it that the festival is to be included there would still remain Wednesday and Thursday on which dealing would be Permitted according to our Ishmael there is no question but that the period does not include the festivals themselves it is only according to the rabbi's opinion that I ask what is the law said Rabbanah come and hear the following mission these are the festivals of idolaters Kalenda Saturnalia and Kratesis now our Hanin Birabba explained that Kalenda lasts for eight days after the winter equinox and Saturnalia is kept on the eight days preceding the equinox as an imam to take the verse thou hast beset me behind and before now were you inclined to think that the periods are inclusive of the festivals then there are at times ten days the Tana may regard the whole Kalenda as one day said our Ashi come and hear our mission says on the three days preceding the festivities of the idolaters now were it to mean that the period is to include the festival itself it might have said at the festivals of the idolaters for three days or even if you contend that the words preceding the Festival are necessary to avoid their being applied to those after the festival it might still have said at the festivals of the idolaters for three days preceding them but from the words actually used you can only deduce that the period is exclusive of the festival this is conclusive the question was asked is it forbidden because of the prophet or perhaps because thou shalt not put a stumbling block before the blind the difference would affect a case where an idolater has an animal of his own if you say one must not sell him one because of prophet here too the prophet is derived if however you say it is because of placing a stumbling block before the blind here then he has a sacrifice of his own and if he has one of his own does the placing of a stumbling block before the blind not apply have we not learned that our Nathan said Talmud, Mos Abed Azarabi how do we know that one should not hold out a cup of wine to a Nazi right or a limb from a living animal to an Oikai from Scripture which says thou shalt not put a stumbling block before the blind now here too were it not held out to him he could take it himself yet the one who hands it is guilty of placing a stumbling block before the blind here we may be dealing with a case of two persons on opposite sides of a river you can prove it indeed by the use of the words one should not hold out it does not say one should not hand this proves it the question was asked what if one did transact business are Yohanan says the proceeds of the transaction are forbidden our Simeon B. Lakish says the proceeds of the transaction are permitted are Yohanan cited the following as an argument against Resh Lakish as to the festivals of idolaters if one transacts any business the proceeds are forbidden does not this refer to the period preceding the festivals no it refers to the festival exclusively some reported was our Simeon B. Lakish who cited this passage as an argument against our Yohanan as to the festivals of Idolaters if one transacts any business the proceeds are forbidden during their festivals only it is forbidden but before their festival it is not known by their festivals the tana means the one as well as the other there is a very the which is in accordance with the view of Resh Lakish the prohibition of transacting business with them before their festivals only applies to unperishable articles but not to perishable articles and even in the case of unperishable articles if the transaction is made the proceeds are permitted Arzib learned out of the very of an article that is perishable may be sold to them but may not be bought from them a certain man once sent on his festival day a caesarean dinar to our Juden while Resh Lakish happened to sit before him said he what shall I do if I accept it he will go and praise the idols for it if I do not accept it he will be displeased take it answered Resh Lakish and drop it into a well in the messenger's presence but this will displease him all the more I mean you should do it by sleight of hand to lend articles to them or borrow any from them it is quite right to forbid lending to them which benefits them but surely borrowing from them can only mean deprivation to them said Abbe we forbid the borrowing from them as a safeguard against lending to them but Rabbah said it is all on account of their going to offer thanks to lend them money or borrow any from them it is quite right to forbid lending them money which profits them but why not borrow any from them Abbe said the borrowing is forbidden as a safeguard against lending Rabbah however said both are forbidden because of their going to offer thanks to repay a debt or receive repayment from them the forbidding of repayment is quite right since it benefits them but to recover from them
Receive repayment from them as this can only depress them but the rabbi said to him even though it is depressing at the time they are glad of it subsequently does Arjuna then disregard the idea that though it is depressing at the time it is pleasing subsequently is it not taught Arjuna says a woman must not smear lime on her face on mode because it disfigures her Arjuna however admits that if the lime can still be scraped off during mode it may be applied on mode for though she is troubled by it for the while it will eventually please her said Arnam and be Isaac leave alone the laws relating to work permitted on mode they are all of the trouble now pleasure later kind Rabban is said to an idolater the matter of repayment is always irksome our mission is not in accord with the opinion of Arjashu Bikarha for it is taught Arjashu Bikarha says a loan made against a document should not be recovered from them but a loan made against the word of mouth may be recovered from them since it is as it were rescued from their hands our Joseph was sitting behind our Abba while our Abba was sitting facing our Huna who as he was sitting and lecturing stated in one instance the Halacha is to be decided according to our Joshua Bikarha and in another the Halacha is according to our Judah the law decided according to our Joshua is the one about which we have just spoken that according to our Judah refers to what we learned if one gives wool to a dyer to be dyed red and he dyed it black or to be dyed black and he dyed it red Talmud Mas Abba Dazara Ar Meir says the dyer should refund to the owner the value of his wool our Judah says if the increase in value through the dyeing exceeds the outlay thereon the owner may refund the outlay or if the outlay exceeds the increased value he may offer him the increase in value thereupon our Joseph turned his face away and remarked it was right and necessary to state that the Halacha is according to our Joshua Bikarha we might. Indeed have applied the principle where the opinions of an individual and of a majority conflict the Halachah is according to the majority so we are given to understand that here the Halachah is according to the individual but wherefore state that the law is according to our Judah it is a commonplace that where differing opinions are quoted and one of these is subsequently quoted anonymously the law is decided according to the anonymous opinion now these differing opinions are quoted in Baba Kama and there is a subsequent anonymous opinion in Baba Mizia where we learn that the party which changes an agreement has a lesser right likewise whichever party alters his mind has a lesser right and as to our whom his statement is necessary because the mission has not retained its original order so that it might be said that the anonymous statement was quoted earlier and the differing opinions later but if that were so you can apply to every case of differing opinions Followed by an anonymous one, the argument that the mission has not retained its original order, Arhuna, however, could reply thus the argument that the mission has not its original order could not be admitted in regard to the same tractate, but it could be used in regard to two tractates, and as to our Joseph, he holds that all those dealing with torts are to be regarded as one tractate, or if you wish it could be said because this rule is included among legal and fixed decisions, thus the party. Which changes an agreement has a lesser right, and whichever party alters his mind has a lesser right. Our rabbis taught one should not say to another on the Sabbath, We shall see whether you will stay on with me to do work this evening. Our Joshua Bikarha says one may say to another, We shall see whether you will stay on with me this evening, said Rabbi Bibarhan in the name of our Yohanan the Halacha is according to our Joshua Bikarha, our rabbis taught if one consulted a sage who declared it. Person or article as unclean, he should not consult another sage who might declare it as clean. If one sage declared as forbidden, one should not consult another sage who might declare as permitted. If of two sages present, one declares as unclean and the other as clean, one forbids and the other permits. Then if one of them is superior to the other in learning and in point of number, his opinion should be followed. Otherwise, the one holding the stricter view should be followed. Our Joshua Bikarha says in laws of the Torah follow the stricter view, and those of Sofrim follow the more lenient view. Said our Joseph the Halachah is according to our Joshua Bikarha. Our rabbis taught if they reverted to their usual practices, none of them should ever be accepted. This is the opinion of our Meir. Our Judah says if they reverted in secret matters, they should not be accepted. But if in things done in public, they should be accepted. Some say that if they observed in their penitent state, even secret things, they should be accepted Talmud, Mas Abed is Arabi, but if only things done in public they should not be accepted. Our Simeon and our Joshua Bikarha say whether in the one case or in the other they should be accepted for it is said return O backsliding children said our Isaac the native of Faraco in the name of our Yohan and the Halachah is according to the latter peer mission our Ishmael says on the three preceding days and the three following days it is forbidden but the sages say before their festivities. It is forbidden but after their festivities it is permitted Gemara said our Talafabi of Dimi in the name of Samuel according to our Ishmael it should always be forbidden to transact business with idolaters because of Sunday but the sages say before their festivities it is forbidden but after their festivities it is permitted is not the opinion of the sages identical with that of the first Tana the exclusion of the festivals themselves is the point on which they differ the first Tana holds. That the period is exclusive of the festival, but these latter rabbis hold that it includes the festivals, or it might probably be said that they differ on the question of business transactions carried out. The first tana holding that the proceeds of such transactions are permissible, while our latter rabbis hold that the proceeds of these transactions are forbidden. It might also be said that this ruling of Samuel is a matter on which they differ. For Samuel said in the diaspora, the prohibition is limited to their festival day. Only the first tana accepts Samuel's ruling, while our last rabbis do not hold with Samuel. You may further say that they differ in the ruling of Nahum the Mead, for it is taught Nahum the Mead says the prohibition applies to only one day before their festivals. The first tana does not accept the ruling of Nahum the Mead, and our latter rabbis do agree with Nahum the Mead's ruling to revert to the above text. Nahum the Mead says the prohibition applies to only one. Day before their festivals, thereupon they said to him, This matter ought to be suppressed and left unsaid. But are there not our latter rabbis who hold the same opinion? Our latter rabbis may be none other than Nahum the Mead, another bury the taught Nahum the Mead says one may sell to idolaters a male or old horse in wartime. Whereupon they said to him, This matter ought to be suppressed and left unsaid. But is there not Banbathera who holds the same opinion? For we learned Banbathera permits. The sale of a horse Banbathera makes no distinction between the sale of horses and Maris, whereas Nahum the Mead who does make that distinction will share the opinion of the rabbis. But according to the rabbis, this matter ought to be suppressed and left unsaid. It is further taught Nahum the Mead says the dill plant is subject to tithe, whether in its state of seeds or vegetables or pods. Whereupon he was told this matter ought to be suppressed and left unsaid. But is there not our Eliezer who? Holds the same opinion for we learned our Eliezer said the dill plant is subject to tithe whether in its state of seeds or vegetable or pods there the garden variety is meant said our Ahabi Minyamai Juave a great man has come from our place but whatever he says he is told that it ought to be suppressed and left unsaid he replied there is one instance in which we do follow his ruling it is taught Nahum the Mead says one may ask for one's own needs in the course of the benediction concluding with who heareth prayer as to this ruling he said an exception had to be made for it is hanging on strong ropes it is taught our Eliezer says one should first pray for his own needs and then recite the prayer as it is said a prayer for the afflicted himself when he is overwhelmed and then poureth forth his meditation before the Lord and by meditation only prayer is meant as it is said and Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide but our Joshua says one should first recite the prayer and then ask for his own needs as it is said I pour out my meditation before him then I declare my own affliction before him now as to our Eliezer what of the verse I pour out my meditation etc he interprets it thus I pour out my meditation before him when I had already declared my own affliction and as to our Joshua how does he explain the verse a prayer for the afflicted when he is overwhelmed etc he explains it thus when is the personal prayer for the afflicted offered when he had poured forth his meditation before the Lord well now as for these scriptural verses they prove no more the statement of the one than they prove that of the other is there any principle underlying their dispute it is the one explained by our simile for our simile gave the following exposition one should always recount the praises of the omnipresent and then offer his supplications whence do we learn it from the prayer of our teacher Moses which is recorded thus O Lord God thou hast begun to Show thy servant thy greatness, etc., and then only let me go over, I pray thee, and see the good land Talmud. Mas Abed Azara, now our Joshua holds
The benediction who heareth prayer yet if one is disposed to offer supplication after the prayer to the extent of the day of atonement service he may do so mission of these are the festivities of the idolaters Galenda Saturnalia Cratesis the anniversary of accession to the throne as well as royal birthdays and anniversaries of deaths this is our mayor's opinion but the sages say a death at which burning of articles of the dead takes place is attended by idolatry but where there is not such burning there is no idolatry however the day of shaving one's beard or lock of hair or the day of landing after a sea voyage or the day of release from prison or if an idolater holds a banquet for his son the prohibition only applies to that day and that particular person Gamara said Arhanan Birab Galenda is kept on the eight days following the winter equinox Saturnalia on the eight days preceding the equinox as a mnemonic take the verse thou hast beset me behind and before our rabbis taught. When primitive Adam saw the day getting gradually shorter he said woe is me perhaps because I have seen the world around me is being darkened and returning to its state of chaos and confusion this then is the kind of death to which I have been sentenced from heaven so he began keeping an eight days fast but as he observed the winter equinox and noted the day getting increasingly longer he said this is the world's course and he set forth to keep an eight days festivity in the following year he appointed both as festivals now he fixed them for the sake of heaven but the heathens appointed them for the sake of idolatry this is quite right according to the one who holds that the world was created in Tishri so that he saw the short days before seeing the longer days but according to the one holding that the world was created in this and Adam must have seen the long days as well as the short ones still he had not yet seen the very short days our rabbis taught when Adam on the day of his Creation saw the setting of the sun he said alas it is because I have sinned that the world around me is becoming dark the universe will now become again void and without form this then is the death to which I have been sentenced from heaven so he sat up all night fasting and weeping and he was weeping opposite him when however dawn broke he said this is the usual course of the world he then arose and offered up a bullet whose horns were developed before it who says it is said by the psalmist and it my thanksgiving shall please the Lord better than a bullet that hath horns and hoofs Judah said in the name of Samuel the bullet which Adam offered had only one horn in its forehead as the verse says and it shall please the Lord better than a bullet that is horned and hoof but does not horn imply two horns said Arnam and B. Isaac horned is here spelt effectively Armatina asked when Rome appoints a calendar and there are towns in its vicinity subjected to her is it Forbidden or permitted to transact business, etc. In those towns, our Joshua Bili by said on the calendar, the prohibition applies to all our Yohanan. Said the prohibition applies only to the Romans who celebrated a very is taught which accords with the view of our Yohanan. Even though it was said that when Rome institutes calendars, they extend to all the towns in its vicinity which are subjected to it. Yet the actual prohibition is only in regard to those who celebrate it. As to Saturnalia Cratesis, royal celebrations or the day on which a king is proclaimed, the prohibition applies to the period preceding them. But thereafter, it is permitted if an idolater gives a banquet for his son. The prohibition is limited to that day. And that man said, our Ashi, we ourselves have learned likewise for our mission states as to the day of shaving one's beard or lock of hair or the day of landing after a sea voyage or the day of release from prison. The prohibition only applies to that day and that particular. Person now it rightly says that day thereby excluding the preceding and following days but what is that man meant to exclude unless it excludes those subjected to him from here then you deduce it it has been taught our Ishmael says Israelites who reside outside Palestine serve idols though in pure innocence if for example an idolater gives a banquet for his son and invites all the Jews in his town then even though they eat of their own and drink of their own and their own attendant waits on them scripture regards them as if they had eaten of the sacrifices to dead idols as it is said and he will call thee and thou wilt eat of his sacrifice but does not this apply to actual eating said Rabbi if that were so the verse would have only said and thou shalt eat of his sacrifice why then say and he will call thee that extends the prohibition to the time of the participation hence Talmud Mas Abed Azarabi during the entire thirty days following a marriage celebration whether it is or it is not mentioned that the banquet is connected with the wedding participation and it is forbidden from that time onward however if it is stated that it is connected with the wedding it is forbidden but if its connection with the wedding is not mentioned it is permitted and how long is it forbidden if it is connected with the wedding said our papa for a 12 month thereafter and how long is it forbidden beforehand said our papa in the name of Rabba from the time when the barley is placed in the tub is it then permitted to partake of food in the house after the 12 month yet our Isaac the son of our Meshachia who happened to be in the house of a certain idolater more than a year after a marriage when he heard that they were feasting because of that event abstained from eating there it is different with our Isaac the son of our Meshachia who was a highly esteemed man Cratesis etc what does Cratesis mean said Rab Judah in the name of Samuel the anniversary of the day on which Rome extended her dominion, but have we not learned Cratesis and the day on which Rome extended her dominion? Said our Joseph, Rome extended her dominion twice once in the days of Cleopatra, the queen of Egypt, and once before in the days of the Greeks. For when Ardini came, he said, Thirty-two battles did the Romans fight against the Greeks and could not prevail against them until the Romans made an alliance with the Israelites, and these were the conditions made with them if the kings are chosen. From among us the princes should be chosen from your midst, and if the kings are chosen from among you, the princes shall come from our midst, and the Romans sent word to the Greeks as follows Hitherto we have been fighting matters out now. Let us argue them out of a pearl and a precious stone which shall form a setting for which they sent to reply the pearl for the precious stone and of a precious stone and an onyx which shall form a setting to the other the precious stone to the onyx was the Reply of an onyx and the book of the law which shall serve as a setting for the other the onyx for the book of the law they replied the Romans and sent word in that case the book of the law is in our possession for Israel is with us thereupon the Greeks gave in for twenty six years did the Romans keep faith with Israel thereafter they subdued them what scriptural support did they have for their former attitude and what for the latter to the former may be applied the words let us take our journey and let us go and to the latter may be applied the words let my lord now pass before his servant whence can it be proved that Rome kept faith with Israel for twenty six years from the following for our Kahana said when our Ishmael be Jose was ill they sent word to him Rabbi tell us the two or three things which thou hadst told us in thy father's name he then told them one hundred and eighty years before the temple was destroyed did Rome cast her rule over Israel eighty years before the destruction of the temple it was decreed that neighboring countries of Palestine were to be regarded as ritually unclean and likewise all glass vessels forty years before the temple was destroyed did the Sanhedrin abandon the temple and held its sittings in Hunnith as this any legal bearing said our Isaac B. of Dimia indicates that from that time onward they did not deal with cases of fines cases of fines how can that enter your mind has not Rab Judah said the following in the name of Rab verily that man our Judah be Baba by name be remembered for good for were it not for him the laws of fine would have been forgotten in Israel forgotten surely they could be studied nay they would have been abolished for the wicked government of Rome issued a decree that he who ordains a rabbi shall be slain likewise he who is ordained shall be put to death the town in which an ordination takes place shall be destroyed and the tomb in which the ordination is held shall be laid waste what did our Judah be Baba do he went and sat down between two mountains and between two large towns between two Tihams namely between Ishai and Shepharam and there he ordained five elders our Meir our Judah be Ilaiir Hosea our Simeon and our Eliezer be Shamu our Uwe adds also our Nehemiah on seeing that they were detected by the enemies he said to them flee my children but they said to him and you are Rabbi what about you I he replied will I still before them even as a stone that is not turned it was stated that the Romans did not move from there until they drove three hundred iron spears into his body and made his corpse like a sea but said Arnaman be Isaac say not that cases of fine cease but that capital cases cease why because when the Sanhedrin saw that murderers were so prevalent that they could not be properly dealt with judicially they said rather let us be exiled from place to place than pronounce them guilty of capital offenses for it is written and thou shalt do according to the Sentence which they of that place which the Lord shall choose shall tell thee which implies that it is the place that matters now it was mentioned above that Rome cast her rule over Israel 180 years prior to the destruction is not the period longer for our Jose B. Rabb
world is to exist 6,000 years the first 2,000 years are to be void the next 2,000 years are the period of the Torah and the following 2,000 years are the period of the Messiah through our many sins a number of these have already passed and the Messiah is not yet from when are the 2,000 years of the Torah to be reckoned shall we say from the giving of the Torah at Sinai in that case you will find that there are not quite 2,000 years from until now i.e. the year 4,000 after the creation for if you compute the years from the creation to the giving of the Torah you will find that they comprise 2,000 and part of the 3,000 the period is therefore to be reckoned from the time when Abraham and Sarah had gotten souls in Haran for we have it as a tradition that Abraham was at that time 52 years old now to what extent does our Tana encroach on the other 1,448 years calculated and you will find that from the time when they had gotten souls in Haran till the giving of the Torah there are just 448 years said our Papa if the Tana does not know the exact number of years of the period of the Messiah that have passed let him ask a notary what year he uses in his writings and on adding 48 to it he will find his solution as an Imanic Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi take the phrase 48 cities if on the other hand the notary is uncertain. As to his number let him ask the Tana how many he counts and deduct there from 48 and he will find his solution as an Imanic take the phrase the scribe is sparing the Tana is redundant said Arunah the son of Arjashua if one does not know what the year is in the sabbatical cycle of seven years let him add one year to that in the era of the destruction and let him put aside the hundreds as jubilee cycles and convert the remainder into sabbatical cycles of seven years each after. Adding there to two years for every complete century what is left over will give him the number of the given year in the current sabbatical cycle as a mnemonical sign for adding two years for every century think of the verse for these two years hath the famine been in the land said our Hannah from the year 400 after the destruction onwards if one says unto you buy a field that is worth 1000 denarii for one denar do not buy it in the very that is taught from the year 4,231 of the creation of the world onward if one says unto you buy the a field that is worth 1000 denarii for one denar do not buy it what difference is there between these two given periods there is a difference of three years between them the one of the berith of being three years longer there was produced in court a document which was dated Talmud, Mas Abed Azara six years ahead the rabbis who were sitting before Rabba were of opinion that it should be pronounced the post-dated document which is to be deferred and not executed until the date which it bears whereupon our nom and said this document must have been written by a scribe who was very particular and took into account the six years of the Greek reign in Elam which we do not reckon the dating is therefore correct for we have learned Rabbi Jose said six years did the Greeks reign in Elam and thereafter their dominion extended universally our Ahabi Jacob then put this question how do we know that our era of documents is connected with the kingdom of Greece at all why not say that it is reckoned from the exodus from Egypt omitting the first thousand years and giving the years of the next thousand in that case the document is really post-dated said Arnaman in the diaspora the Greek era alone is used he the questioner thought that Arnaman wanted to dispose of him anyhow but when he went and studied it thoroughly he found that it is indeed taught in the very in the Diaspora the Greek era alone is used said Rabban our mission also proves this for we learn the first of Nisan is New Year for reckoning the reign of kings and of festivals and to the question the reign of kings what is the practical object of this law our historic replied it affects the dating of documents now the same mission says the first of Tishri is New Year for counting years and sabbatical cycles and when it was asked what practical significance has this ruling our Histog again replied it affects the dating of documents the question was then raised is not this rule of dating documents self contradictory and the answer given was the one refers to Jewish kings the other to kings of Gentile nations the year of Gentile kings being counted from Tishri and of Jewish kings from Nisan now in the present time we count the years from Tishri were we then to say that our era is connected with the Exodus it is surely from Nisan that we ought to count does this not prove that our Reckoning is based on the reign of the Greek kings and not on the Exodus that indeed proves it the anniversary of the Genosia accession of even kings etc. What is meant by Genosia of even kings said Rab Judah it is the day on which the king is raised to the throne but has it not been taught elsewhere the day of Genosia and the day of the king's accession there is no difficulty there the one term indicates the king's own accession the other that of his son but do the Romans ever appoint a king's son as king did not our Joseph apply the following verse to Rome behold I made thee small among the nations in that they do not place the son of a king on the royal throne thou art greatly despised in that they do not possess a tongue or script what then does Genosia mean the king's birthday but we learn elsewhere the Genosia and the birthday that too is no contradiction the one refers to the king's own birthday the other to that of his son but we have also the wording the king's Genosia and his son's Genosia his own birthday and his son's birthday then as said previously Genosia means indeed the day of the king's accession but there is no difficulty raised by the mention of both terms the one applying to his own accession the other to that of his son and as to your question about their not appointing a king's son as king such appointment would be made at the king's request as was the case with Asverus the son of Antoninus who reigned in his father's place Antoninus once said to Rabbi it is my desire that my son Asverus should reign instead of me and that Tiberius should be declared a colony were I to ask one of these things it would be granted while both would not be granted Rabbi thereupon brought a man and having made him ride on the shoulders of another handed him a dub bidding the one who carried him to order the one on his shoulders to liberate it the emperor perceived this to mean that he was advised to ask of the senate to Appoint his son Asverus to reign in his stead and that subsequently he might get Asverus to make Tiberius a free colony on another occasion Antoninus mentioned to him that some prominent Romans were annoying him Rabbi thereupon took him into the garden and in his presence picked some radishes one at a time said the emperor to himself his advice to me is do away with them one at a time but do not attack all of them at once Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi but why did he not speak explicitly he thought his words might reach the ears of those prominent Romans who would persecute him why then did he not say it in a whisper because it is written for a bird of the air shall carry the voice the emperor had a daughter named Gila who committed a sin so he sent to Rabbi Rocket Herb and Rabbi in return sent him coriander the emperor then sent some leeks and he sent lettuce in return many a time Antoninus sent Rabbi gold dust in a leather bag filled with wheat at the top saying to his Servants carry the wheat to Rabbi Rabbi sent word to say I need it not I have quite enough of my own and Antoninus answered leave it then to those who will come after thee that they might give it to those who will come after me for thy descendants and those who will follow them will hand it over to them Antoninus had a cave which led from his house to the house of Rabbi every time he visited Rabbi he brought two slaves one of whom he slew at the door of Rabbi's house and the other who had been left behind was killed at the door of his own house said Antoninus to Rabbi when I call let none be found with thee one day he found our Hannah and Abihama sitting there so he said did I not tell thee no man should be found with thee at the time when I call and Rabbi replied this is not an ordinary human being then said Antoninus let him tell that servant who is sleeping outside the door to rise and come in our Hannah and Abihama thereupon went out but found that the man had been slain thought he how shall I act now shall I call and say that the man is dead but one should not bring a sad report shall I leave him and walk away that would be slighting the king so he prayed for mercy for the man and he was restored to life he then sent him and said Antoninus I am well aware that the least one among you can bring the dead to life still when I call let no one be found with thee every time he called he used to attend on rabbi and wait on him with food or drink when rabbi wanted to get on his bed Antoninus crouched in front of it saying get onto your bed by stepping on me rabbi however said it is not the proper thing to treat a king so slightingly whereupon Antoninus said would that I served as a mattress unto thee in the world to come once he asked him shall I enter the world to come yes said rabbi but said Antoninus is it not written there will be no remnant to the house of Esau that he replied applies only to those whose evil deeds are like to those of Esau we have learned Likewise there will be no remnant to the house of Esau might have been taken to apply to all therefore scripture says distinctly to the house of Esau so as to make it apply only to those who act as Esau did but said Antonius is it not also written there in the nether world is Edom her kings and all her princes there too Rabbi explained it says her kings it does not say all her kings all her princes but not all her officers this is indeed what has been taught her
Then Kate Ayabi Shalom addressed them thus in the first place you cannot do away with all of them for it is written for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heaven now what does this verse indicate were it to mean that Israel was to be scattered to the four corners of the world and instead of saying as the four winds the verse would have said to the four winds it can only mean that just as the world cannot exist without winds so the world cannot exist without Israel and what is? More your kingdom will be called the crippled kingdom to this the king replied you have spoken very well however he who contradicts the king is to be cast into a circular furnace on his being held and led away Roman matron said of him pity the ship that sails towards the harbor without paying the tax and throwing himself on his foreskin he cut it away exclaiming thou hast paid the tax thou wilt pass and enter paradise as he was being cast into the furnace he said all my possessions are to go to our Akiba and his friends this our Akiba interpreted according to the verse and it shall be unto Aaron and his sons which is taken to mean that one half is Aaron's and one half his sons a bath gold and exclaimed Kate Ayabi Shalom is destined for eternal life in the world to come Rabbi on hearing of it what saying one may acquire eternity in a single hour another may acquire it after many years Antoninus attended on Rabbi Artaban attended on Rabbi when Antoninus died Rabbi exclaimed it. Bond is snapped so also when Artaban died Rabbi exclaimed Talmud, Mas Abedazara the bond is snapped when Ankalos the son of Colonimus became a proselyte the emperor sent a contingent of Roman soldiers after him but he enticed them by citing scriptural verses and they became converted to Judaism thereupon the emperor sent another Roman cohort after him bidding them not to say anything to him as they were about to take him away with them he said to them let me tell you just an ordinary thing in a procession the torchlighter carries the light in front of the torchbearer the torchbearer in front of the leader the leader in front of the governor the governor in front of the chief officer but does the chief officer carry the light in front of the people that follow no they replied said he at the holy one blessed be he does carry the light before Israel for scripture says and the Lord went before them in a pillar of fire to give them light then they too became Converted again he sent another cohort ordering them not to enter into any conversation whatever with him so they took hold of him and as they were walking on he saw the mezuzah which was fixed on the door frame and he placed his hand on it saying to them now what is this and they replied you tell us then said he according to universal custom the mortal king dwells within and his servants keep guard on him without but in the case of the holy one blessed be he it is his servants who dwell within whilst he keeps guard on them from without as it is said the lord shall guard thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and forevermore then they too were converted to Judaism he sent for him no more and the lord said to her two nations goyim are in thy womb said rab judah in the name of rab read not goyim nations but geim lords this refers to Antoninus and rabbi from whose table neither lettuce nor radish nor cucumber was ever absent either in summer or winter and as a master has said radish helps the food to dissolve lettuce helps the food to be digested cucumber makes the intestines expand but was it not taught in the school of our Ishmael that cucumbers are called kishuan because they are as hard and as injurious to the body as swords there is no contradiction here that was said of large ones but our reference is to small ones the birthday and anniversaries of king's deaths this is our Meir's opinion the sages say idolatry only occurs at a death at which burning of articles takes place this implies that our Meir's opinion that at every death whether there is burning of articles or there is no burning idol worship takes place consequently the burning of articles is not an idolatrous cult from which is to be inferred that the rabbis hold that burning of articles at a funeral is an idolatrous cult what then of the following which has been taught the burning of articles at a king's funeral is permitted and there is nothing of Amorite. Usage about it now if it is a cult of idolatry how could such burning be allowed is it not written and in their statutes ye shall not walk hence all agree that burning is not an idolatrous cult and is merely a mark of high esteem for the deceased where they differ is this our mayor holds that at every death whether burning of articles takes place or does not take place there is idol worship but the rabbis hold that a death at which burning takes place is regarded as important and is marked by idol worship but one at which no burning takes place is unimportant and is not marked by idol worship to return to the main text the burning of articles at a king's funeral is permitted and there is nothing of Amorite usage about it as it is said thou shalt die in peace and with burnings of thy fathers the former kings that were before thee so shall they make a burning for thee and just as it is permitted to burn at the funerals of kings so it is permitted to burn in the case of princes what is it that may be burnt in the case of kings their beds and articles that were in use by them in the instance of the death of Argamaliel the elder Ankalos the proselyte burnt after him seventy Tyrian manas but did you not say that only articles in use by them could be burnt what is meant is articles to the value of seventy Tyrian manas may other things then not be burnt yet it has been taught it is permitted to mutilate an animal at royal funerals and there is nothing of Amorite usage about it said our papa that refers to the horse on which he rode are clean animals then not to be included yet it has been taught mutilation which renders the animal trephot is forbidden but such as does not render it trephot is permitted what kind of mutilation does not render it trephot Talmud, Mos Abedazar be trimming the tendons of its hooves from the ankle downward this was explained by our papa to refer to a calf employed for drawing the royal coach the day of shaving the beard etc. The question was asked what does it mean the day of the usual shaving of one's beard when the lock of hair is left or the annual shaving of the beard when the lock of hair is removed come and here both are taught distinctly in one barita it is said the day of shaving one's beard when one's lock of hair is left in another it is said the day of shaving one's hair and of removing one's lock of hair said Rab Judah in the name of Samuel they have yet another festival in Rome which occurs once every seventy years that a healthy man is brought and made to ride on a lame man he is dressed in the attire of Adam on his head is placed the scalp of our Ishmael and on his neck are hung pieces of fine gold to the weight of four zoos in the marketplaces through which these pass are paved with onyx stones and the proclamation is made before him the reckoning of the ruler is wrong the brother of our Lord the impostor let him who will see it see it he who will not see it now will Never see it of what avail is the treason to the traitor or deceit to the deceiver and they concluded thus woe unto the one when the other will arise said our ashi the wording of the proclamation defeats their object had they said our lord's brother the impostor it would have accorded with their intention but when they say the brother of our lord the impostor it may be taken to mean that it is their lord himself who is the impostor and why does not our tana include this festivity in the preceding mission he only enumerates those which occur year by year but does not mention such as are not annual ones those are the roman annual festivals which are the persian ones with tardi duryas kaimuhar nakaimuhar and these then are those of the romans and persians which are the babylonian ones muhar nakayak neyad abonani and the tenth of adar said arhan and bihistad in the name of rab some have it said arhan and birab in the name of rab there are five appointed temples of idol worship they are the temple of Bel in Babel, the temple of Nebo in Kuzi Tariata, which is in Bapag Zarephah, which is in Askel and Nishtra, which is in Arabia. When Ardimi came, he said that to these had been added the marketplace with the idol in Anbeki and the Nidbeka of Baker. Some call it Nidbara of Baker. Ardimi of Nahardia gave these in the reverse order the marketplace of Baker, the Nidbeka of Anbeki, said Arhan and son of Arhistah to Arhistah. What is meant by saying that these temples are appointed? He answered him, This is how your mother's father explained that they are appointed permanently, regularly, all the year round worship is taking place in them, said Samuel. In the diaspora, it is only forbidden to transact business with idolaters on the actual festival days alone, and is it forbidden even on the actual days of the festivals? Did not Rab Judah declare it permissible to Arbuna to buy wine and to Argil to buy wheat on the festival of the travelers? The festival of the travelers is. Different as it is not a fixed one mission when an idolatrous festival takes place within a city it is permitted to transact business with heathen outside it if the idolatrous festival takes place outside it business is permitted within it how about going there if the road leads solely to that place it is forbidden but if one can go by it to any other place it is permitted tomorrow what may be regarded as outside it said Arsimian Belakish such as for example the bazaar of Gaza some report this as follows Arsimian Belakish asked of Arhanan how about the marketplace of Gaza he replied have you never gone to Tyre and seen an Israelite and an idolater Talmud Mos Abedazara placing
In front of an idol he should not bend and pick them up for he may be taken as bound to the idol but if not apparent it is permitted if there is a spring flowing in front of an idol he should not bend down and drink because he may appear to be bound to the idol but if not apparent it is permitted one should not place one's mouth on the mouth of human figures which act as water fountains in the cities for the purpose of drinking because he may seem as kissing the idolatrous figure so also one should not place one's mouth on a water pipe and drink therefrom for fear of danger what is meant by not being apparent shall we say that he is not seen surely Rab Judah stated in the name of Rab that whatever the sages prohibited merely because it may appear objectionable to the public is also forbidden in one's innermost chamber it can only mean that if by bending he will not appear as bound to the idol and all three instances given are necessary for if we were taught the case of it Splendor only we would have thought that it is forbidden because he can well walk away from the idol and take it out but in the case of the coins where this could not be done the prohibition does not apply if on the other hand we were given the case of the coins only we might say that the prohibition holds good because only a loss of money is incurred but in the case of the thorn where pain is caused the prohibition is not to be applied were we given both these instances we might still say that the prohibition applied to them because there is no danger involved but in the case of the spring where there is danger for it may mean dying of thirst we might say that the prohibition should be waived hence all the instances are necessary Talmud, Mas Abed Azara B.Y. then mentioned the instance of placing one's mouth on the mouths of the figures that is only because he wanted to teach the instance which resembles it of not placing one's mouth on the water pot to drink therefrom for Fear of danger what is the danger the swallowing of a leech our rabbis taught one should not drink water either from rivers or from pools direct with his mouth or by drawing the water with the one hand if he drinks it his blood shall be upon his head for it is dangerous what danger is there that of swallowing a leech the statement supports our hand for our hand is said for one who swallows a leech it is permissible to get water heated on the sabbath there was actually a case of one swallowing a leech when our Nehemiah declared it permissible to get water heated for him on the sabbath meanwhile said Arhuna son of Arjashu let him sip vinegar said Aredi and one who has swallowed a wasp cannot possibly lie let him however drink a quarter of strong vinegar perhaps by this means he will live long enough to set his house in order our rabbis taught one should not drink water in the night if he does drink his blood is on his head for it is dangerous what danger is there that Danger of Shabriri, but if he be thirsty, how can he put things right? If there is another person with him, he should wake him and say, I am a thirst for water. If not, let him knock with the lid on the jug and say to himself, Thou giving his name, the son of naming his mother, thy mother hath warned thee to guard thyself against Shabriri, Buri, Riri, I, R, I, R, I, which prevail in blind vessels, Mishnah, a city in which idolatry is taking place, some of its shops being decorated with garlands and some not. Decorated, this was the case with Bethshin, and the sages said, In the decorated ones it is forbidden to buy, but in the undecorated ones it is permitted. Gemara said, Our Simeon, Belakish, this only refers to shops decorated with garlands of roses and myrtle, so that he enjoys the odor, but if they are decorated with fruit, it is permissible to buy in them. The reason is the scripture says, There shall cleave not of a devoted thing to thy hand, hence it is to derive an enjoyment that is. Forbidden Talmud, Mas Abed Azara, but to confer enjoyment or profit is permitted. But our Yohanan said, even if they are decorated with fruit, they are also forbidden by an induction from the minor to the major. Thus, if it is forbidden to enjoy the odor of adulterous articles, how much more so should it be forbidden to confer a benefit which will be applied to such purpose? The following question was then asked. Our Nathan says, on the day when remission is made of the usual tax towards adulterous purpose, the proclamation is made: whosoever will take a wreath and put it on his head and on the head of his ass in honor of the idols, his tax will be remitted. Otherwise, his tax will not be remitted. How should the Jew act who is present there? Shall he put it on? That means that he is enjoying the odor of adulterous articles. Shall he not put it on? Then he confers a benefit of paying tax towards idolatry. Hence, it was said, if one buys in the market of idolaters, if it be cattle. It should be disabled if fruit clothes or utensils they should be allowed to rot if money or metal vessels he should carry them to the salt sea what is meant by disabling the cutting the tendons of the hoofs beneath the ankle here then we are taught shall he put it on that means he is enjoying shall he not put it on then he confers a benefit said our Meshachia the son of our E.D.R. Simeon Belakish is of opinion that the rabbis disagree with our Nathan so that he can reply I give the opinion of it. Rabbis who held the opposite view whereas our Yohanan is of opinion that the rabbis do not disagree with our Nathan but how could our Yohanan think that the rabbis do not disagree was it not taught one may attend a fair of idolaters and buy of them cattle men servants maid servants houses fields and vineyards one may even write the necessary documents and deposit them at their courts because thereby he as it were rescues his property from their hands if he be a priest he may incur the risk of Defilement by going without the holy land for the purpose of arguing the matter with them and have it tried in court and just as he may defile himself by going without the land so he may become defiled by walking on a burial ground a burial ground how can that enter your mind this is a defilement forbidden by scripture what is meant is an unclean field which is only a rabbinic prohibition likewise one may incur similar defilement for the sake of studying the Torah or taking a wife said R. Judah this only applies when he cannot find a place elsewhere for studying but when one can manage to learn elsewhere one must not defile oneself but R. Jose said even when one can manage to study elsewhere he may defile himself for no man is so meritorious as to learn from any teacher said R. Jose there is the case of Joseph the priest who followed his master to Zidon whereupon R. Yohanan himself said the Holocha is according to R. Jose hence the sages do disagree R. Yohanan may answer you. Thus the rabbis do not indeed disagree with our Nathan yet there is no difficulty here the one case refers to purchasing from a dealer from whom the tax is exacted the other case refers to purchasing from a private man from whom the tax is not exacted the master stated cattle should be disabled but is there not the prohibition of causing suffering to a living being said Abbe the divine law says their horses thou shalt off the master stated what is meant by disabling cattle the cutting of the tendons beneath the ankle the following is cited as contradicting it one should not declare anything as sanctified or as devoted or as set value upon at the present time and if one did declare aught as sanctified or devoted or set value upon then if it be cattle it should be disabled if fruit clothes or utensils Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi they should be allowed to rot if money or metal vessels he should carry them to the salt sea what is meant by disabling the door is locked in front of it so that it dies of itself said Abbe that case is treated differently so as to avoid despising sanctified things then by all means let it be slaughtered that may lead to transgression then let him cut it in twain said Abbe scripture says and ye shall break down their altars and ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God Rabbi said Hoffing is here avoided because it seemed like inflicting a blemish upon sanctified things seems this is surely a real blemish this could only be so termed while the temple was in existence so that the animal is fit for being offered up but at the present time since it cannot in any case be offered the scriptural injunction does not apply but let it be regarded as inflicting a blemish upon a blemished animal which even though such animal was not fit for a sacrificial purpose is forbidden by scripture granted an animal which had been blemished cannot itself be used for sacrifice yet the money Obtained for it may be so used, but our case is unlike it in that neither its equivalent in money nor the animal itself is capable of being used for a sacrificial purpose. Our Jonah found our lay as he was standing at the gate of Tyre. He said to him, It is stated cattle bought at a heathen fair should be invalidated. What about a slave? I am not asking about a Jewish slave. What I am asking about is a heathen slave. What is one to do? The other replied, Why do you ask it? All it has been taught is to idolaters and Jewish shepherds of small cattle, even though one is not bound to get them out of a pit, one must not throw them into a pit to endanger their lives. Said our Jeremiah to our Zerah, It was taught we may buy of them cattle, men servants, and maid servants. Is this to be applied to a Jewish servant or to a heathen servant? Also said he in reply, According to common sense, a Jewish servant is meant for were it to apply to a heathen servant. What meritorious use could he make of him when? Rabin came, he said in the name of our Simeon Belakish, it may even apply to a
not sacrifice to an idol as for other things if they are not specified, their sale is permitted, but if specified, it is forbidden. Our mayor says also a good palm has a bend Nicolaus are forbidden to be sold to idolaters. Talmud, Mas Abedazara, Gemara, what is Istriblin Pinewood? But this is contradicted by the following teaching to these have been added Alexandrian nuts, Istriblin Moxes, and Nochua. Now, were you to suggest that Istriblin is Pinewood, has Pinewood anything to do with it? Sabbatical year has it not been taught? This is the general rule. Everything which has a perennial root is subject to the laws of the sabbatical year, but anything that has no such root is not subject to the law of the sabbatical year. Our Safra then said it means fruit of the cedar. So also when Rabin came from Palestine, he said in the name of our Eliezer, it means fruit of the cedar. B N O T Shua said Rabbi B Barhan in the name of our Yohanan Y fixed them said Rabbi B Barhan with their stems is what the mission intended to teach. Frankincense said our Isaac in the name of our Simeon B Lakish that is clear. Frankincense intended taught, but of any of these a parcel may be sold, and how much is a parcel are due to be. But they explained the parcel is no less than three minas, but we surely ought to fear lest he goes and sells it to others who will burn it before idols. Said Abay, we should be particular not to place a stumbling block before the blind, but we need not be so particular as to avoid. Placing it before one who may place it before the blind and a white cock said Arjona in the name of Arzera who said in the name of Arzee but some report said Arjona in the name of Arzera if an idol asks who has a cock it is permitted to sell him even a white cock but if he asks who has a white cock it is forbidden to sell him a white cock our mission states Arjuna said one may sell him a white cock amongst other cocks now what are the circumstances shall we say that he was inquiring who hath a white cock who hath a white cock in that case it must not be sold to him even among others it can only mean that he was inquiring who hath a cock who hath a cock and even then according to Arjuna white one may be sold him only among others but not by itself while according to the first ten it may not be sold even among others said Arnaman B Isaac the case dealt with in our mission is of one asking for various kinds it has been taught likewise said Arjuna only if he asks for this white cock it must not be sold to him but if he asks for this and another one it is permitted to sell both together and even when he asks for this white cock if the idolater is giving a banquet for his son or if he has a sick person in his house its sale is permitted but have we not learned if an idolater gives a banquet for his son the prohibition of selling applies to that day and that man alone so that as regards that day and that man the prohibition does apply said our Isaac. Son of our Meshachi our statement refers to an ordinary party we have learned as for other things if they are not specified their sale is permitted but if specified it is forbidden now what is meant by specified and by unspecified shall we say that unspecified means if he asks for example for white wheat and specified if he states that he requires it for idolatry Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi in that case it is neither necessary to state that the unspecified may be sold nor is it necessary to State that the specified must not be sold. We must then say that unspecified means if he asks for say we which is permitted and specified when he asks for white we which is forbidden and this would imply that in the case of a cock it is forbidden even when unspecified. No, we may say indeed that unspecified is when he asks for white we and specified is when he states that it is required for idolatry. Yet it is necessary to state that the specified is forbidden. We might think that that man does not really require it for idolatry. Only being very much attached to idolatry, he thinks that all people are likewise attached to it. He therefore thinks to himself, let me say thus so that they might readily give it to me. It is therefore necessary to state that its sale is forbidden. Our Ashi propounded if he asks who has a mutilated white cock, may one sell him a white cock without blemish? Do we say since he asks for a mutilated one, he does not require it for the idols or? Perhaps he is merely acting cunningly, and if you should say that this one is acting cunningly, what if one inquires who has a white cock who has a white cock, and when a black one is given to him, he accepts it, or when a red one is given to him, he accepts it, may a white one be sold to him? Do we say since when he was given a black one or a red one, he accepted it? It is proved that he does not require one for idolatry, or perhaps he is merely acting cunningly. The stands undecided. Our mayor says also a good palm, etc. Said our Hisdatu Abami. There is a tradition that the tractate Abu Dazara of our father Abraham consisted of 400 chapters. We have only learned five, yet we do not know what we are saying and what difficulty is there. The Mishnah states that our mayor says also a good palm has a bend are forbidden to be sold to idolaters, which implies that it is only a good palm that we must not sell, but a bad palm we may sell, yet we have learned one may not sell to them anything that. Is attached to the soil. He replied, "What is meant by good palm is the fruit of a good palm." And so also said, "Arhuna, the fruit of a good palm has of is a species of dates called Kishba." As to Nicolaus, when Ardimi came, he said in the name of Arhamabi Joseph that it is Kuraati. He said, "Abe to Ardimi, we learn Nicolaus and do not know what it is. So you tell us it is Kuraati, which we do not know either. Where then have you benefited us? Said he, "I have benefited you this much. Were you to go to Palestine and say Nicolaus, no one would know what it is. But if you say Kuraati, they will know and will show it to you. Mission in a place where it is the custom to sell small cattle to idolaters, such sale is permitted. But where the custom is not to sell, such sale is not permitted. In no place, however, is it permitted to sell big cattle calves or foals, whether whole or maimed. Arjuna permits in the case of a maimed one and bend, but there are permits in the case of a horse. Gemara, are we to take it that there is no? Actual prohibition, but that it is only a matter of custom, so that where the usage is to prohibit it is to be followed, and where the usage is to permit it is to be followed. But this is in conflict with the following mission: one should not place cattle in inns kept by even because they are suspected of immoral practices. Said Rab in places where it is permitted to sell, it is permitted to leave them together alone, but where leaving them together alone is forbidden by usage. The sale is also forbidden. Talmud, Mas Abed Azara, but our Eliezer said even where it is forbidden to leave them together, it is permitted to sell. The reason being that the heathen will avoid the risk of having his cattle stray least, and Rab too altered his opinion. For our Talafa said in the name of our Sheila Biabami, who said in the name of Rabbi heathen will not run the risk of having his cattle stray least. In no place, however, is it permitted to sell big cattle, etc. What reason is there for this prohibition? Though there is no fear of immoral practice, there is a fear of his making the animal work on the days of rest. Then let him make it work since he has bought it, he owns it. The prohibition is because of lending and because of hiring, but surely when he borrows it, he owns it, or when he hires it, he owns it during that period. Then said Rami, the son of Arya, the prohibition is because of the probability of trying, for he might happen to sell it to him close to sunset on the eve of the Sabbath. And the heathen might say to him, Come now, let us give it a trial, and hearing the owner's voice, it will walk because of him, and he indeed desires it to walk, so that he acts as a driver of his burdened beast on the Sabbath, and he who drives his burdened beast on the Sabbath is liable to bring a sin offering. Our Shisha, the son of Arya, objected, but does hire constitute acquisition? Have we not learned even in a place where they pronounced as permitted to let premises to a heathen? They did not. Pronounce it in regard to a dwelling house because he will bring idols into it. Now, if we were to be of opinion that hiring constitutes acquisition, then whatever this one brings in, he brings into his own house. It is different with bringing in idols, which is a very grave matter. For Scripture says, "And thou shalt not bring abomination into thy house." Then our Isaac, the son of our Meshachi, objected. But does hire constitute acquisition? Have we not learned an Israelite who hires a cow from a priest may feed her on vegetables which are terimah? But a priest who hires a cow of an Israelite, even though he is obliged to feed it, may not feed it on vegetables that are terimah. Now, were we to hold the opinion that hiring constitutes acquisition, why should he not feed her on it? Surely the cow belongs to him from here. Then you can deduce that hire does not constitute acquisition. Now, since you have declared that hire does not constitute acquisition, the prohibition is both because of hiring and because of. Lending and because of trying are at a permitted to sell and ask to a heathen through a Jewish agent as for trying Jid is not familiar with his voice that it should walk because of him and as to lending or hiring since it is not his own he will neither lend nor give it on hire also lest some fault be discovered in it or who not sold a cow to a heathen said Arhistah to him wherefore have you acted thus
Yet even though a command is involved and where there is no reason for such assumption, we do not assume that even where there is no command involved, Rabbah once sold an ass to an Israelite who was suspected of selling it to an idolater, said Abay to him, Wherefore have you acted thus? Said he, It is to an Israelite that I have sold it, but he retorted, He will go and sell it to an idolater. Why argued the other? Should he sell it to an idolater and not sell it to an Israelite? He Abay objected to him from the following Beritha in a place where it is a custom to sell small cattle to Kuti and such sale is permitted, but where they usually do not sell such sale is not permitted. Now, what is the reason for the prohibition? Shall we say because they are suspected of immoral practices, but are they to be suspected? Has it not been taught one may not place cattle in inns kept by idolaters, even male cattle with male persons and female cattle with female persons, and it is needless to say that. Female cattle with male persons and male cattle with female persons are forbidden, nor may one hand over cattle to one of their shepherds, nor may one be alone with them, nor may one entrust a child to them to be educated or to be taught a trade. One may, however, place cattle in inns kept by Kutians, even male cattle with female persons and female cattle with male persons, and it goes without saying that males with males and females with females are permitted, so also may one hand over cattle to one of their shepherds and be alone with them, or hand over a child to them to be educated or to be taught a trade. This shows indeed that they are not to be suspected, and it has further been taught one should not sell them either weapons or accessories of weapons, nor should one grind any weapon for them, not may one sell them either stocks or neck chains or ropes or iron chains, neither to idolaters nor Kutians. Now, what is the reason, shall we say, because they are suspected of murder, but are they? Suspect seeing we have just said that one may be alone with them, hence it is only because he might sell it to an idolater should you moreover say that whereas a Kutian will not repent, an Israelite will repent. Surely our Naman said in the name of Rabbi Abba, just as it was said that it is forbidden to sell to an idolater, so is it forbidden to sell to an Israelite who is suspected of selling it to an idolater? He rather thereupon ran three parsangs after the buyer, some say one parsang along. A sand mount but failed to overtake him. Ardini B. Abba said, just as it is forbidden to sell to an idolater, so it is forbidden to sell to a robber who is an Israelite. What are the circumstances if he is suspected of murder? Then it is quite plain he is the same as an idolater. If on the other hand he has never committed murder, why not sell them to him? It refers indeed to one who has not committed murder, but we may be dealing here with a cowardly thief who is apt at times when caught to save. Himself by committing murder, our rabbis taught it is forbidden to sell them shields. Some say, however, that shields may be sold to them. What is the reason for this prohibition? Shall we say because they protect them in that case? Even wheat or barley should likewise not be sold to them. Said Rab Talmud, Mas Abedazara. If it is possible, these two should not. There are some who say that the reason for not permitting the sale of shields is this: when they have no weapons left, they might use these for killing in battles. But there are others who say that shields may be sold to them for when they have no more weapons, they run away. Said Arnaman in the name of Rabbi Abba. The halachah is with the other. Said Arabi Abba. One should not sell them bars of iron. Why? Because they may hammer weapons out of them. If so, spades and pickaxes too should be forbidden. Said Arzibud. We mean bars of Indian iron. Why then do we sell it now? Said Arashi. We sell it to the Persians who. Protect us calves and foals it has been taught our Judah permits the sale of a maimed one since it cannot be cured or restored to health said they to him might she not be fit for breeding purposes and since she proves fit for breeding purposes she will be kept he replied you wait till she bears this is to say an animal in such a state will not let the male get near her bend but there are permits in the case of a horse it has been taught bend but there are permits the sale of a horse because it is only put to a kind of work which does not involve the bringing of a sin offering rabbi however forbids it for two reasons the one because it comes under the prohibition of selling weapons the other because it comes under the prohibition of big cattle it is quite right as regards the prohibition of weapons there are horses which are trained to kill by trampling but how does the prohibition of big cattle apply said Aryohan and when the horse gets old it is made to work a mill on the Sabbath said R. Yohanan the Halachah is with Ben Bathur. The following question was asked What about an ox that has been fed? This question applies both to Arjuda and to the rabbis. It applies to Arjuda, for Arjuda only permits in the case of a maimed one which can in no case be fit for work, whereas this one which if kept long enough may be fit for work might be forbidden, or it might be said that even according to the rabbis it is only in that case of a maimed one which is ordinarily not intended for slaughter that they forbid, but this one which is ordinarily intended for slaughter they might permit. Come and your Rabjuda said in the name of Samuel that the house of Rabbi had to present a fat ox to the Romans for their festival, and a sum of 40,000 coins was paid for the concession not to contribute it on the day of the festival, but on the morrow then another 40,000 was paid for the permission to present it not alive, but slaughtered, then 40,000 was again. Expended to be freed altogether from presenting it now what is the reason for not presenting it alive if not to avoid its being kept but if that is the reason what is the purpose of the concession of offering it on the morrow instead of on the day obviously then rabbi was anxious to abolish the thing entirely but he considered it advisable to do it little by little but is a fat ox if kept and slim healthy enough to do work said Arashi Zabita told me that a young bullock when kept and slim does the work of two mission one should not sell them bears lions or anything which may injure the public one should not join them in building a basilica a scaffold a stadium or a platform but one may join them in building pedestals for altars and also private dash baths when however he reaches the cupola in which the idol is placed he must not build Gemara said Arhanin son of Arhista some reports said Arhanin be rabbi in the name of rabbi to big beasts the same rule applies as to small Cattle as regards struggling but not as regards selling but my opinion is that it applies to selling also so that in such places where it is the custom to sell such sale is permitted but where the custom is not to sell it is forbidden our mission says one should not sell them bears lions or anything which may injure the public the reason then is because they may injure the public but were it not for fear of injury to the public would it be permitted said Rabbi Bila our mission may refer to a mutilated lion Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi in accordance with the opinion of Arjuna Arashi said generally any lion may be regarded as mutilated in regard to labor and objection was raised just as it is forbidden to sell them big cattle so it is forbidden to sell them big animals and even in such places where they do sell small cattle to even big animals should not be sold to them this refutes the opinion of Arhan and Biraba it admittedly refutes it Rabin referred to the contradiction. Between our mission and this very but adjusted it we learned one should not sell them bears lions or anything which may injure the public the reason then is because they may injure the public but apart from such injury they may be sold this is contradicted by the following very just as it is forbidden to sell them big cattle so it is forbidden to sell them big animals even in such places where they do sell small cattle to heathens big animals should not be sold to them he then adjusted it by saying that our mission refers to a mutilated lion in accordance with the view of our Judah said generally any lion may be regarded as mutilated as regards labor our Naman objected who told us that a lion is to be regarded as a big animal let us regard it as a small animal our on examining our mission of mutilated deduced there from the following refutation we there learn one should not sell them bears lions or anything which may injure the public the reason is evidently that it is injurious but were it not for the injury it could be sold furthermore the reason why lion is mentioned is because a lion is generally regarded as mutilated as regards labor but to any other animal which is fit for labor the prohibition would not apply this refutes the opinion of Arhan and Biraba it admittedly refutes it but to what kind of labor could any big animal be put said Abay Marjuda told me that at Marjanis they work mills with wild asses said Arzara when we were at the school of Rab Judah he said to us you may take the following matter from me for I have heard it from a great man though I know not whether from Rab or from Samuel to big beasts the same rule applies as to small cattle as regards struggling when I came to Korkunia I found Arhai B. Ashi who was sitting in the academy and saying in the name of Samuel to a big beast the same rule applies as to small cattle as regards struggling said I that means then that it is in the name of Samuel that this has been stated, but when I came to Sir, I found Rabbi B. Jeremiah who was sitting and saying in the name of Rab to a big beast, the same rule applies
Executioner scaffold a stadium or a tribune or rabbis taught when our Eliezer was arrested because of minute they brought him up to the tribune to be judged said the governor to him how can a sage man like you occupy himself with those idle things he replied I acknowledge the judge is right the governor thought that he referred to him though he really referred to his father in heaven and said because thou hast acknowledged me as right I pardon thou art acquitted when he came home his disciples called on him to console him but he would accept no consolation said our Akiba to him master wilt thou permit me to say one thing of what thou hast taught me he replied say it master said he perhaps some of the teaching of the minim had been transmitted to the Talmud Mas Abed Azara and thou didst approve of it and because of that thou wast arrested he exclaimed Akiba thou hast reminded me I was once walking in the upper market of Sephoris when I came across one of the disciples of Jesus the Nazarene Jacob of Farsakani by name who said to me it is written in your Torah thou shalt not bring the hire of a harlot into the house of the Lord thy God may such money be applied to the erection of a retiring place for the high priest to which I made no reply said he to me thus was I taught by Jesus the Nazarene for of the hire of a harlot hath she gathered them and unto the hire of a harlot shall they return they came from a place of filth let them go to a place of filth those words pleased me very much and that is why I was arrested for apostasy for thereby I transgressed the scriptural words remove thy way far from her which refers to Minnith and come not nigh to the door of her house which refers to the ruling power there are some who apply remove thy way from her to Minnith as well as to the ruling power and, and come not nigh to the door of her house to a harlot and how far is one to keep away said are his daw four cubits and to what do the rabbis apply of the hire of a harlot to the saying of Arhistah for Arhistah said every harlot who allows herself to be hired will at the end have to hire even as it is said and in that thou givest hire and no hire is given to thee thus thou art reversed this is contrary to what our said for our pedaf said only in the case of incest did the Torah forbid close approach as it is said none of you shall approach to any that is near akin to him to uncover their nakedness Allah on returning from college used to kiss his sisters on the hand some say on the breast he then contradicts himself for Allah said even mere approach is forbidden because we say to a Nazarite go go round about but do not approach the vineyard the horse leech hath two daughters give give what is meant by give give said Marakba it is the voice of the two daughters who cry from behind a calling to this world bring bring and who are they and the government some report said Arhistah in the name of Marakba it is the voice of Hell crying and calling bring me the two daughters who cry and call in this world bring bring scripture says none that go unto her return neither do they attain the paths of life but if they do not return how can they attain the paths of life what it means is that even if they do turn away from it they will not attain the paths of life does it mean then that those who repent from it if die was there not that woman who came before Arhista confessing to him that the lightest sin that she committed was that her younger son is the issue of her older son whereupon Arhista said get busy in preparing her shrouds but she did not die now since she refers to her immoral act as the lightest sin it may be assumed that she had also adopted Minith and yet she did not die that one did not altogether renounce her evil doing that is why she did not die some have this version is it only from Minith that one dies if one repents but not from other sins was there not that woman who came before Arhista who said prepare her shrouds and she died since she said of her guilt that it is one of the lightest it may be assumed that she was guilty of idolatry also and does not one die on renouncing sins other than idolatry surely it has been taught it was said of our Eliezer be that he did not leave out any harlot in the world without coming to her once on hearing that there was a certain harlot in one of the towns by the sea who accepted a purse of denarii for her hire he took a purse of denarii and crossed seven rivers for her sake as he was with her she blew forth breath and said as this blown breath will not return to its place so will Eliezer be and never be received in repentance he thereupon went sat between two hills and mountains and exclaimed O ye hills and mountains plead for mercy for me they replied how shall we pray for thee we stand in need of it ourselves for it is said for the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed so he exclaimed heaven and earth plead yet for mercy for me they too replied how shall we pray for thee we stand in need of it ourselves as for it is said for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke and the earth shall wax old like a garment he then exclaimed sun and moon plead yet for mercy for me but they also replied how shall we pray for thee we stand in need of it ourselves for it is said and the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed he exclaimed yes stars and constellations plead yet for mercy for me said they how shall we pray for thee we stand in need of it ourselves for it is said and all the hosts of heaven shall molder away said he the matter then depends upon me alone having placed his head between his knees he wept aloud until his soul departed then a bath coal was heard proclaiming rabbi Eliezer Bidorde is destined for the life of the world to come now here was a case of a sin other than minute and yet he did die in that case too since he was so much addicted to immorality it is as if he had been guilty of myth rabbi on hearing of it what and said one may acquire eternal life after many years another in one hour rabbi also said repentance are not alone except that they are even called rabbi Arhanan and our Jonathan were walking on the road and came to a parting of ways one of which led by the door of a place of idol worship and the other led by a harlot's place said the one to the other let us go through the one leading by the place of idolatry Talmud Mas Abed Azarabi the inclination for which has been abolished the other however said let us go through that leading by the harlot's place and defy our inclination and have our reward as they approached the place they saw the harlots withdraw at their presence said the one to the other once didst thou know this the other in reply quoted she shall watch over the mazim against lewdness discernment shall guard thee said the rabbis to rabbi how is this word mazim to be understood shall it be rendered it? Torah since the word Sima in scripture is rendered in the Targum it is a counsel of the wicked and scripture has the phrase wonderful is his counsel and great is wisdom but in that case the word should have been Simithus then is how it is to be understood against things of lewdness Simithi discernment i.e. the Torah shall watch over thee our rabbis taught when our Eliezer be Parada and our Hanan of Eteradion were arrested our Eliezer be Parada said to our Hanan of Eteradion happy art thou that thou hast been arrested on one charge woe is me for I am arrested on five charges our Hanan replied happy art thou who hast been arrested on five charges but will be rescued woe is me who though having been arrested on one charge will not be rescued for thou hast occupied thyself with the study of the Torah as well as with acts of benevolence whereas I occupied myself with Torah alone this accords with the opinion of Arhuna for Arhuna said he who only occupies himself with the study of it. Torah is as if he had no God for it is said now for long seasons Israel was without the true God what is meant by without the true God it means that he who only occupies himself with the study of the Torah is as if he had no God but did he not occupy himself with acts of benevolence surely it has been taught our Eliezer B. Jacob says one should not put his money into a charity bag unless it is supervised by a learned man such as our Hanan of Eter he was indeed very trustworthy but he did not practice benevolence but has it not been taught he said to him our Jose because I mistook for money for ordinary charity money so I distributed of my own to the poor he did indeed practice charity but not as much as he might have done when they brought up our Eliezer B. Parada for his trial they asked him why have you been studying the Torah and why have you been stealing he answered if one is a scholar he is not a robber if a robber he is not a scholar and as I am not the one I am neither the other why then they rejoined are you titled master I replied he am a master of weavers then they brought him two coils and asked which is for the warp and which for the wolf a miracle occurred and a female became and sat on the warp and a male became and sat on the wolf they said he is of the warp and that of the wolf then they asked him why did you not go to the meeting house he replied I have been old and feared lest I be trampled under your feet and how many old people have been trampled till now he was asked a miracle again happened for on that very day an old man had been trampled and why did you let your slave go free he replied no such thing ever happened one of them then was rising to give evidence against him when Elijah came disguised as one of the dignitaries of Rome and said to that man as miracles were worked for him in all the other matters a miracle will also happen in this one and you will only be shown up as bad natured he however disregarded him and stood up to address them when a written communication from important members of the government had to be sent to the emperor and it was dispatched by that man on the road Elijah came and hurled him a distance of 400 parts and so that he went and did not return they then brought up
was walking in front of some great men of Rome who remarked how beautiful are the steps of this maiden whereupon she took particular care of her step which confirms the following words of Arsimian Belakish what is the meaning of the verse the iniquity of my heel compasseth me about sins which one treads under heel in this world compass him about on the day of judgment as the three of them went out from the tribunal they declared their submission to the divine righteous judgment he quoted the rock his work is perfect for all his ways are just as his wife continue to God of faithfulness and without iniquity just and right is he and the daughter quoted great in counsel and mighty in work whose eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing said Rabbah how great were these righteous ones and that the three scriptural passages expressing submission to divine justice readily occurred to them just at the appropriate time for the declaration of such submission our rabbis taught when our Jose B. Kismo was ill our Hanan of Eterodion went to visit him he said to him brother Hanan knowest thou not that it is heaven that has ordained this Roman nation to reign for though she laid waste his house burnt his temple slew his pious ones and caused his best ones to perish still is she firmly established yet I have heard about thee that thou sittest and occupiest thyself with the Torah dust publicly gather. Assemblies and keepest a scroll of the law in thy bosom, he replied, Heaven will show mercy. I you remonstrated, am telling thee plain facts, and thou sayest, Heaven will show mercy, it will surprise me if they do not burn both thee and the scroll of the law with fire. Rabbi said the other, How do I stand with regard to the world to come? Is there any particular act that thou hast done? He inquired, he replied, I once mistook poor money for ordinary charity money, and I distributed of my own to thee. Poor well then said he would that thy portion were my portion, and thy lot my lot. It was said that within but few days our Jose B. Kisma died, and all the great men of Rome went to his burial and made great lamentation for him. On their return, they found our Hanan of B. Teradion sitting and occupying himself with the Torah, publicly gathering assemblies and keeping a scroll of the law in his bosom straight away. They took hold of him, wrapped him in the scroll of the law, placed bundles of branches round him, and Set them on fire. They then brought tops of wool which they had soaked in water and placed them over his heart so that he should not expire quickly. His daughter exclaimed, Father, that I should see you in the state. He replied, If it were I alone being burnt, it would have been a thing hard to bear. But now that I am burning together with the scroll of the law, he who will have regard for the plight of the Torah will also have regard for my plight. His disciples called out, Rabbi, what seest thou? He answered them, The parchments are being burnt, but the letters are soaring on high open. And thy mouth said, They so that the fire enter into thee. He replied, Let him who gave me my soul take it away, but no one should injure oneself. The executioner then said to him, Rabbi, if I raise the flame and take away the tufts of wool from over thy heart, will thou cause me to enter into the life to come? Yes, he replied, Then swear unto me. He urged, He swore unto him. He thereupon raised the flame and removed. The tufts of wool from over his heart and his soul departed speedily. The executioner then jumped and threw himself into the fire, and the exclaimed, Our Hanan of Eterodion, and the executioner have been assigned to the world to come. When Rabbi heard it, he wept and said, One may acquire eternal life in a single hour. Another, after many years, Beruri, the wife of Armeir, was a daughter of Our Hanan of Eterodion, said she to her husband, I am ashamed to have my sister placed in a brothel. So he took a tar cap full of denarii and set out. If thought he she has not been subjected to anything wrong, a miracle will be wrought for her. But if she has committed anything wrong, no miracle will happen to her. Disguised as a knight, he came to her and said, Prepare thyself for me. She replied, The manner of women is upon me. I am prepared to wait. He said, But said she, There are here many, many prettier than I am. He said to himself, That proves that she has not committed any wrong. She no doubt says thus to every. Comer he then went to her warder and said hand her over to me he replied I am afraid of the government take the tarkab of dinar said he one half distribute as bribe the other half shall be for thyself and what shall I do when these are exhausted he asked and he replied say O God of Meir answer me and thou wilt be saved but said he Talmud Mas Abed Azarabi who can assure me that that will be the case he replied you will see now there were there some dogs who bit anyone who incited them he took a stone and threw it at them and when they were about to bite him he exclaimed O God of Meir answer me and they let him alone the warder then handed her over to him at the end the matter became known to the government and the warder on being brought for judgment was taken up to the gallows when he exclaimed O God of Meir answer me they took him down and asked him what that meant and he told them the incident that had happened they then engraved our Meir's likeness on the gates of Rome. And proclaimed that anyone seeing a person resembling it should bring him there. One day some Roman saw him and ran after him, so he ran away from them and entered a harlot's house. Others say he happened just then to see food cooked by heathens, and he dipped in one finger and then sucked the other. Others again say that Elijah the prophet appeared to them as a harlot who embraced him. God forbid said they were this armor he would not have acted thus, and they left him. He then arose and ran away and came to Babylon. Some say it was because of that incident that he ran to Babylon. Others say because of the incident about Beruri, our rabbis taught those who visit stadiums or a camp and witness there the performance of sorcerers and enchanters or of Bukian and Mukian Lilian and Mulian Bluran or Salgirin. Lo, this is the seat of the scornful, and against those who visit them, scripture says, Happy is a man that hath not walked in the counsel of the wicked nor sat in the seat of it. Scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. From here, you can infer that those things cause one to neglect the Torah. The following was cited as contradicting the foregoing. It is permitted to go to stadiums because by shouting one may save the victim. One is also permitted to go to a camp for the purpose of maintaining order in the country, providing he does not conspire with the Romans. But for the purpose of conspiring, it is forbidden. There is thus a contradiction between the laws relating to stadiums as well as between those relating to camps. There may indeed be no contradiction between those relating to camps because the one may refer to where he conspires with them and the other to where he does not. But the laws relating to stadiums are surely contradictory. They represent the differing opinions of two tanaim. For it has been taught one should not go to stadiums because they are the seat of the scornful. But our Nathan permits it for two reasons. First, because by Shouting one may save the victim secondly because one might be able to give evidence of death for the wife of a victim and so enable her to remarry our rabbis taught one should not go to theaters or circuses because entertainments are arranged there in honor of the idols this is the opinion of our mayor but the sages say where such entertainments are given there is the prohibition of being suspected of idolatry's worship and where such entertainment is not given the prohibition is because of being in the seat of the scornful what is the difference between these two reasons said our hand of sir there is a difference in the case of calling to do business our simian bpz expounded the foregoing verse as follows what does scripture mean by happy is a man that hath not walked in the counsel of the wicked nor stood in the way of sinners nor sat in the seat of the scornful if he did not walk that way at all how could he stand there and if he did not stand there he obviously did not sit among them and as he did not sit among them he could not have scorned the wording is to teach thee that if one walks towards the wicked he will subsequently stand with them and if he stands he will at the end sit with them and if he does sit he will also come to scorn and if he does scorn the scriptural verse will be applicable to him if thou art wise thou art wise for thyself and if thou scornest thou alone shalt bear it said our Eliezer he who scoffs affliction will befall him as it is said now therefore do ye not scoff lest your punishment be made so your rabbi used to say to the rabbis I beg of you do not scoff so that you incur no punishment our captain said he who scoffs his sustenance will be reduced as it is said he withdraw his hand in the case of scoffers our Simeon Belakish said he who scoffs will fall into Gehenna as it is said a proud and haughty man scoffer is his name worketh for arrogant wrath and by wrath not but Gehenna is meant as it is said that day is a Day of wrath or Ashai said he who is haughty falls into Gehenna as it is said a proud and haughty man scoffer is his name worketh for arrogant wrath and by wrath not but Gehenna is meant as it is said that day is a day of wrath said our Hanalabi Hanalai he who scoffs brings destruction upon the world as it is said now therefore be ye not scoffers lest your affliction be made severe for an extermination holy determined have I heard said our Eliezer it is indeed a grievous sin since it incurs affliction at first and extermination at last our Simeon Bepazi expounded that verse as follows happy is a man that hath
Still a man, our Joshua B. Lovey explained it. Happy is he who overrules his inclination like a man that delighteth greatly in his commandments was explained by our Eliezer thus in his commandments but not in the reward of his commandments. This is just what we have learned he used to say. Be not like servants who serve the master on the condition of receiving a reward but be like servants who serve the master without the condition of receiving a reward but whose desire is in the law of the Lord said. Rabbi a man can learn well only that part of the Torah which is his heart's desire for it is said but whose desire is in the law of the Lord Levi and Arsimian the son of Rabbi were once sitting before Rabbi and were expounding a part of scripture when the book was concluded Levi said let the book of Proverbs now be brought in Arsimian the son of Rabbi however said let the Psalms be brought in Levi having been overruled the Psalms were brought when they came to this verse but whose desire is in the law of the Lord Rabbi offered his comment one can only learn well that part of the Torah which is his heart's desire whereupon Levi remarked Rabbi you have given me the right to rise said our Abdimi Bihama he who occupies himself with the Torah will have his desires granted by the Holy One blessed be he as it is said he who is occupied with the law of the Lord his desire shall be granted Rabbi likewise said one should always study that part of the Torah which is his heart's desire is it is said but whose desire is in the law of the Lord Rabbi also said at the beginning of this verse the Torah is assigned to the Holy One blessed be he but at the end it is assigned to him who studies it for it is said whose desire is in the law of the Lord and in his own law doth he meditate day and night Rabbi also said the following one should always study the Torah first and meditate in it afterwards as it is said the law of the Lord and then in his own law he meditates this too. Did Rabbi say let one by all means learn even though he is liable to forget yet even if he does not fully understand all the words which he studies as it is said my soul break for the longing that it hath unto thy ordinances at all times break this what scripture says it does not say grind it Rabbi pointed to the following contradiction scripture says upon the highest places and then it says on a seat in the high places at the beginning the student occupies any place but ultimately he will occupy a seat in another instance scripture says in the top of high places and then it says by the road though at first he is in the solitary top in out of the way high places yet ultimately he will sit as judge by the road will appoint it to the following contradiction scripture says drink waters out of thy own cistern and then it says and running waters out of thy own well at first drink from thy cistern and latterly running waters from thine own well said Rabbi in the name of Arsihara who said it in the name of Arhuna what is the meaning of the verse wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished but he that gathereth little by little shall increase if one takes his studies by heaps at a time he will benefit but little but if one gathers knowledge little by little he will gain much said Rabbi the rabbis know this thing and yet they disregard it said Arnam and B. Isaac I have acted up to it and it stood me in good stead said Arshiza be in the name of Ar Eliezer B. Ezariah. What is the meaning of the verse the slothful man shall not hunt his prey it means that he who is as it were a cunning hunter in matters of learning will not live or have length of days Arshiz hate however said it means that the cunning hunter has prey to roast when Ardimi came he said this may be likened to one who is hunting birds if he breaks the wings of each one in turn he has made sure that all will remain in his possession otherwise none will remain with him and he shall be like a Tree transplanted by streams of water those of the school of Arjane said a tree transplanted not a tree planted which implies that whoever learns Torah from one master only will never achieve great success said Arhista to the rabbinic students I have a mind to tell you something though I fear that you might leave me and go elsewhere whoever learns Torah from one master only will never achieve great success they did leave him and went to sit before Rabbi who however explained to them that the maxim only applies to lessons in logical deductions but as to oral traditions it is better to learn from one master only so that Talmud, Mas Abed Azara B Talmud, Mas Abed Azara B one is not confused by the variation in the terms used by streams of water said Artanham Bihadalah this implies that one should divide one's years of study into three and devote one third of them to scripture one third to mission and one third to Talmud but does a man know the tenure of his life? What is meant is that he should apply this practice to every day of his life that bringeth forth its fruit in its season and whose leaf doth not wither was explained by Rabbi thus if he bringeth forth its fruit in its season and his leaf will not wither otherwise both to the one taught and to the one who teaches does the scriptural verse apply not so the wicked but they are like the chaff which the wind driveth away our Abba said in the name of Arhu not in the name of Rabbi the scriptural words for she hath cast down many wounded refer to the disciple who gives decisions though he has not reached the age of ordination yet mighty host are her slain refer to the disciple who has reached the ordination age but refrains from giving decisions and what is the age forty years but did not Rabbi act as Rabbi that was a case of being equal to anyone and whose leaf doth not wither said Arahabi Abba in the name of Rab some ascribe it to Arahabi Abba in the name of Arham not in the name of Rab. Even the ordinary talk of scholars needs studying for it is said and whose leaf doth not wither and whatsoever he doth shall prosper our Joshua believe I said the following is written in the law repeated in the prophets and mentioned at the time in the hagiographer whosoever occupies himself with the Torah his possessions shall prosper it is written in the law for it says observe therefore the words of this covenant and do them that ye may make all that ye do to prosper it is repeated in the prophets for it is written this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein for then thou shalt make thy ways prosperous and then thou shalt have good success it is mentioned at the time in the hagiographer for it is written but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night and he shall be like a tree planted by streams of water that Bringeth forth its fruit in its season and whose leaf doth not wither and in whatsoever he doth he shall prosper our Alexandria was once calling out who wants life who wants life all the people came and gathered round him saying give us life he then quoted to them who is a man who desires life and loveth days that he may see good therein keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile depart from evil and do good seek peace and pursue it lest one say I kept my tongue from evil and my lips from speaking guile I may therefore indulge in sleep scripture therefore tells us turn from evil and do good by good not but Torah is meant as it is said for I have given you a good doctrine forsake ye not my Torah when however he reaches the cupola in which the idol is placed he must not build said our Eliezer in the name of our Yohanan if however he did build the pay he received is permitted this surely is obvious it is a case of appurtenances of idols and appurtenances of idols whether according to our Ishmael or according to our Akiba are not forbidden till actually worshipped said our Jeremiah it is necessary in the case of the idol itself this would be right according to the one who holds that to derive any benefit from the making of an idol for an Israelite is forbidden forthwith but from the making of one for an idolater not until it is worshipped in that case this is very well but according to the one who holds that even when made for an idolater any benefit is forbidden forthwith what is there to be said but said Rabbi Beulah the statement is necessary in regard to the last stroke of work for what is it that makes the idol fit for worship it is its completion and when is the completion brought about with the last stroke but the last stroke does not constitute the value of a parata consequently he holds the opinion that the wage is earned from the beginning to the end of the work mission one should not make jewelry for an idol such as Necklaces, earrings, or finger rings are Eliezer says for payment it is permitted one should not sell to idolaters a thing which is attached to the soil but when severed it may be sold our Judah says one may sell it on condition that it be severed tomorrow whence do we derive these rules said our Jose Bihanna Talmud, Mas Abed Azara from the scriptural words nor be gracious unto them Lotehanam which may be rendered nor allow them to settle on the soil but are not these words needed to convey the divine command not to admire their gracefulness if that alone were intended the wording should have been Lotehanam why is Lotehanam used to imply both these meanings but there is quite another purpose for which this is needed to express the divine command not to give them any free gift for that purpose the wording should have been Lotehanam why then is it Lotehanam so as to imply all these interpretations it has indeed been taught so elsewhere Lotehanam means thou shalt not Allow them to settle on the soil. Another interpretation of Lotehanam is thou shalt not pronounce them as graceful. Yet another interpretation of Lotehanam is thou shalt not give them any free gift. The giving of free gifts to idolaters is itself a matter of dispute
Judah he might say that since the maintenance of such a stranger is commanded by scripture and that of a heathen is not so commanded no scriptural word is needed to give a stranger preference it has been stated above another interpretation of Lotahanam is thou shalt not pronounce them as graceful this supports the view of Rab for Rab said one is forbidden to say how beautiful is that idolatrous the following objection was raised it happened that our Simeon be Gamaliel while standing on a step on the temple mount saw a heathen woman who was particularly beautiful and he exclaimed how great are thy works O Lord likewise when our Akiva saw the wife of the wicked tyrannous Rufus he spat then laughed and then wept spat because of her originating only from a putrefying drop laughed because he foresaw that she would become a proselyte and that he would take her to wife wept that such beauty should ultimately decay in the dust what then about Rab's ruling he might say that each of these rabbis merely offered thanksgiving for a master has said he who beholds goodly creatures should say blessed be he who hath created such in his universe but is even mere looking permitted the following can surely be raised as an objection thou shalt keep thee from every evil thing implies that one should not look intently at a beautiful woman even if she be unmarried or at a married woman even if she be ugly talmud moss abbot is arabi nor at a woman's gaudy garments nor at male and female asses or a pig and a sow or at fowls when they are mating even if one be all eyes like the angel of death it is said of the angel of death that he is all full of eyes when a sick person is about to depart he stands above his head below with his sword drawn out in his hand and a drop of gall hanging on it as the sick person beholds it he trembles and opens his mouth in fright he then drops it into his mouth it is from this that he dies from this that the corpse deteriorates from this that his face becomes greenish what may have happened in those cases was that the woman turned round the corner it was said above nor at a woman's gaudy garment said our Judah be Samuel even when these are spread on a wall whereon our papa remarked that is if he knows their owner said Robert this is also proved by the wording which reads nor at a woman's gaudy garments but does not read at gaudy garments this proves it are his da said that can only refer to such as had been worn but in the case of new ones it does not matter for were you not to say so how could women's dresses be handed to a trimmer he must needs look at them and according to your opinion how will you explain the statement of Rab Judah that in the case of animals of the same kind one may bring them together for mating in the very closest manner surely he too must needs look but we assume that what he cares about is only his work so here too it is only his work that he cares about the master said from it he dies Shall we say then that this differs from the statement of Samuel's father? For Samuel's father said, The angel of death told me, Were it not for the regard I have for people's honor, I could cut the throat of men as widely as that of an animal is cut. Possibly it is that very drop that cuts into the organs of the throat. The above mentioned statement from it, the corpse deteriorates, supports the view of our Hanan of Bikahana. For our Hanan of Bikahana stated it had been said in the school of Rab that if one wants to keep a corpse from deteriorating, he should turn it on its face. Our rabbis taught the words, Thou shalt keep thee from every evil thing, mean that one should not indulge in such thoughts by day as might lead to uncleanliness by night. Hence, our Phineas B. Jagir said, Study leads to precision, precision leads to zeal, zeal leads to cleanliness, cleanliness leads to restraint, restraint leads to purity, purity leads to holiness, holiness leads to meekness, meekness leads to fear of sin, fear of sin. Leads to saintliness, saintliness leads to the possession of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit leads to life eternal, and saintliness is greater than any of these. For Scripture says, Then thou didst speak in vision to thy saintly ones. This then differs from the view of our Joshua B. Lovey. For our Joshua B. Lovey said, Meekness is the greatest of them all. For Scripture says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to bring good tidings unto the meek. It does not say unto the saints, but unto the meek, from which you learn that meekness is the greatest of all these. One should not sell to idolaters a thing which is attached to the soil. Our rabbis taught one may sell a tree to a heathen with the stipulation that it be felled, and he then fells it. This is the opinion of our Judah our Meir, however, says, We may only sell to heathen a tree when felled, likewise, low growth with the stipulation that it be cut, and he may then cut it. This is the opinion of our Judah our Meir, however, says, we may only sell it to them when it is cut so also standing corn with the stipulation that it be reaped and he may then reap it this is the opinion of our Judah our Meir however says we may only sell it them when reaped and all these three instances are necessary for were we told of the case of a tree only we might think that in that case only does our Meir oppose for since the heathen will not lose by letting it remain in the ground he might leave it so but the other case the standing corn where he would lose by letting it remain in the soil we might think that our Meir would agree with our Judah on the other hand were we told about the tree and the corn only we might have thought that it is because it is not obvious that he benefits by leaving them in the soil that our Judah permits but in the case of low growth where he obviously benefits by leaving it to grow on we might think that he agrees with our Meir were we again to be told of the case of low growth only we might have thought that it is only in that case that our mayor object since it pays him not to cut it but in the other two cases he shares the view of our Judah hence all these are necessary the question was asked how about selling cattle with the stipulation that it be slaughtered shall we say that in those other instances the reason why our Judah permits is because the articles not being in the heathen's domain could not be left there altogether whereas cattle which is in his own domain might be kept by him unslaughtered or should no distinction be made come and here it has been taught we may sell a heathen cattle with the stipulation that he should slaughter it and he then slaughters it this is the opinion of our Judah our mayor however says we may only sell it to them when slaughtered mission one should not let houses to them in the land of Israel and it is needless to mention fields in Syria Talmud Mos Abed Azara houses may be let to them but not fields abroad houses may be sold and fields let to them this is the opinion of our mayor our Jose says in the land of Israel one may let to them houses but not fields in Syria we may sell them houses and let fields but abroad the one as well as the other may be sold even in such a place where the letting of a house has been permitted it is not meant for the purpose of a residence since the heathen will bring idols into it for scripture says and thou shalt not bring an abomination into thy house nowhere however may one let a bath house to it even as it is called by the name of the owner Gemara why is it needless to mention fields shall we say because it offers two objections the one that the heathen settles on the soil and the other that the produce becomes exempt from tithes if it be that then houses to offer two objections the one that the heathen settles on the soil and the other that they become exempt from having a mezuzah said our measure it is upon the occupant that the observance of mezuzah devolves in Syria Houses may be let to them but not fields why is selling of houses not allowed lest it lead to selling houses in the land of Israel why then not make a safeguard in the case of letting also letting is in itself a safeguard shall we then go on making another safeguard to guard it but is not the letting of a field in Syria a safeguard to another safeguard and yet it is upheld that is not a mere safeguard it follows the opinion that even the annexation by an individual is to be regarded as annexed to Palestine hence in the case of a field which offers a twofold objection our rabbis ordained a safeguard but in the case of houses since there is no such double objection no safeguard was made by our rabbis abroad houses may be sold and fields let to them because in the case of a field which offers a twofold objection our rabbis ordained a safeguard but in the case of a house since there is no such double objection no such safeguard was made by our rabbis our Jose says in the land of Israel we may let to them houses but not fields what is the reason in the case of fields which offer the twofold objection our rabbis ordained a safeguard but in the case of houses since there is no such double objection no safeguard was made by our rabbis in Syria we may sell them houses and let fields what is the reason our Jose holds that the annexation made by an individual is not regarded as a proper annexation hence in the case of fields which offer the twofold objection our rabbis instituted a safeguard but in the case of houses since there is no such double objection no safeguard was made by our rabbis but abroad the one as well as the other may be sold what is the reason because on account of the distance from Palestine the principle of safeguard does not apply said Rab Judah in the name of Samuel the Holochot is with our Jose said our Joseph provided he does not make it a heathen settlement and how many tenants constitute a settlement a tenant taught that at least Three persons constitute a settlement, but should we not fear lest after this Israelite has sold the property to one idolater, the latter may go and sell a part thereof to two others. Said Abbe,
If so, why should it not be said in the case of Akut Yintu that he is a Medayah working for his own tenancy Talmud, Mas Abed Azara Talmud, Mas Abed Azara A.R. Simeon B. Eliezer has not in mind the Medayah principle at all, but the reason why he permits in the case of an idolater is because if he is told to abstain from work on forbidden days, he obeys, but Akut Yintu, if told, would surely obey Akut and would not obey, he would say, I am more learned than thou, if that is so, why then? Mention the objection of the field being called by the owner's name, he could have given the reason of not placing a stumbling block before the blind. He mentions that reason as an additional one, as if to say there is the one reason of not placing a stumbling block before the blind, and there is also the objection of its being called by his name. Two saffron growers, one of whom was a heathen who took charge of the field on the Sabbath, and the other an Israelite who did so on the Sunday came. Before Rabbah he declared the partnership as permissible. Rabbah, however, cited the following in refutation of Rabbah's ruling: If an Israelite and a heathen lease a field in partnership, the Israelite must not say subsequently to the heathen, "Take as I share the profit in respect of the Sabbath, and I will take as mine that in respect of a weekday." Only when such a condition was made originally is it permitted. Likewise, if they just calculate the profit, it is forbidden. Whereupon he Rabbah blushed. Subsequently, the fact came to light that the partners had indeed laid down that condition originally. Argabiha of Bikathel said that was a case of oral plants, the produce of which the heathen was to eat during the forbidden years, and the Israelite during a corresponding number of permitted years, and they came before Rabbah who permitted it, but did not Rabbah decide a statement in objection to Rabbah's ruling. No, it was in order to support it. Then why did Rabbah blush that never occurred at all? The question was asked, what if no arrangements at all were made? Come and hear the above passage only when such a condition was made originally is it permitted? Hence, if there was no arrangement, it is forbidden. Continue then with the next part. If they calculated the profit, it is forbidden, which implies that if there was no arrangement, it is permitted. The fact is no answer can be deduced from this passage. Chapter 2 Mishnah 1 should not place cattle in heathens since because they are Suspected of immoral practice with them, a woman should not be alone with them because they are suspected of lewdness, nor should a man be alone with them because they are suspected of shedding blood. Talmud, Mas Abed Azara Bigamara, the following was cited in contradiction one may buy of them cattle for a sacrifice, and it need not be feared lest it committed or had been used for an immoral act or had been designated as an offering to idols or had been worshipped. Now we are quite right not to fear about its having been designated as an offering to idols or having been made an object of worship, since if it had been so designated or worshipped, its owner would not have sold it, but we surely ought to fear as to committing an immoral act. Said our Talifa in the name of Arshila B. Abin in the name of Rabbi Eden would have regard for his cattle lest it becomes barren. This would indeed hold good in the case of female cattle, but what answer would you give in the case of male? Said R. Kahana, because it has a deteriorating effect on their flesh, then what about that berith which has been taught one may buy cattle of any heathen shepherd? Ought we not to fear lest he used it for an immoral purpose? The heathen shepherd would be afraid of forfeiting his fee. What then about this other berith which has been taught one should not entrust cattle to a heathen shepherd? Why not assume that the heathen shepherd would be afraid of forfeiting his fee? They fear detection by one another since they know a good deal about it, but they are not afraid of us who do not know much about it. Rabbi said, This is what the popular proverb says as the stylus penetrates the stone, so one cunning mind detects another. In that case, neither should we buy male cattle from women for fear of their having used them for immoral practice. She would be afraid of being followed about by the animal. What then about this which our Joseph learned? A widow should not rear dogs nor accommodate a student as I guess now it is quite right in the case of a student as she might reckon on his modesty, but in the case of a dog, why not say that she would be afraid of being followed about by it since it would follow about on being thrown a piece of meat? People will say that it is because of being given such pieces that it follows her. Why then should we not leave female animals alone with female heathens? Said Marak Babi Hamma because heathens frequent their neighbors' wives and should one by chance not find her in and find the cattle there he might use it immorally. You may also say that even if he should find her and he might use the animal as a master has said, heathens prefer the cattle of Israelites to their own wives. For our Yohanan said when the serpent came unto Eve, he infused filthy lust into her. If that be so, the same should apply also to Israel when Israel stood at Sinai that lust was eliminated, but the lust of idolaters who did not stand at Sinai did not cease. The question was asked. How about fowls come and hear Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel on behalf of our hand and I saw a heathen by a goose in the market use it immorally and then strangle it roast and eat it also our Jeremiah of Dipti said I saw an Arab who bought a side of meat pierced it for the purpose of an immoral act after which act he roasted and ate it Talmud, Mas Abed Azara Rabbana said there is really no contradiction the one teaching prohibits it in the first instance the other permits it after it happened and whence do we know that a difference is to be made in a case between the first instance and where it had happened from the following we have learned a woman should not be alone with them because they are suspected of lewdness now this seems to be contradicted by the following a woman who had been imprisoned by heathens in connection with money matters is permissible to her husband but if on a capital charge she is forbidden to her husband does this not go to prove that we make a Difference in the case between the first instance and where it had happened not at all it may indeed be that the prohibition applies even after it happened but here the reason is that the heathen will be afraid to forfeit his money you can indeed prove it by what is stated in the second clause if on a capital charge she is forbidden to her husband so there is no more to be said about this our pet said there is no contradiction the one is according to our Eliezer the other is according to the rabbis for we have learned in connection with the red heifer our Eliezer says it must not be bought of a heathen but the sages permit it is not the point on which they differ this that our Eliezer holds that we suspect immoral practice whilst the rabbis hold that we do not suspect immoral practice whence do you know this it may well be said that all agree that immoral practice is not to be suspected the reason for our Eliezer's opinion being this he holds a view presented by Rab Judah in the name of Rab for Rab Judah said in the name of Rab in the case of the red heifer even if a bundle of sacks has been laid on her she becomes ritually unfit but in the case of the calf only if she had been made to draw a burden it may thus be that one master is of the opinion that we should suspect and the other that we should not suspect it do not let this enter your mind for the sake of a small benefit one would not risk a big loss let us then say likewise that for the sake of a little enjoyment one would not risk so big a loss in that instance his passion impels him but still it may be that all agree that immoral practice is not to be suspected but that the reason for our Eliezer's ruling is the one given in the teaching of Sheila for Sheila learned what is the reason for our Eliezer's ruling it is the scriptural words speak unto the children of Israel that they bring unto thee which imply that Israelites shall bring but it should not be brought by heathens do not let this Enter your mind for it is stated in the second clause our Eliza applied this disqualification to all other kinds of sacrifices now were you to this the reason as taught by Sheila it would hold good in the case of the red heifer in connection with which scripture mentions bringing but does scripture ever mention bringing in connection with other sacrifices but still might we not say then that the rabbis differ from our Eliza Talmud, Mas Abed Azara only in the case of the red heifer which commands a high price but that in the case of other sacrifices they agree with him in that case whose opinion would the bury the taught above is we may purchase from heathen cattle for ordinary sacrifices represent neither that of our Eliza nor that of the rabbis moreover it is distinctly taught as follows what was cited as a refutation to our Eliza by his colleagues is all the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee they shall come up with acceptance on my altar. The difference of opinions is only in regard to suspicion so that where the immoral use is certain the heifer is unfit from here then you can deduce that the degree of sanctity of the red heifer is that of animal sacrificed on the altar for if it had only the sanctity of those dedicated to repairs of the temple immoral use should not render it unfit the red heifer may be different in this respect alone because it is designated by divine law as a sin offering if that be so it ought to be unfit if it be a yosdefan and were you to say that it is so indeed why then are we taught if one dedicates a yosdefan as a red heifer it is unfit but our Simeon declares it as fit again were you to say that our Simeon follows here the opinion he
Does indeed mean so surely Rab Judah reported in the name of Samuel R. Eliezer himself was asked to what extent is honoring one's father and mother to be practiced. He answered, Go forth and see how a certain idolater of Ashkelon Dama, the son of Nathan, by name acted towards his father. He was once approached about selling precious stones for the Ephon Talmud. Moss Abed had a profit of 600,000 denarii. Arkahana's version is 800,000, but the keys were lying. Under his father's head below, so he would not disturb him. The words onyx stones are detached from the preceding words, but are they not followed by and stones to be sent, which again connects them? Moreover, the sequel to the report is in a subsequent year. A red heifer was born in his herd, and some of the sages of Israel called on him, said he to them, From what I know of you, I am aware that if I were to demand of you all the money in the world, you would give it to me, but all I ask of you now is. That money that I had lost because of my father in that case it was purchased through the agency of Israelite merchants does our Eliezer then hold that moral use is not to be suspected has it not been taught when the incident was mentioned to our Eliezer of a red heifer having been bought of a heathen named Dama or as some say named Ramus our Eliezer replied what does that prove seeing that Israelites watched the heifer from the hour of its birth our Eliezer indeed admits both reasons that of its having to be brought by an Israelite as well as the suspicion of the moral use the master said Israelites watched the heifer from the hour of its birth but is there not the suspicion that its mother may have been ill used when she bore her seeing that Rabbah said the young of the goring cow is unfit for it was both the cow and her young that did the goring likewise the young of an ill used animal is unfit since the animal and the young were ill used together what is evidently meant is that it was watched by Israelites from the time it was first formed. Still, is there not the suspicion of the mother having been ill used previously? For we have learned as to all those which are forbidden to be offered on the altar, their young are permitted, and thereon it was learned that our Eliezer forbade. Now, this is all right according to the exposition of Rabbah. For Rabbah said in the name of Arnam, and the dispute only applies to a case of an animal being ill used when already dedicated as a sacrifice. But if when still in an ordinary state all agree that the young is permitted, but how will you explain it according to Arhuna Behina, who said in the name of Arnam, and that the dispute applies only to a case of an animal being ill used while still undedicated? But if when already dedicated all agree that the young is forbidden, then we must say that the mother too was watched by Israelites since the time it was first formed, and why not raise the suspicion of the mother's mother having been ill? Used, we should not let suspicion go so far as all that the master said it was watched by Israelites from the time it was first formed. How did they know it said Arkahana a red cup is being passed before the mother when the male is mating with her? If that is so, why should a red heifer be so costly? Because even two hairs of another color render her unfit, then why use this means on their animal? Said Arkahana only with specified breeds is it effective? RMI and R. Isaac Napaha were sitting in the tent of R. Isaac Napaha when one of them began to cite thus R. Eliezer forbade cattle bought of a heathen for all sacrifices. Thereupon the other stated that in refutation of R. Eliezer's opinion, there was cited by his colleagues the verse, All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee, they shall come up with acceptance on my altar. To which R. Eliezer replied, All these will become self made proselytes in the time to come, said R. Joseph, What is the scriptural? Authority for this for then will I turn to the peoples of pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord Abbe asked perhaps this merely means that they will turn away from idolatry and our Joseph answered him the verse continues and to serve him with one consent this is how our Papa reported it but our Zebed reported thus both our Mi and our Isaac Napaha said thus our Eliezer forbade cattle bought of a heathen for all sacrifices and both of them said what was cited as a refutation to our Eliezer by his colleagues is all the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered etc and our Eliezer said they will all become self-made proselytes in the time to come and it was he who cited the scriptural authority for then will I turn to the peoples of pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord and when our Joseph objected does this not say merely that they will turn away from idolatry it was Abbe who answered him that the verse continues to serve him with one consent and Objection was raised and Moses said thou must also give into our hand sacrifices and burnt offerings it was different before the giving of the Torah then come and hear this and Jethro Moses father-in-law took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God in the case of Jethro too it was before the giving of the Torah this is very well according to the one who says that Jethro's visit to Moses preceded the giving of the Torah but how will you explain it according to the one who says Talmud, Moss, Abedaz Arabi that Jethro's call was after the giving of the Torah in that case it must be assumed that Jethro bought it from an Israelite come and hear and Saul said they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God what is meant by the best is the price of the best and why bring the best so that they find eager buyers come and hear and around said unto David let my Lord the king take an offer up. What seemeth good unto him, behold the oxen for the burnt offering, and Morajim the threshing instruments, and the furniture of the oxen for the wood set. Arnam and Arana was a resident alien. What are Morajim said, Ula, it is a turbo bed, and what is a turbo bed? A goat with hooks wherewith one threshes. Said our Joseph, what is the scriptural evidence? Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument, and Morag having teeth, thou shalt thresh the mountains, and beat them small, and shalt make the hills as chaff. A further objection was raised, and the kind they offered as burnt offering unto the Lord. This was a special ruling for that occasion. Common sense indeed proves it, for had not that been the case, how could a female be used as a burnt offering? What difficulty does this present? We could say that it referred to a private high place in accordance with the opinion of our Adabi Ahab. For our Adabi Ahab said, Whence can it be deduced that a female is fit as a burnt offering on a Private high place from what is said in scripture and Samuel took one sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering but is not the wording and offered him that is to say a male said Arnam and B. Isaac it is written and offered her are Yohan and said there are limits under the age of three years an animal becomes mutilated but from the age of three years it does not become mutilated when all the above verses were cited to him in refutation he replied that they refer to animals under the age of three years come then and here and the kind they offered as a burnt offering unto the Lord this too refers to those under the age of three years to this Arhuna the son of Arnathan strongly objected in that case the words and their calves they shut up at home refer to those of kind under three years but does a cow under three years bear at all have we not learned in the case of a cow or of an ass which is three years old the one born certainly belongs to the priest from that age upward. This is doubtful. The answers given previously are therefore best, and the kind took the straight way. W. A. Yisharna by the way to Beth Shemesh, etc. What is the meaning of the word W. A. Yisharna said, Are Yohanan in the name of Armeir? They rendered song. Are Zitra Bitopia said in the name of Rab? They directed their faces towards the ark and rendered song. And what did they sing? It was stated in the name of Are Yohanan on behalf of Armeir. The song beginning with then sang Moses and the children of Israel. Are Yohanan, however, gave it as his own opinion that they sang. And in that day shall Yesay give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his doings among the peoples, etc. Are Simeon Belakish said they sang the orphan Same Samo sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath wrought salvation for him. Are Eliezer said, The Lord reigneth, let the peoples tremble. Are Samuel Binaman, he said, The Lord reigneth, he is apparelled with. Majesty our Isaac Napaha said they sang sing O sing acacia tree ascend in all thy gracefulness with golden we they cover thee the sanctuary palace ears thy eulogy with divers jewels art thou adorned our ashi connected the song cited by our Isaac with the following scripture says and it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said rise up O Lord etc what did the Israelites say said our Isaac sing O sing acacia tree etc said Rab what analogy is there for the Persians calling a book Debir this now the name of Debir before time was Kariah Sefer our ashi said what analogy is there for the Persians calling a menstruous woman dash this for the manner of woman is upon me Talmud Mos Abedazare the same rabbis also discussed the following and the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the nation had avenged themselves of their enemies is not this written in the book of Jasher what is the book of Jasher said our high in the name of Aryohanan it is the book of
Namani said 48 it moved for 6 and stood for 24 then moved for 6 and again stood for 24 the standing still at noon equal that of setting time is the one at setting time equal the whole day so the standing still in the midst of the heaven equal the whole day 8 and it taught just as the sun stood still for Joshua so did the sun stand still for Moses and for Nakbiman b Gorian as to the case of Joshua there are the scriptural verses that of Nakbiman b Gorian is a tradition whence do we know about Moses it may be derived from the identical expression I will begin used in the two cases here is written I will begin to put the dread of the and they're referring to Joshua it is written I will begin to magnify the air Yohanan said it may be derived from the use of the identical word taith put in both cases here is written I will begin to put the dread of the and they're concerning Joshua it is written in the day when the Lord put the Amorites. Our Samuel B. Namani said you can detect it in the very wording of the verse itself the peoples that are under the whole heaven who shall hear the report of thee and shall tremble and be in anguish because of thee when did they tremble and were in anguish because of Moses when the sun stood still for him the question was asked does not scripture say in the case of Joshua and there was no day like that before it or after it the answer given was you may explain this to mean that there was none that lasted as long as that one or if you wish you may say it means that there were no hailstones as in the case of Joshua of which it is written and it came to pass as they fled from before Israel while they were in the going down of Beth Haran that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Ezekah and they died and he bade them teach the children of Judah to handle the bow behold it is written in the book of Jasher which is the book of Jasher said Arhai Abba the name of our Yohanan it is the book of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who are designated as righteous and of whom scripture says let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his and where is this fact referred to Judah? Thee shall thy brethren praise thy hand shall be on the neck of thine enemies what kind of fighting requires the aiming of the hand at the enemies next surely archery our Eliezer said it is the book of Deuteronomy which is here called the book of Jasher because it contains the words and thou shalt do that which is Jasher right in the sight of the Lord and where does it refer to Judah's archery with his hands he contended for himself what kind of fighting requires both hands surely archery our Samuel B. Namani said it is the book of Judges which is here called the book of Jasher because it contains the verse in those days there was no king in Israel every man did that which was Jasher right in his own eyes and where is Judah's skill in archery? Refer to in it that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them more now what kind of warfare requires teaching surely archery but how do we know that this verse refers to Judah from the scriptural verse who shall go up for us first against the Canaanites to fight against them and the Lord said Judah shall go up these same rabbis also discussed the following and the cook took up the thigh and that which was upon it and set it before Saul what means that which was upon it or Yohanan explained it to mean the thigh and the tail and what does that which was upon it mean the thigh which is adjoined by the tail while our Eliezer said that the thigh and the breast are your meant and what does that which was upon it mean the placing of the breast upon the thigh when these have to be formally waved our Samuel B. Namani however applied it to the leg and the cap and what does that which was upon it mean the cap which is above the leg a woman should not be alone with idolaters to what circumstances does this rule apply if to one idolater then even in the case of an Israelite it would not be permitted have we not learned one man should not remain alone even with two women Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi it must therefore refer to three idolaters being present which would be permissible in the case of Israelites but would even this be permitted in the case of Israelites of loose manners have we not learned but one woman may be alone with two men were on. Rab Judah commented this only refers to well-mannered men but as to loose-mannered once it is not permitted even if they be ten there is indeed the incident of ten men having carried an adulterous woman on a beer for an immoral purpose our mission refers to a case where the man's wife is present and implies that in the case of an idolater his wife is no safeguard though in the case of an Israelite his wife is a safeguard but is there not in any case the fear of her being murdered said R. Jeremiah, we are here dealing with a woman of high repute so that he would be afraid of killing her. R.E.D. replied, Every woman has her weapons under her, and do these two differ in the case of a woman who has a high repute among men but not among women? The following Beritha has been taught in agreement with the opinion of R.E.D.B. of an A woman, even though she can always look after her safety, should not be alone with even because they are suspected of lewdness, no man should be alone with. The more rabbis taught if a Jew happens to be overtaken by an idolater while on the road, he should let him walk on his right. R. Ishmael, the son of our Yohanan, the son of our Yohanan, B. Baraka says, If the heathen is armed with a sword, he should be let to walk on the right. If with a stick on the left, if they are ascending or descending, let not the Israelite be on the lower level and the heathen on the higher, but the Israelite higher and the heathen lower, nor should the Israelite bend down in front. Of him lest he smashes his skull if the heathen asks him whither he is going he should say towards a place beyond his actual destination just as our father Jacob acted towards the wicked Esau for scripture says until I come unto my lord to seer while it records and Jacob journeyed to Sukkot once happened to some disciples of our Akiba that while journeying to Shizab they were overtaken by robbers who asked them whither they were going they replied to Akko on reaching Shizab they stopped it. Robbers then said to them whose disciples are you and they replied the disciples of our Akiba said they happy are our Akiba and his disciples for no evil man has ever encountered them our Manashi was once going Talmud, Mas Abed Azara to Betortha when thieves met him and asked him whether he was going he said toward Pamatitha but when he reached Betortha he stopped whereupon they exclaimed you are a disciple of Judah the deceiver said he to them do you indeed know him as such may it be that divine will that these men be under his ban for twenty-two years they went on stealing but did not meet with any success when they saw this they all came to ask for the ban to be revoked now there was among them one weaver who did not come to have his ban annulled and he was devoured by a lion hence the popular saying a year's scanty earnings will alter improve a weaver if he be not a proud fool come now and see what difference there is between mere thieves of Babylon and robbers of Palestine mission an Israelite woman should not act as midwife to a heathen woman because she would be delivering a child for idolatry a heathen woman however may act as midwife to an Israelite woman an Israelite woman should not suckle the child of a heathen but a heathen woman may suckle the child of an Israelite woman in her premises Gemara our rabbis taught an Israelite woman should not act as midwife to a heathen because she delivers a child to idolatry nor may a heathen woman be allowed to Act as midwife to an Israelite woman because heathens are suspected of murder. This is the opinion of our Meir the sages. However, say a heathen may act as midwife to an Israelite woman so long as there are others standing by, but not if she is acting on her own. But our Meir holds not even if others are standing by her, for she may find an opportunity of pressing her hand on the infant's temples and kill it without being observed. Witness the incident of that woman who, on being called by a neighbor, Jewish midwife, the daughter of a Jewish midwife, retorted, May as many evils befall that woman as I have dropped Jewish children like lumps of wood into the river. Our rabbis, however, say no, she may have merely given her some kind of retort. An Israelite woman should not suckle, etc. Our rabbis taught an Israelite woman should not suckle a child of a heathen because she rears a child for idolatry, nor should a heathen woman be allowed to suckle a child of an Israelite woman because she is liable to. Murder it, this is the opinion of our Meir, but the sages say a heathen may suckle a child of an Israelite woman so long as there are others standing by her, but not if she is on her own. Our Meir, however, says not even while others are standing by her, for she may take the opportunity of rubbing in poison on her breast beforehand and so kill the child, and both the above instances are necessary, for if we were told about a midwife only, we might have thought that only in that case do the sages permit. Since being observed by others, she could do no harm, but in the case of suckling, where it is possible for her to apply poison to the breast beforehand and so kill the child, they might agree with our Meir. If on the other hand we were told only about suckling, we might have thought that only in that case does our Meir forbid because she could kill the child by applying poison to her breast beforehand, but in the case of a midwife where she could do no harm while others are standing by her, he might. Agree with the rabbis, hence both are necessary. The following was cited in contradiction. A Jewish woman may act as midwife to a heathen woman for payments, but not gratuitously answered. Our Joseph payment is permitted to prevent ill feeling. Our Joseph had a m
need not be brought up whereupon our Yohanan remarked I have been learning that the words and so shalt thou do with every lost thing of thy brothers thou mayest not hide thyself are also applicable to an apostate and you say he may be thrown down leave out apostates could he not have answered that the one might apply to the kind of apostate who eats carrion meat to satisfy his appetite and the other to an apostate who eats carrion meat to provoke in his opinion an apostate eating carrion meat. To provoke is the same as a minute it has been stated in regard to the term apostate there is a divergence of opinion between our Aha and Rabbana one says that he who eats forbidden food to satisfy his appetite is an apostate but he who does it to provoke is a minute while the other says that even one who does it to provoke is merely an apostate and who is a minute one who actually worships idols an objection was raised if one eats a flea or a gnat he is an apostate now such a thing could only be done to provoke and yet we are taught that he is merely an apostate even in that case he may just be trying to see what a forbidden thing tastes like the master said they may be cast in and need not be brought up if they may be cast in need if he said that they need not be brought up said our Joseph Hama in the name of our she's hate what is meant to convey is that if there was a step in the pit while one may scrape it away giving as a reason for doing so the prevention of cattle being lured by the step to get onto the pit Rabbah and our Joseph both of them said it means to convey that if there is a stone lying by the pit opening one may cover the pit with it saying that he does it for the safety of passing animals Rabbah said it is meant to convey that if there is a ladder there he may remove it saying I want it for getting my son down from a roof our rabbis taught an Israelite may perform a circumcision on a heathen for the purpose of becoming a proselyte thus excluding the purpose of removing a mourner but a heathen should not be allowed to perform circumcision on an Israelite because he is liable to take his life this is the opinion of our Meir the sages said a heathen may circumcise an Israelite so long as others are standing by him but not while he is on his own our Meir however said not even when others are standing by for he may find occasion to let the knife slip and so sterilize him does then our Meir hold the opinion that a heathen is not to be allowed to circumcise. But the opposite is proved by the following in a town where there is no Jewish physician but there is a physician who is a Kutian as well as one who is an idolater circumcision should be performed by the idolater but not by the Kutian this is the opinion of Armeir Arjuda however said it should be performed by the Kutian but not by the idolater reverse the names Armeir holding that the Kutian and not the idolater should circumcise and Arjuda holding the idolater and not the Kutian does. Then Arjuda hold that it is in order for an idolater to do so surely it has been taught Arjuda said whence can it be deduced that circumcision performed by a heathen is invalid from this verse and as for thee thou shalt keep my covenant indeed do not reverse but say that we are your dealing Talmud, Mas Abed Azara with an expert physician for when Ardimi came he said in the name of Aryohanan that if a heathen physician is recognized as an expert by multitudes it is permissible for an Israelite child to be circumcised by him does then our Judah hold that it is in order for a Kutian to circumcise an Israelite surely it has been taught an Israelite may perform circumcision on a Kutian but a Kutian should not be allowed to circumcise an Israelite because he performs the circumcision in the name of Mount Gerizim this is the opinion of our Judah said our Jose to him where is it at all to be found in the Torah that circumcision must be performed specifically for its purpose but he may go on performing it even though he expires in the act we must then indeed reverse names as we did before and as to the opinion cited in the name of our Judah which contradicts the opinion held here by our Judah the former opinion should be ascribed to our Judah the prince for it has been taught our Judah the prince says whence can it be deduced that circumcision performed by a heathen is invalid from the words of scripture and as for thee thou shalt keep my covenant said our what reason could our Judah give the scriptural words unto the Lord he shall circumcise and what scriptural authority has our Jose the words are must needs be circumcised but as to the other our Jose is not the phrase unto the Lord he shall circumcise the words unto the Lord refer to the Passover sacrifice and as to the other our Judah is it not written must needs be circumcised the Torah speaks in the language of men it has been stated whence could it be deduced that circumcision performed by a heathen is invalid there be Papa said in the name of Rab from the words and as for thee thou shalt keep my covenant while our Yohanan deduces it from the words Himal Yamal what practical difference is there between these two the case of a circumcised Arab or a circumcised Gibeonite according to the one who relies on he who is circumcised shall circumcise the qualification is there but according to the one who relies on thou shalt keep my covenant it is not there but is such a one Qualified according to him who relies on he who is circumcised shall circumcise have we not learned he who says I vow not to enjoy anything belonging to uncircumcised persons may enjoy anything of uncircumcised Israelites but must not enjoy anything of circumcised heathen which proves that heathens who undergo circumcision are still designated as uncircumcised we must therefore say that they differ in the case of an Israelite whose brothers died in consequence of circumcision so that he was not circumcised according to the one who relies on thou shall keep my covenant the qualification is there while according to the one who relies on he who is circumcised shall circumcise it is not there and is such a one not qualified according to the one who relies on he who is circumcised shall circumcise have we not learned he who says I vow not to enjoy anything belonging to circumcised persons must not enjoy of uncircumcised Israelites but may enjoy of circumcised heathens which proves that Israelites who are not circumcised are designated as circumcised we must therefore say that the case wherein they differ is that of a woman according to the one who relies on thou shall keep my covenant the qualification is not there since a woman is not subject to the observance while according to the one who relies on he who is circumcised shall circumcise the qualification is there for a woman should be classed among the circumcised but does anyone hold that a woman is not qualified to perform circumcision does not scripture say then it or it took a flint reed into it she caused to be taken but it also says and she cut off right into it and she caused it to be cut off by asking another person a man to do it or you may say it means that she only began and Moses came and completed it Mishnah we may allow them to heal us when the healing relates to money but not personal healing nor should we have our hair cut by them in any place this is the opinion of our Meir but the sages Said in a public place it is permitted but not when the two persons are alone tomorrow what is healing relating to money and what is personal healing shall we say that healing relating to money means for payment and personal healing free then the mission should have said we may allow them to heal us for payment but not free healing relating to money must therefore mean where no danger is involved and personal healing where there is danger but has not Rab Judah said even a scar over the puncture caused by bleeding should not be healed by them healing relating to money therefore relates to one's cattle and personal healing to one's own body about which Rab Judah said that even a scar over the puncture caused by bleeding should not be healed by them said Arhista in the name of Marak Baba if a heathen physician on being consulted says to one that such and such medicine is good for him and such and such medicine is bad for him it is permitted to follow his advice Talmud, Mas Abida. Zarabi for he will think that he is merely asking him and just as he is asking him so he will also ask others so that that man by giving wrong advice would have his reputation spoiled said Rabbah in the name of our Yohanan some say are his in the name of our Yohanan in the case where it is doubtful whether the patient will live or die we must not allow them to heal but if he will certainly die we may allow them to heal die etc surely there is still the life of the hour to be considered the life of the hour is not to be considered what authority have you for saying that the life of the hour is not to be considered the scriptural words if we say we will enter into the city then the famine is in the city and we shall die there now there is the life of the hour which they might forfeit this implies that the life of the hour is not to be considered an objection was raised no man should have any dealings with men nor is it allowed to be healed by them even in risking an hours Life it once happened to Ben Dama the son of Arishmael's sister that he was bitten by a serpent and Jacob a native of Farsakania came to heal him but Arishmael did not let him whereupon Ben Dama said my brother Arishmael let him so that I may be healed by him I will even cite a verse from the Torah that he is to be permitted but he did not manage to complete his saying when his soul departed and he died whereupon Arishmael exclaimed happy art thou Ben Dama for thou wert pure in body and I so likewise left the impurity nor hast thou transgressed the words of thy colleagues who said he who break through offense a serpent shall bite him it is different with the teaching of men for it draws and one having dealings with them may be drawn after them the master said nor hast thou transgressed
hand or swelling of the foot is to be regarded as serious as an internal sore and the Sabbath may be profaned for it said Arzitra B. Togia in the name of Rab any sore which requires medical opinion justifies the profanation of the Sabbath Arsham and B. Abba said in the name of Aryul Hand and the inflammatory fever is to be regarded as an internal sore for which the Sabbath may be profaned which sore is to be termed internal RMI explained such as are on the lip and inward R. L. A. Z. asked how. About the gums and the teeth, should they being hard be regarded as external, or do we say that since they are placed within the mouth, they are to be regarded as internal? Set a come and here one who is troubled with his teeth must not rinse them with vinegar on the Sabbath, which means that if he is only troubled, he must not rinse them. But if they hurt him very much, it is proper for him to do it. Probably this tano would call being troubled, even if they hurt very much, then come. And here this are Yohanan was troubled with scurvy on his gums, and he went to a certain heathen lady who attended to him on the Thursday and the Friday. Said he, what about tomorrow? She replied, you will not need the treatment, but what if I do need it? He asked. She replied, swear unto me that you will not reveal the remedy. Said he, I swear to the God of Israel, I will not reveal it. She then divulged it to him, and on the morrow he referred to it in the course of lecturing, but did he not swear? Unto her he swore to the God of Israel I will not reveal it implying that I may reveal it to his people Israel but is this not a profanation of the name he mentioned that proviso to her originally now is it not evident then that a sore on the gum is regarded as an internal sore said Arnam and B. Isaac scurvy is different because those starting in the mouth it extends to the intestines what is its symptom if he places anything between his teeth blood comes from the gums what brings it on? The chill of cold wheat food and the heat of hot barley food also the remnant of fish hash and flour what did she apply to it said Araha the son of Rob eleven water with olive oil and salt Mar son of Arashi said these fat smeared with a goose quill said Abbe I did all this but was not cured until a certain Arab told me to get seeds of an olive not one third ripe and burn them on a new spade and spread the ashes on the gums which I did and was cured but how came Aryohan and to act as he did? Had not Rabbi Barhana said in the name of Aryo Hanan any sore for which the Sabbath may be profaned should not be healed by a heathen it is different with a distinguished man what about Arabah who too was a distinguished man yet Jacob the men prepared for him a medicine for his leg and were it not for RMI and RACI who licked his leg he would have cut his leg off the one who attended Aryo Hanan was an expert physician so too was that of Arabah an expert physician it was different. In the case of Arabah for men adopt the attitude of let me die with the Philistines said Samuel an open wound is to be regarded as dangerous for which the Sabbath may be profaned what is the remedy for stopping the bleeding crest with vinegar for bringing on flesh scraped root of Sinodin and the pairing of the bramble or worms form a dunghill said Arsaphra beard like excrescence is a forerunner of the angel of death what is the remedy for it ruin honey or parsley and strong wine in it? Meantime, a berry resembling it in size should be brought and rolled over it. White berry for a white one and black for a black one. Said Rabban abscess is a forerunner of fever. What is the remedy for it? It should be snapped sixty times with the thumb and then cut open crosswise. That is, if it has not been brought to a white head, but if its head is white, it matters not. Our Jacob was suffering from Talmud. Moss Abbot is Arabia slit in the rectum and RMI. Some say RC directed him to take seven grains of purple colored alkali, wrap them up in the collar of a shirt, tie it round with a white thread of cattle hair, dip it in white naphtha and burn it and apply the ashes to the sore. While preparing this, he was to take the kernel of a bramble nut and apply its split side to the slit. That is, if there is a slit externally, what is one to do if it is internal? One should take some fat of a goat that has not borne any young melted and apply it. Else, one should take three melon leaves. Which have faded in the shade, burn them and apply the ashes in the absence of these. Let one apply snail shells or else take olive oil mixed with wax and let him be covered with rag of linen in the summer and cotton wool in the winter. Arabah had pain in his ear and he was given some directions by Aryohan and others say by those in the house of study what were the directions similar to those of Abbe who said, My mother told me that kidneys were only made to heal the ear, so also said Rabbah. Minyamai the physician told me that any kind of fluid is bad for the ear except the juice from kidneys. One should take the kidney of a bald buck, cut it crosswise and place it on glowing coals and pour the water which comes out of it into the ear, neither cold nor hot but tepid. Else one should take the fat of a large size cockchafer, melt it and drip it into the ear, or else the ear should be filled with oil and seven wicks should be made out of green blades of wheat stalks at the one end of. Which dry garlic ends and some white thread should be set alight while the other end is placed within the ear. The ear should be exposed to the light, but care should be taken that no spark falls on it. Each wick when done, which should be replaced by another. Another version is one should prepare seven wicks of white thread and dip them in oil of balsam wood, setting light to the one end and placing the other end in the ear. Each one when done, which should be replaced by another, care being taken to avoid any sparks or let one take to cotton which has been dyed but not combed and place it within the ear, which should be placed above a fire, taking precaution against sparks. Another remedy take a tube of an old cane which has been detached from the soil for about a century and fill it with rock salt and burn it and apply the ashes to the sore part. Take as a mnemonic to remember how to apply the foregoing in liquid form to a dry sore and in dry form to a wet sore. Said Rabbi Zitra. In the name of our Hannah, it is permissible to restore the ear into its proper position on the Sabbath. Whereon our Samuel B. Judah commented only with the hand, but not by applying medicine. Some report by applying medicine, but not with the hand. The reason being that it causes soreness. Said Arzitra B. Tobia in the name of Rab. If one's eye gets out of order, it is permissible to paint it on the Sabbath. He was understood to be of opinion that this only holds good when the medical ingredients had been ground the previous day. But if it is necessary to grind them on the Sabbath and carry them through a public road, it would not be permitted. But one of the rabbis, our Jacob by name, remarked to him, "It was made plain to me on behalf of Rab Judah that even grinding on the Sabbath and the carrying through the public street are permissible." Rab Judah declared it as permissible to paint the eye on the Sabbath. Whereupon our Samuel B. Judah said, "He who acts according to Judah profanes the Sabbath after some." Time when he himself had a sore eye, he sent to ask of Rab Judah, is it permitted or forbidden? He sent back the following reply to everyone else, it is permitted, but to you it is forbidden. Was it on my own authority that I permitted it? It was on that of Mar Samuel. It once happened to a maidservant in Mar Samuel's house that her eye became inflamed on a Sabbath. She cried, but no one attended her, and her eye dropped on the morrow. Mar Samuel went forth and propounded that if one's eye gets out of order, it is permissible to paint it on the Sabbath. The reason being because the eyesight is connected with the mental faculties. What kind of disorder said Rab Judah, such as discharge, pricking, congestion, watering, inflammation, or the first stages of sickness, excluding the last stage of sickness, or the brightening of the eyesight? In which cases it is not permitted? Said Rab Judah, the sting of a wasp, a prick of a thorn, an abscess, a sore eye, or an inflammation for all these bath houses. Dangerous radishes are good for fever and beets for cold shivers. The reverse is dangerous. Warm things are good for a scorpion bite and cold things for that by wasp. The reverse is dangerous. Likewise, warm things for a thorn prick and cold talmud. Moss abbot is era for an eruption. The reverse is dangerous. Vinegar is good after letting blood and small fish in brine after fasting. The reverse is dangerous. Cress after bloodletting is dangerous. Fever is likewise dangerous for blood. Letting so also are sore eyes dangerous for bloodletting. The second day after eating fish may be used for the letting of blood. The second day after bleeding for eating fish on the third day it is injurious. Our rabbis taught one who has his bloodlet should abstain from HGBSH milk, cheese, onions, and pepper. Word if one has eaten any of these said he should take a quarter of vinegar and a quarter of wine, mix them together and drink, and when he has subsequently to attend to his. Natural needs he should retire east of the town to obviate the vitiating smell said our Joshua B. Levi it is permitted to lift the unclay on the Sabbath what does unclay mean said our Abba the cartilage in front of the heart what is the remedy for it take cumin caraway mint wormwood saturara and hyssop for curing the cartilage of the heart these should be taken in wine as a mnemonic take wine make glad the heart of man
Alone the master said when an Israelite is having his hair cut by a heathen he should be looking in the mirror what are the circumstances if it is done in a public road what for the mirror if in a private place what is the use of looking into it it refers indeed to a private place but his using the mirror will make him appear an important person our Hannah B. Bizna was having his hair cut in the road leading to Nehartia by a heathen who remarked Hannah Hannah thy throat is fine for the shears. Answered he I deserve it for transgressing the words of our Meir and did he not also transgress those of the rabbis for the rabbis only permitted in a public place but not in a private place he thought that the roads leading to Nehartia where there are usually many passers by are to be regarded as a public place when an Israelite cuts the hair of a heathen he should on reaching the forelock leave it alone how much of it is he to leave said Armachia in the name of our Adabi Ahab three. Fingers length on every side said Arhanna the son of Ara the statements about a spear made servants depressions are by Armachio but those about four lock vegetable ashes and cheese are by Armachia or Papa however said if referring to a Mishnah or Berith it is Armachia but if independent statements it is Armachio Nemonic the Mishnah is clean wherein do the two differ they differ in regard to the statement about made servants Talmud, Mas Abedaz Arabi Mishnah the following things. Belonging to heathens are forbidden and the prohibition extends to any benefit that may be derived from them wine or a heathens vinegar that was formerly wine hadrian a curtain where skins pierced at the animal's heart Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel says when its rent is round the skin I is forbidden but if oblong it is permitted meat which is being brought into a place of idols is permitted but that which is brought out is forbidden because it is regarded as sacrifices of the dead this is the Opinion of our Akiba with idolaters going on a pilgrimage it is forbidden to have any business transactions but with those coming thence it is permitted skin bottles or flagons of heathens in which one of an Israelite is kept are forbidden and the prohibition extends to any benefit that may be derived from them this is the opinion of our Meir but the sages say that the prohibition does not extend to deriving any benefit great stones and great skins of heathens are forbidden the prohibition extending to any benefit this is the opinion of our Meir but the sages say when fresh they are forbidden but when dry they are permitted muries and Bithynian cheese of the heathens are forbidden the prohibition extending to any benefit this is the opinion of our Meir but the sages say that the prohibition does not extend to any benefit our Judah said our Ishmael put this question to our Joshua as they were on a journey why asked he have they forbidden the cheese of heathens he replied because they curdle. It with the rennet of Anibla he retorted but is not the rennet of a burnt offering more strictly forbidden than the rennet of Anibla and yet it was said that a priest who is not fastidious may suck it out rather this opinion was not approved and it was said that no benefit may be derived from it although no trespass would apply there to the reason then our Joshua said yes because they curdle it with the rennet from calves sacrifice to idols said he if that be so why do they not extend the prohibition to any benefit derived from it he however diverted to another matter saying Ishmael how do you read for thy masc love is better than wine or thy fem love etc he replied thy fem love is better he retorted this is not so as it is proved by its fellow verse thy ointments have a goodly fragrance wherefore the maidens love the Gemara once do we deduce the prohibition of wine Rabbi Abu said from the scriptural verse which says who did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering as heathen sacrifice is forbidden as to deriving any benefit so also their wine is forbidden but once do we deduce the prohibition of a sacrifice itself from the scriptural words they joined themselves also unto Baal appear and ate the sacrifices of the dead as anything appertaining to the dead is forbidden as to any benefit so heathen sacrifices are likewise forbidden and how do we know this about the dead we deduce it from the similar expression there used in connection with the heifer whose neck was to be broken as well as here in connection with the dead here it is said and Miriam died there and there it is said and they shall break the heifer's neck there in the valley as in that other case the heifer was forbidden as to any benefit so also in our case the prohibition is the same but how do we know that it is so in that case those of the school of Arjana said because forgiveness is mentioned in connection Therewith as with sacrifices or a heathen's vinegar that was formerly wine this surely is obvious shall its prohibition cease because it turns sour or as she said the statement serves to imply that vinegar belonging to us when in the keeping of a heathen does not require double sealing and for this reason as to the fear lest he would offer it to idols this is generally not offered and again as to the possibility that he might exchange it for his own since there is one seal he would not take the trouble to falsify it or early said we have had it stated that a heathen's boiled wine which was formerly raw wine while in his possession is forbidden this too is self-evident does its prohibition cease because it had been boiled said or as she this too enables us to draw the implication that our boiled wine which is in the keeping of a heathen does not require double sealing for as to the fear lest he would offer it to the idol it is not offered in that state and as for Talmud. Mas Abed the possibility that he might exchange it since there is one seal he would not take the trouble to falsify it or rabbis taught boiled wine or alantith of a heathen is forbidden but prepared alantith is permitted what is alantith as it has been taught in connection with Sabbath we may make anomalant but not alantith what is anomalant and what is alantith anomalant is a mixture of wine honey and pepper alantith of old wine clear water and balsam which is used as a cooling drink in the bathhouse rabbi and our Joseph both of them said that diluted wine does not become forbidden through being left uncovered nor is boiled wine to be suspected of idolatry's use the question was asked is boiled wine rendered forbidden by being left uncovered or is it not so come and here our Jacob B. E. D. testified in regard to boiled wine that it is not rendered forbidden by being left uncovered our Janab Ishmael was sick and our Ishmael desired and other rabbis called to inquire about him as they said the question was asked of them does the objection to remaining uncovered apply to boiled wine or not to which our Ishmael desired replied thus said our Simeon B. Lakish on behalf of a great man namely our high boiled wine is not rendered unfit by being left uncovered on their asking shall we rely on it our Janab Ishmael motioned as if to say upon my responsibility Samuel and Ablet were sitting together when boiled wine was brought up for them and the latter withdrew his hand but Samuel said to him behold it has been said that boiled wine is not to be suspected of idolatry's use our high's maid servant found that some boiled wine had been left uncovered she came to ask about it of our high who told her that it had been declared that boiled wine is not rendered unfit by being left uncovered the servant of our Adabi Ahabu found that some diluted wine had been left uncovered his master however told him that it had been stated that diluted wine is not rendered unfit by being left uncovered our papa said this has only been said of wine that is well diluted but if it is only slightly diluted a snake might indeed drink it but does it indeed drink wine that is slightly diluted what about rabbi son of Arhuna who was traveling in a boat and had some wine with him observing that a snake cutting through the water was approaching he said to his attendant turn it away and the attendant took some water and was pouring it into the wine whereupon the snake turned Back this may only show that for pure wine the snake will even endanger its life while for diluted wine it will not face danger and does it not face danger for diluted wine what about Arjane who was at Akbara some say it was Barhita that was at Akbara where people were sitting and drinking diluted wine and as there was some of it left in the cask they tied a shred over it he then saw a snake carrying water which it poured into the cask till the cask was so filled that the wine came above the shred and the snake then drank it may be said that what the snake itself dilutes it will drink but it will not drink what others dilute said Arashi some say Armeshashi what an answer to give in a matter where danger to life is involved Rabbah said the law is that diluted wine is rendered unfit by being left uncovered and is to be suspected of idolatry's use but boiled wine does not become unfit by being left uncovered nor is it suspected of idolatry's use the attendant of R. Hilkiah Toby found that a tank of water had been left uncovered though he had been sitting and slumbering close to it he came to ask about it of our Hilkiah Toby who said to him it has been stated that snakes are afraid of a sleeping person this however only applies in daytime but not at night but this is not the case it is not to be assumed that they are afraid of a sleeping person either by day or by night Rab did not drink water of an Aramean's house saying that they do not mind if it is kept uncovered he however drank that of a widow's house saying she is sure to follow her husband's practice Samuel on the other hand would not drink water of the house of a widow in the absence of the fear of a husband he
First three days Talmud, Mas Abed is Arabi thence onwards neither the suspicion of idolatry nor the objection to being uncovered applies to it those in Nihardia however said that even after the three days the objection to being uncovered still holds good the reason being that occasionally even such wine is drunk by snakes our rabbis taught wine in the first stage of fermentation is not subject to the rules relating to uncovered liquids and how long does that stage last three days cress? Dish is not subject to the rules relating to uncovered liquids those in the diaspora made a practice of forbidding it if left uncovered but only if there was no vinegar in it for the vinegar that is in it deters serpents from tasting it Babylonian Qutatu is not rendered unfit if left uncovered though those in the diaspora have the practice of forbidding it or Manashi said if it has traces of biting we must suspect it of being bitten by a serpent said our high be ashy in the name of Samuel water that drips into a vessel is not subject to the rules in regard to uncovered liquids are ashy said that is if the dripping is continuous are high be ashy said in the name of Samuel the opening of a fig does not come under the rules relating to liquids left uncovered this view accords with that of this tana for it has been taught our Eliza says one may eat grapes and figs at night without suspecting any harm for scripture says the Lord guardeth the simple our Safra said in the name of our Joshua of the south there are three kinds of venoms of serpents that of a young one sinks to the bottom that of one not quite young drops to about the middle while that of an old one floats on top are we to take it that the older a serpent gets the more his strength diminishes has it not been taught there are three whose strength increases as their age advances these are a fish a serpent and a swine its strength may indeed increase but its venom becomes weaker the venom of a young one sinks to the bottom what practical application has this that of the following teaching if a barrel was uncovered even if nine persons drank of its contents with no fatal consequence the tenth person is still forbidden to drink thereof it happened indeed that nine people drank of such and did not die but the tenth one died and our jeremiah said it was a case of the venom sinking to the bottom likewise if a cut melon was left uncovered and nine persons partook thereof without fatal consequences it is forbidden for a tenth person to partake thereof for it once happened that nine persons ate of such a one and did not die and the tenth one who ate it died and rab said that it was a case of venom that sank to the bottom our rabbis taught water which had been left uncovered should not be poured out in a public road or used for sprinkling the floor of a house or for kneading mortar nor should one give it to his animal or to his neighbor's animal to drink nor should one wash one's face Hands or feet there with others said only a part of the body that has an opening must not be washed there with but where there is no opening it is permitted do not the others hold the same opinion as the first tana they differ in regard to the back part of the hand and of the foot or the upper part of the face the master said nor should one give it to his own animal or to his neighbor's animal to drink but has it not been taught one may however give it to his own animal to drink that teaching refers to a cat why then not to his neighbors because it deteriorates it then his own too would deteriorate but it subsequently recovers then his neighbors would likewise recover it might so happen that he might wish to sell it and would suffer loss through it or as he said in the name of our Yohanan who said it on behalf of our Judah be there, there are three kinds of wine a libation wine from which it is forbidden to derive any benefit and of which a quantity of the size of it Olive causes grave defilement Talmud, Mas Abed is a two ordinary wine of heathens from which it is likewise forbidden to derive any benefit whatsoever and a quarter of a log of which renders drinks or edibles unclean three wine of an Israelite that had been deposited with an idolater which must not be drunk but the benefit of it is permitted but have we not learned if one deposits his fruit with an idolater it is considered as if it were the idolater's own fruit as regards tithes or sabbatical years produce in our instance he assigned a separate corner to it in that case it should be permissible for drinking also for when our Yohanan happened to be in Parrot he inquired if there was any mission of Barthabra available and our tantum of Parrot quoted to him the following wine which had been deposited with an idolater is permissible for drinking applying the verse in the place where the tree falleth there shall it be he commented how can it be assumed that there it shall be, but it means that there shall its fruit be. Our Zara said there is no contradiction here. The one is according to the opinion of our Elizer and the other according to that of the rabbis. For it has been taught if one buys or hires a house in the court of an idolater and stores wine therein, the key or seal of the place being in the charge of an Israelite, such wine is permitted by our Elizer. But the sages forbid it. Our high, the son of our high, Binamani said in the name of our Hisda, who said it in the name of Rab. Some say that our Hisda said it in the name of our Zeiri, while others report that our Hisda said, I was told by Abu Biharina that Zeiri said it. The Halach arrests with our Elizer. Our Eliezer said everything is sufficiently guarded by one seal except wine, which is not considered guarded by one seal. Our Yohanan, however, said even wine is sufficiently guarded by one seal, and the one is not in conflict with the other, as the one follows the opinion of our Elizer and the other that of the rabbis. Some have the following version said our Eliezer everything is sufficiently guarded by a seal within another seal except wine which is not guarded even by such double seal our Yohanan however said even wine is guarded by a seal within a seal both these follow the opinion of the rabbis the one holding that the rabbis only differ from our Eliezer where there is but one seal but if there is a seal within another seal they too permit it while the other holds that even in the case of a double seal they forbid what for example is a seal within another seal Rabbi said a basin placed over the opening of a barrel and joined to the barrel with a seal on it is a seal within another seal otherwise it is not so or a basket fastened over the stopper is a seal within a seal but if it is not fastened it is not a seal within a seal a skin bottle within a bag with the closed opening of the skin bottle inside is a seal within a seal but if the opening is without it is not a seal within a seal if he bends in it Close opening of the skin bottle within and then ties the bottle up again and seals it. It is likewise considered a seal within a seal. Our rabbis taught formerly the ruling was that one of Ankusi is forbidden because of Bayrat Sirica, that of Borkata is forbidden on account of Farparshai, and that of Zagdar is forbidden because of Farshalem. Subsequently, however, this was altered thus if in open barrels it is forbidden, but if in closed ones it is permitted. What was the opinion held formerly? And what was the later opinion? At first, the opinion was held that a Kutian is not particular about an idolater's coming in contact with the wine, whether the barrels be open or closed, but subsequently they formed the opinion that only in the case of open ones they are not particular, but in the case of closed barrels they are very particular indeed. Is it then permitted in the case of open barrels? But the following contradicts it Talmud, Mas Abed is Arabi, if one sends a cask of wine by the Hand of a Kutian or a Brian or Murray's by the hand of an idolater if he can identify his seal and the spot and manner of his closing up it is permitted but if not it is forbidden our Zerah said there is no contradiction the one refers to the town the other to the open road our Jeremiah demurred to this but did not that of the town come by road but said our Jeremiah our teaching only refers to barrels closed in the vicinity of the wine presses since all the people are about there he would be afraid to let an idolater touch it lest it be detected and he lose thereby it has been stated why has beer of Eden's been forbidden Rami Bihama said in the name of our Isaac because of marriages are and said because it might have been left uncovered uncovered when if while in the vat we also keep it uncovered and if while in the barrel in that state too we keep it uncovered it may only refer to a place where the water is allowed to settle in that case it should be permitted when it matures. For Rab said liquor which is matured is permitted for the venom would not allow it to mature so also wine which is fermented is permitted for it would not have allowed it to ferment matured is forbidden as a safeguard against the fresh our papa used to drink beer when it was brought out to him to the door of the shop our aha used to drink it when it was brought to his house both of them held that the reason for the prohibition is intermarriage but our aha insisted on extraordinary precaution our Samuel Bebisna happened to be in mark when they brought him wine but he would not drink it they then brought him beer which he did not drink either it is quite correct as to the wine as there is a suspicion but what objection is there to the beer there is a suspicion of a suspicion said Rab beer of an Aramean is permitted still I would not allow my son Hai to drink it which way will you have it if it is permitted then it should be permitted to all if on the other hand it is Forbidden it should be forbidden to all rap suspects it of being left uncovered but the bitter taste of the hops counteracts any venom that might be in it so that it can only prove injurious to one who is an invalid and his son
Levi said our first quality wine is only equal to their third soaking. The question was asked how about placing these charts as supports of the legs of a bedstead is this intention to preserve a forbidden thing for some other purpose allowed or forbidden come and here for our Eliezer and our Johan and argued about it one pronouncing it as forbidden and the other as permitted an objection was raised wine kept in barrels or leather bottles belonging to idolaters is forbidden for drinking but permitted for deriving benefit Simeon Begutta testified in the presence of our Gamaliel son that our Gamaliel drank of such an echo but this was not accepted as to flagons belonging to idolaters our Simeon Begamaliel says in the name of our Joshua B. Kapusei that it is forbidden to make of them covers for an ass now in this latter case there is an intention to preserve the forbidden thing for some other purpose and yet we are taught that it is forbidden according to your opinion and the sale of Earthenware flasks of heathens should also be forbidden for what difference is there between leather flagons and earthenware flasks but Rabba said there is this risk if his flask be split he might take the one of the heathen and patch his own with it now according to the one who holds that the intention to preserve a forbidden thing for some other purpose is forbidden why is the use of earthenware flasks allowed his answer might be in that case the forbidden matter is not therein substance whereas in the other case the substance of the forbidden matter is there it has been stated above but this was not accepted a contradiction was raised wine contained in leather bottles of heathens is forbidden for drinking but permitted for deriving benefit Simeon Begutta testified in the presence of Argamaliel's son that Argamaliel drank of such an ago and it was accepted what is meant there is that it was not accepted by the whole company but it was the son who did accept it or if you wish it may be said that gutta is one and gutta is another skins pierced at the animal's heart our rabbis taught what is the sign of such a hard rent skin if it is rent opposite the heart and is round like a circular aperture and there is a drop of coagulated blood on it it is forbidden Talmud, Mas Abed is Arabi but if it has no such drop of blood it is permitted Aruna said that is only if it has not been treated with salt but if salt has been applied to it it is forbidden in either case as the salt may have removed it our Simeon Begamaliel says when its rent is round the skin is forbidden but if oblong it is permitted said our Joseph in the name of Rab Judah who said it in the name of Samuel the Halach arrest with our Simeon Begamaliel said Abbe the Halach arrest with him implies that the matter is disputed but what difference does it make to you retorted the other to which he replied is the learning of Gemara then to be like the singing of a song meat which is being brought into an idolatrous place is permitted what Tana's opinion might this represent said our high Abba in the name of our Yohan and not that of our Eliezer for were it our Eliezer surely he holds the opinion that an idolater has generally idolatry in his mind but that which is brought out is forbidden because it is regarded as sacrifices of the dead what is the reason because it is impossible for some idolatry sacrifice not to have taken place whose opinion might this represent that of our Judah be therefore it has been taught our Judah be there says whence can we deduce that idolatry's offerings defiled by overshadowing from the verse they joined themselves unto B.A.L. Pier and ate the sacrifices of the dead as a dead body defiled by overshadowing so also an idolatry sacrifice causes such defilement by overshadowing with idolaters going on a pilgrimage it is forbidden to have any business transaction Samuel said with idolaters going on a pilgrimage it is forbidden to Transact business on their journey therefore they will go and offer thanks to the idols but on their return journey it is permitted for bygones or bygones if an Israelite however goes on such a pilgrimage to idols it is permitted to deal with him on his journey therefore he may change his mind and not go but on his return it is forbidden for as Talmud, Mas Abed Azara, he has already become attached to it he will go again and again but has it not been taught it is forbidden to do any business transactions with an Israelite going on a pilgrimage of idolatry either on his journey there or back or as she said that refers to an apostate Israelite who is sure to go or rabbis taught with an idolater going to a market fair it is permitted to deal both on his journey there and back but in the case of an Israelite going to such a fair it is permitted on his journey thither but forbidden on his return journey now how is it that in the case of an Israelite it is forbidden on his Return journey because we say that he may have been selling articles of idolatry and has thus idolatry money with him. Should we not likewise say in the case of an idolater that he may have sold articles of idol worship and carries idolatry money on him? It appears therefore that in the case of an idolater we say that he may have sold such things as a garment or wine. If so, let us then say in the case of an Israelite too that it may have been such things as a garment or wine that he was selling. If he had such things only he would have sold them here, but with those coming thence it is permitted. Our Simeon Belagish said this teaching applies only if they do not form one band, but if they are keeping closely together it is forbidden, for we are to assume that each one has a mind to return again skin bottles and earthenware flagons of heathens. Our rabbis taught skin bottles of heathens if stripped are permitted while new but if old or pitch line they are forbidden if an idolater pitched. And lined and put the wine into it while an Israelite was standing by him, there is no cause for suspicion. But since it is a heathen who puts the wine into the bottles, of what avail is it that an Israelite does stand by him? Our Papa said, What is meant is that if a heathen pitched and lined them and an Israelite poured wine into them while another Israelite was standing by, there is no cause for suspicion. But if it is an Israelite that is pouring the wine into them, what need is there for another Israelite to stand by less while the Israelite is engaged in the pouring the heathen for some of it for idolatry without being detected by him? Our said the original wording can indeed stand, but here the reason is that when wine is poured into the fresh pitch, it is as water that is poured in mortar. Our Papa said from what was said by our it may be deduced that if a heathen poured wine into the salt cellar of an Israelite, the salt is permitted. Our Ashi demurred to this, how can these be? Compared in that case the wine has disappeared while in our case it has not disappeared a certain Arab bar ADI one sees the wineskin from our Isaac B. Joseph and after keeping wine in it returned it to him he came and asked about it in the house of learning and our Jeremiah said to him thus was a decision given by our MI in a specific case the vessels are to be filled with water for three days and then emptied whereon Rabbah said the water should be emptied every 24 hours this was taken to apply to our vessels if used by heathens but not to theirs when however Rabin came from Palestine he said in the name of our Simeon Belakish like, it applies to either ours or theirs our Ahabi Rabbah sitting before our Ashi was of opinion that this only applies to skin bottles but not to earthenware ones but our Ashi said to him it makes no difference whether they be skin bottles or earthenware ones our rabbis taught earthenware bottles of idolaters if new and stripped are permitted but if old and Pitch they are forbidden if an idolater kept wine in them the Israelite should put water into them but though an idolater kept wine in them an Israelite may immediately put brand or murrays into them without any scruples the question was asked Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi does this apply to deliberate action or to an act committed come and here for RZ but be Ashi learned if one buys earthenware bottles of an idolater if they be new he may put wine into them if old he may use them for Bran and murrays deliberately our Judah asked of RMI what if he put them back into a furnace so that they became heated he replied if Bran has a cleansing effect on them how much more so fire it has likewise been stated our Yohanan said according to others RC said it in the name of our Yohanan flagons of heathens which had been placed back in the furnace as soon as the pitch thereof has dropped off are permitted said our Ashi you need not say until it has dropped off if it has only been Loosened even though it has not dropped off it is enough where the pitch is removed by means of lighted ships this is a matter of dispute between Araha and Rabbah the one forbidding the use of the flask while the other permitted the lorest with the one who forbids the question was asked how about putting beer into such a vessel Arnaman and Rab Judah forbid but Rabbah permits it Rabbah declared it permissible to Araha the son of Araha to pour beer into such a vessel so he went and put wine into it still he had no scruples about it saying it was only done casually Araha Bibis had some vessels of heathens made of boxwood he filled them with water and let them stand in the sun and they split said Araha to him you have indeed rendered them forbidden for good all that our Rabbi said is that such are to be filled with water has it been said they should be left in the sunset Arius in the name of RMI a vessel of natron can never be rendered ritually clean what is a Vessel of Natron said our Jose B. Abin, a vessel made of crystals coming from an alumine. Some of the men of the field marshal Parzak
How about using glazed vessels on Passover? We do not ask, they said, about green glazing which contains alum crystals which absorbs and thus renders the vessel forbidden. What we are asking about is white or black glazing, nor do we ask even about these if there are any cracks for such unquestionably absorbed and are forbidden. It is about smooth ones that we are asking you what the law is. He answered Talmud, Mas Abed Azara, them I observed that such vessels exude and being porous they certainly absorb and are therefore forbidden. The reason being that the Torah testified that an earthenware vessel can never be rid of its defect. Why then should this be different from one used for idolatry concerning which we are told? Mirmar expounded that all glazed vessels which had been used for it are permitted and should you say that leaven on Passover is forbidden by the Torah, whereas idolatry's wine is merely a rabbinic prohibition, surely it is an established principle that. Whatever is instituted by the rabbis is treated as that which is ordained by the Torah. The difference is this: in the one case, the use of the vessel is for hot things, while in the other, only for cold. Our Akiva happened to come to Ginzik. He was asked, "Is fasting by hours considered a fast, or is it not considered a fast?" He had no answer to give them. They then asked him, "Is the use of bottles of idolaters ever permitted?" Again, he had no answer. In what garments he was then asked, "Did Moses minister during the seven days of consecration?" He had no answer to this either. He then went and inquired at the house of learning, and they said to him, "The law is fasting by hours is considered a fast, so that if he completed the day, he may say the prayer for a fast as to bottles of heathens. The law is that they are permissible for use after twelve months, and as to the garment in which Moses ministered during the seven days of consecration, he ministered in a white frock without border grape." Stones and grape skins of heathens, etc. Our rabbis taught great stones and grape skins of heathens are forbidden while fresh but permitted when dry, which are considered fresh and which dry, said Rab Judah in the name of Samuel. They are considered moist during the first twelve months and dry after the twelve months. It has been stated that Rabbi Barhan said in the name of our Yohan, and when they are forbidden, the prohibition extends to any benefit to be derived from them, and when they are permitted, they are permitted even as food, said Arzibad yeast made of one of Arameans is permitted after a full year. Our Habib, the son of Rabbi said, Jugs are permitted after a complete year. Our Habib said, Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi travelers, wine bags are permitted after a twelve months, said Araha, the son of Araha, kernel sold by Arameans are permitted after a twelve month. Araha, the son of Rabbi said, those red or black jugs are likewise permitted after twelve months, Muris, etc. Our rabbis taught Muris made. By an expert is permitted. Arjuna Bigamaliel says in the name of Arhan of Bigamaliel, Brian of Pilate prepared by an expert is likewise permitted. Abami the son of Arabat learned that Muris of an expert is permitted while he had learned it. Thus he however explained that only the first and second extracts from this fish are permitted, but the third is forbidden. The reason being that these first and second extracts are quite fat and require no admixture of wine after these, however, wine is put into it once a shipload of Muris reached the port of Akko and Araha of Akko placed a guard by it said Robert to him and who watched the ship till now till now he replied there was no cause for suspicion as to mixing the brine with wine as estos of Muris cost aluma while as estos of wine cost four luma said our Jeremiah to our Jeremiah they not have come by the way of Tyre where wine is cheap he replied there are narrow bays and shallow waters and Bithynian cheese etc said our Simeon B. Lakish, the reason why Bithynian cheese has been forbidden is because the majority of calves of that place are slaughtered as sacrifices to idols. Why say the majority of calves, even if it were the minority, it would have sufficed since our Meir always takes the minority into consideration. When we say the majority of calves, we really have only a minority of cattle, but we're only a minority of calves slain for idolatry, seeing that there would have been a majority of calves not slain for idolatry, to which would have to be added all other cattle that are not slaughtered for idolatry, they would really have formed a minority of a minority, and even our Meir does not take a negligible minority into consideration, said our Simeon Belikim to our Simeon Belikish. What matters it if they are slaughtered for idolatry, seeing that you yourself permit something similar, for it has been stated if one slaughters an animal with the intention of sprinkling its blood for idolatry or offering its fat. For idolatry our Yohanan says that the animal is forbidden as in his opinion the one sacrificial process is to be connected with the other process and the slaughtering without the sanctuary is deduced from that within it. Our Simeon B. Lakish however says it is permitted he replied you are to be congratulated on your acumen but in our case we assume that he declares that he worships the idol with the completion of the slaughtering said our Judah our Ishmael put a question etc. said our Ottoboy in the name of Rab if one acquires a woman with the dung of an ox which is to be stoned she becomes consecrated to him but if with dung of calves used for idolatry she does not become consecrated to him you can say that this can be proved by common sense or you may prove it from scripture as a matter of common sense in the case of calves to be offered to idols it pleases the owner that they be stout whereas in the case of the ox to be stoned there is no pleasure to him in its being stout and astute. Scripture here the verse says there shall cleave not of the band thing to thy hand while there the words are the ox shall be surely stoned and its flesh shall not be eaten its flesh only is forbidden but its tongue is permitted to profit by Rabbah said we have learned both these cases in our mission of the fact that when our Joshua replied because they curdle it with the rennet of a nibble and our Ishmael retorted but is not the rennet of a burnt offering more strictly forbidden than that of a nibble Talmud, Mas Abed Azara proves that the tongue of an animal from which no benefit may be derived is permitted again since when our Joshua gave as the reason because they curdle it with the rennet of calves sacrificed to idols our Ishmael replied if that be so why do they not extend the prohibition to any benefit derived from it this proves that the tongue of animals used for idolatry is forbidden as to the derivation of any benefit could he not in reply have given the reason that the Forbidden matter is not present in substance for take the case of Muris is not the reason why the rabbis did not forbid the derivation of any benefit from it because the forbidden matter is not there in substance I will tell you since it is the rennet that keeps the milk curdled it must be regarded as though the prohibited matter is there in substance diverted to another matter etc. What is the meaning of the words for thy love is better than wine when our Dimi came from Palestine he explained it thus the congregation of Israel declared to the Holy One blessed be he master of the universe the words of thy beloved ones are more pleasant to me than the wine of the Torah why did he ask him just about this verse said our Simeon B. Some say our Simeon B. M. I. He hinted at the beginning of this verse let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth saying Ishmael my brother press thy lips one to the other and do not be eager to ask for an answer for what reason said Ula some say are Samuel B. Abba, this is a new ordinance about which one should not particularize what then is the reason for this ordinance said our Simeon B. Bazi in the name of our Joshua B. Levi the probability of its having been bitten by a serpent then why not tell him that the reason is the probability of its having been bitten because of Ola's ruling for Ola said when an ordinance is made in Palestine its reason is not revealed before a full year passes lest there be some who might not agree with it. Reason and would treat the ordinance lightly. This was ridiculed by our Jeremiah. If that be so said, he then hard cheese should be permitted and old cheese too should be permitted. For our Hannah said, when any matter becomes dry, it is permitted because the serpent's venom would not let it get dry. So also when matured, it is permitted as it would not have allowed it to mature. Said our Hannah, the reason for forbidding cheese is because it is impossible for it not to have particles of milk. Samuel said, because it is said in the skin of the rennet of Anibola, this implies that the rennet itself is permitted. How could Samuel have stated so? Have we not learned the rennet of heathens animals or of Anibola is forbidden? And when the question was asked, is then any slaughtered animal of a heathen not Anibola? It was Samuel himself who answered, these are meant to be taken together. Thus the rennet of an animal slaughtered by heathens, which is Anibola, is forbidden. There is no. Contradiction here Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi the former represents our Joshua's opinion before it was reversed the latter after it was reversed and the mission was allowed to remain as it was our Machia in the name of our Abbi Ahabah said cheese is forbidden because its surface is smeared with fat of swine our Hizda said because it is curdled with vinegar our Naman B. Isaac said because it might be curdled with the sap of Orla whose opinion does this
The prohibition does not extend to all use of the milk which a heathen milk without an Israelite washing him their bread and oil. Rabbi and his court permitted the oil stewed and preserved foodstuffs into which they are accustomed to put wine or vinegar pickled herring which had been minced brine in which there is no call but fish floating helic drops of a saffitida and sal condom. Behold these are prohibited but the prohibition does not extend to all use of the Gemara. Why should we feel? Concern about milk that it is prohibited if on account of the possibility that there may have been a substitution of animals the milk of a clean animal is white and of an unclean animal greenish in color if on the other hand it is on account of the possibility of a mixture of a clean animal's milk with that of an unclean animal let him curdle it because a master has declared the milk of a clean animal curdles but that of an unclean animal does not this test is all right if he required the milk for the purpose of making cheese but with what circumstance are we dealing here when he requires it as a diet then let him take a small quantity and curdle it this test would not be conclusive because even with the milk of a clean animal there is a way which does not curdle so nothing can be proved thereby or if you wish I can say that even should you maintain that the milk is intended for cheese the test is not conclusive because drops of milk remain between the Holes their bread are Kahana said in the name of our Yohanan their bread was not permitted by the court is it to be deduced from this statement that anybody does allow it yes because when Ardimi came from Palestine he said on one occasion Rabbi went out into the field and a heathen brought before him a loaf baked in a large oven from Sea of flour Rabbi exclaimed how beautiful is this loaf why should the sages have thought fit to prohibit it why should the sages have thought fit to prohibit it as a safeguard against intermarriages no what he meant was why should the sages have thought fit to prohibit it in a field as a result of this remark people imagined that Rabbi permitted the loaf of a heathen but it was not so Rabbi did not permit it or Joseph according to another version our Samuel B. Judah said the incident was not so but it is said that Rabbi once went to a certain place and observed that his disciples experienced difficulty in obtaining bread so he asked is there no Baker here people imagined that his inquiry was for a Gentile baker but he really intended an Israelite baker our Helbo said even according to those who maintain that he inquired for a Gentile baker the permission would only apply where there was no Israelite baker and not where such was to be found our Yohanan however said even according to those who maintain that he inquired for a Gentile baker the permission only holds good in a field and not in a city as a safeguard against intermarriage is able used to buy any Gentiles bread at the boundaries of the fields but Rob according to another version our and B Isaac said to the people hold no converse with Abu because he eats the bread of Gentiles and their oil as regards oil Rab said Daniel decreed against its use but Samuel said Talmud Mos Abed the residue from their unclean vessels which they pour into the oil container renders it prohibited is this to say that people generally are concerned to Eat their food in a state of ritual purity rather must Samuel's statement be amended to the residue from their prohibited vessels which they pour into the oil container renders it prohibited Samuel said to Rab according to my explanation that the residue from their prohibited vessels renders it prohibited it is quite right that when our Isaac B. Samuel B. Martha came from Palestine he related that Arsene Lay expounded in Nisibus as regards oil our Judah and his court took a vote and declared it permitted holding the opinion that when the forbidden element imparts a worse in flavor the mixture is permitted but according to your statement that it is prohibited because Daniel decreed against it can it be thought that Daniel made a decree and our Judah the prince then came and annulled it for have we not learned a court is unable to annul the decisions of another court unless it is superior to it in wisdom and numerical strength Rab replied to him you quote some lay of blood but the Inhabitants of blood are different because they are neglectful of rabbinical ordinances. Samuel said to him, Shall I send for him? Rab thereupon grew alarmed and said, If our Judah and his court have not made proper research, shall we not do so? Surely it is written, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. The verse speaks of two drinkings, viz. the drinking of wine and the drinking of oil. Rab was of the opinion that Daniel purposed in his own heart not to drink the oil and decided similarly for all Israel, whereas Samuel was of the opinion that he purposed in his own heart not to drink the oil but did not decide similarly for all Israel. But did Daniel decree against oil? Behold, Bali declared that Abimi the Nabatean said in the name of Rab the bread, wine, and oil of heathens and their daughters are all included in the eighteen things. Should you argue that Daniel came and made the decree, but it was not. Accepted and then the disciples of Hillel and Shammai came and made the decree which was accepted in that case what was the purpose of Rab's testimony but Rab's contention is that Daniel decreed against the use of the oil in a city and the disciples came and decreed against its use even in a field how then was it possible for our Judah the prince to permit what was forbidden by the ordinance of the disciples of Shammai and Hillel seeing that we have learned a court is unable to annul the decisions of another court unless it is superior to it in wisdom and numerical strength furthermore Rabbi Barhana has said in the name of our Yohanan in all matters a court can annul the decisions of another court except the 18 things prohibited by the schools of Hillel and Shammai for even were Elijah and his court to come and declare them permitted we must not listen to him our measure she has said the reason that these 18 things form an exception is because their prohibition has spread among a large majority of Israelites but the prohibition concerning oil did not so spread for our Samuel B. Abba said in the name of our Yohanan our master sat and made investigation concerning the use of heathen's oil and found that its prohibition had not spread among a large majority of Israelites they accordingly relied upon the dictum of Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel and our Elizabeth Bizadah who declared we make no decree upon the community unless the majority are able to abide by it. Our Abba Abba said what scriptural verse supports this rule Talmud, Mos Abba Zarabi are cursed with the curse for Yerabi even this whole nation i.e. when the whole nation has accepted an ordinance then the curse which is the penalty of its infraction does apply otherwise it does not the above text stated behold Bali declared that Abami the Nabatean said in the name of Rab the bread wine and oil of heathens and their daughters are all included in the 18 things what means there. Daughters are Nam and B. Isaac said the schools of Hillel and Shammai decreed that their daughters should be considered as in the state of Nineveh from their cradle and Genevieve said in the name of Rab with all the things against which they decreed the purpose was to safeguard against idolatry for when our Ahabi Adda came from Palestine he declared in the name of our Isaac they decreed against heathens bread on account of their oil but how is oil stricter than bread rather should the statement read that they made a decree against their bread and oil on account of their wine against their wine on account of their daughters against their daughters on account of another matter and against this other matter on account of still another matter but the prohibition against marrying their daughters is a biblical ordinance for it is written neither shall thou make marriages with them the biblical ordinance is restricted to the seven nations of Canaan and does not include other heathen Peoples and the schools of Hillel and Shammai came and decreed against these also but according to our Simeon Biohe who declared that the words for he will turn away thy son from following me include all women who would turn their husbands aside from the worship of God what is there to say perhaps the explanation is that the biblical ordinance is against intercourse through marriage and they came and decreed even against the moral connection with them but the decree against such connection had already been made by the court of Shem for it is written and Judah said bring her forth and let her be burnt perhaps then the explanation is that the biblical ordinance refers to an Israelite woman in intercourse with a heathen since she would be drawn after him but not against an Israelite having intercourse with a heathen woman and they came and decreed even against the latter but the prohibition against an Israelite having intercourse with a heathen woman is a law of Moses from Sinai for a master has said if an Israelite has intercourse with a heathen woman zealots may attack him the biblical ordinance refers to a public act even as the incident that had happened but they came and decreed even against the private act but the court of the Hasmoneans had already decreed also against the private act for when Ardimi came from Palestine he declared the court of the Hasmoneans decreed that an Israelite who had intercourse with a heathen woman is liable on four counts viz. she is regarded as Nida a slave a non and a married woman and when Rabin came from Palestine he declared on the following four counts viz. she is regarded as Nida a slave a non and a harlot the decree of the court of the Hasmoneans was against intercourse but not against private association with a heathen woman so they came and decreed even against this but the court of David had already decreed
came and extended it still further to association with a heathen woman. What is the meaning of the phrase used above and against this other matter on account of still another matter? Arnaman B. Isaac said they decreed in connection with a heathen child that it should cause defilement by seminal omission so that an Israelite child should not become accustomed to commit pederasty with him. For Arzara said, I experienced great trouble with R.C. and R.C. with Aryohanan and Aryohanan with Arjane. And Arjane with Arnathan B.M. Rome and Arnathan B.M. Rome with Rabbi over this question from what age does a heathen child cause defilement by seminal omission? He replied to me from a day old, but when I came to Arhai, he told me from the age of nine years. And one day when I then came and discussed the matter with Rabbi, he said to me, Abandon my reply and adopt that of Arhai who declared from what age does a heathen child cause defilement by seminal omission from the age of nine years and one. Day Talmud, Mas Abedazara, for inasmuch as he is then capable of the sexual act, he likewise defiles by omission. Rabbi said, It is therefore to be concluded that a heathen girl communicates defilement from the age of three years and one day, for inasmuch as she is then capable of the sexual act, she likewise defiles by a flux. This is obvious, you might argue that he is at an age when he knows to persuade a female, but she is not at an age when she knows to persuade a male, and consequently, Although she is technically capable of the sexual act, she does not cause defilement until she is nine years and one day old. Hence, he informs us that she communicates defilement at the earlier age. Arjun Nisiye was once walking and leaning upon the shoulder of his attendant Arsimle when he said to him, Simle, you were not present yesterday at the house of study when we declared heathens oil permitted. He replied, Would that in our days you permitted their bread? Also, he said to him, If we were to do that, they would call us the permitting court. As we have learned, our Jose B. Joezer of Zir to testify that the stag locust is clean, that the flow of blood and water from the place of slaughter in the temple is non defiling, and that one who comes in contact with the corpse is defiled. And they called him Joseph the permitter. Arsimle said to him, There he permitted three things, and the master has only permitted one, so that if he permits another, there would still be only two. He replied, I have already permitted a second what is it as we have learned if a husband said to his wife before a journey this is your bill of divorce should I not return within twelve months and he died within the twelve months the divorce is invalid in this connection it was taught and our rabbis permitted her to remarry and we ask who is intended by our rabbis Rab Judah replied in the name of Samuel the court which permitted heathens oil for they held the same view as our Jose who said the date of the document is proof of this our Abba son of our high B Abba said our Judah the prince gave this decision but the rabbis did not agree with him all his lifetime Shayado another version is all his colleagues Sayyid did not agree with him our Eliezer asked a certain old man when you permitted a woman to remarry in the circumstances described above did you allow her to do so immediately since he could not return or perhaps it was after the lapse of the twelve months since his condition had then been fulfilled he rejoined but this question arises also in connection with the continuation of the side admission where we learned but if the husband said behold this is your bill of divorce from now onward should I not return within 12 months and he died within the 12 months the divorce is valid because the condition had been fulfilled and the question thus arises does the divorce take effect immediately on his death since he could not return or perhaps only after 12 months when the condition had been fulfilled our Eliezer said to him yes even in this case I am in doubt but I put the question to you because you were among the number who voted to grant her permission to remarry Abbe said all admit that if a man said to his wife that the divorce should take effect when the sun issues from its sheath he intended the time of sunrise and should he die in the night it is then a bill of divorce which comes into force after his death and is invalid but if he said to her that the divorce should take effect on condition that the sun issues from its sheath he intended it to apply from that moment onward and should he die in the night this was certainly a condition and the divorce thus took effect while he was alive and is valid in agreement with the view of Arhuna for Arhuna said if one uses the expression on condition in a bill of divorce it is the same as if he had said from now onward they only differ over the case where he used the expression if the sun issues from its sheath Arjuna the prince being of the same opinion as our Jose who said the date of the document is proof of this and he holds it to be identical with the phrases from today if I die and from now onward if I die the rabbis on the other hand do not agree with our Jose and maintain that it is merely identical with here is your bill of divorce if I die the above text stated our Jose B. Joe Ezra of Zir to testify that the stag locust is clean that the flow of Blood and water from the place of slaughter in the temple is non defiling, and that one who comes in contact with the corpse is defiled, and they called him Joseph the Permitter. What is the stag locust? Our Papa said, Shoshiba, and our high BM I said in the name of Olysses, our Papa said it was the Shoshiba, so they differ on the permissibility of the long headed locust, one holding that it is prohibited, and the other that it is permitted. Our high BM I said in the name of Ola that it was the Sispal Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi, and nobody differs that the long headed locust is prohibited, and here they disagree when there is difficulty in perceiving whether its wings cover the greater part of the body, one holding that we require the wings to cover just more than the greater part of the body, and the other that we require it appreciably to cover the greater part of the body, that the flow of blood and water from the place of slaughter in the temple is non defiling, what means not. Defiling Rab said it is essentially clean but Samuel said it was non-defiling in the sense that it did not render other things unclean which it touched but in itself there was uncleanness when Rab said that it was essentially clean he was of the opinion that the defiling power of liquids was a rabbinical ordinance and when the rabbis decreed so their intention was to attribute defilement to liquids in general but they did not so decree in connection with the flow from the place of slaughter. When however Samuel said that it was non-defiling in the sense that it did not render other things unclean but in itself there was uncleanness he was of the opinion that the defilement in liquids was a biblical ordinance but with respect to its power to render other things unclean it was a rabbinical ordinance and when the rabbis decreed so their intention was to attribute the power of communicating defilement to liquids in general but they did not so decree in connection with the flow from it. Place of slaughter, and then one who comes in contact with the corpse is defiled, and they called him Joseph the Permitter. Rather, should he have been called in this instance Joseph the Prohibitor? Furthermore, that a corpse defile is a biblical ordinance, as it is written, and whosoever in the open field touches one that is slain with a sword or a dead body or a bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean seven days, according to Scripture. He who comes in contact with the corpse is defiled, but anybody who comes in contact with this person is clean. And the rabbis proceeded to decree that even such as he is defiled, and Jose B. Joezer proceeded to re-establish the law in its biblical form. But the defilement of the person who comes in contact with one who had touched the corpse is likewise a biblical ordinance, for it is written, and whatsoever the unclean person touches shall be unclean. The rabbis declared in the presence of Rabbah on the authority of Marzitra, son of Naman, who said. It in the name of Arnaman according to the scriptures if a person touches another while the latter is in contact with the corpse he too is defiled for seven days but if he touches him when there is not this contact then he is only defiled until the evening the rabbis proceeded to decree that even without contact he is defiled for seven days and our Jose proceeded to re-establish the law in its scriptural form once is this to be derived from the Torah for it is written he that toucheth it. Dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days and it is also written and whatsoever the unclean person touch it shall be unclean continuing with and the soul that touch it, it shall be unclean until even how are these texts to be understood the former refers to the circumstance where there is actual contact and the latter to where there is not actual contact Rabbah said to them have I not previously told you not to hang empty pictures on Arnaman this is what Arnaman said he Jose of Zirda. Permitted a doubtful case of defilement in a public domain, but this is a rule which is drawn by analogy from the case of a woman suspected of infidelity. This is a case of doubt in connection with the suspected woman can only occur when seclusion with her paramour takes place in a private domain. So the case of doubt in connection with defilement can only occur when the contact with the corpse takes place in a private domain. Our Yohanan said such indeed is the traditional rule, but none of the rabbis would decide in that manner until Jose B. Joezer came and definitely decided. So there is a teaching to the same effect. Our Judah says Jose B. Joezer stuck stakes in the ground for the people, declaring up to here is a public domain and up to there a private
Drawn in the sense as only water which has not been changed from its natural form by fire is permitted to juice so the food must not have been changed from its natural form by fire but there is nothing in the verse about fire Talmud, Mas Abed Azara rather than is it a rabbinical ordinance and the scriptural verse is merely a support our Samuel B. Isaac said in the name of Rab whatever is eaten raw does not come within the law of what is prohibited on account of having been cooked by. Even thus was it taught in Surah but in Pumadai that they taught this version our Samuel B. R. Isaac said in the name of Rab whatever is not brought upon the table of kings to serve as a relish with bread does not come within the law of what is prohibited on account of having been cooked by heathens what is the difference between the two versions the permissibility of small fish mushrooms and pounded grain R. C. said in the name of Rab small fish when salted by heathens do not come within. The law of what is prohibited on account of having been cooked by heathens are Joseph said if a heathen roasted them an Israelite may rely upon them in connection with Arabi tapshalin if however a heathen made them into a pie of fish hash it is prohibited this is obvious you might argue that in such a pie the fish hash is the principal element hence he informs us that the flour is the principal element are Barada said in the name of Rab if a heathen set fire to uncleared ground all the roasted locusts found in the unclear ground are prohibited how is this to be understood is it to say that the reason is because he could not distinguish between the clean and unclean species why then specify that a heathen kindled the fire since it would be the same if even an Israelite did so or is it on account of the locusts having been cooked by a heathen but in such a circumstance would they be prohibited did not our and BMI declare that our pet said in the name of our Yohanan if a heathen since the head it is permissible to eat of it even from the tip of the ear this proves does it not that it is assumed that his intention was to remove the hair so similarly in the other case it should be allowed because his intention was to clear the ground no the true reason was certainly because he could not distinguish between the clean and unclean species and the incident actually happened with the heathen the above text stated Arhan and BMI declared that our pet said in the name of our Yohanan if a heathen cinched the head it is permissible to eat of it even from the tip of the ear Robin has said consequently if a heathen threw a colder into a stove and an Israelite had previously deposited a pumpkin there it is alright this is obvious you might argue that his intention had been to boil the blade hence he informs us that his intention was to harden it Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel if an Israelite left meat on the coals and a heathen came and turned it over it is Permitted how is this to be understood if I say that the meat would have been cooked without being turned over obviously it is permitted is it not then to be inferred that we have here a case where it would not have been cooked without being turned over why then is it permitted seeing it is food cooked by a heathen no it is necessary to suppose a circumstance where it would have taken two hours to cook if he had not turned it over but now it was cooked in one hour you might consequently have argued that hastening the process of cooking is a matter which is taken into consideration hence he informs us that it is not considered but R.C. said in the name of our Yohanan any food which is already cooked to the extent of that which was eaten by Bendrosis does not come within the law prohibiting the cooked food of heathens hence if it is not cooked to that extent it does come within the prohibition the circumstance referred to by our Yohanan is where e.g. an Israelite placed the meat in a pot and a heathen took and set it in an oven there is a teaching to the same effect an Israelite may set meat upon the coals and let a heathen then come and turn it over pending his return from the synagogue or house of study and he need not take notice of it and an Israelite woman may set a pot on a stove and let a Gentile woman Talmud, Mas Abed Azara then come and stir it pending her return from the bathhouse or synagogue and she need take no notice of it the question was asked how is it if a heathen placed meat upon the coals and an Israelite turned it over our nom and B. Isaac said the answer can be deduced by a fortiori reasoning if the food is permitted when its cooking is completed by a heathen how much more so when it is completed by an Israelite it has been similarily stated Rabbi B. Barhana said in the name of our Yohanan another version is Arah Hassan of Hannah said in the name of our Yohanan whether a heathen placed it there and an Israelite turned it over or vice versa it is permitted and it is not prohibited unless both the beginning and completion of the cooking are performed by a heathen Robin has said the law with reference to bread is if a heathen kindled the fire and an Israelite baked it or vice versa or if a heathen both kindled the fire and baked the bread but an Israelite came and raked the fire it is all right fish salted by a heathen is permitted by Hezekiah but prohibited by our Yohanan and egg roasted by a heathen is permitted by Bar Kippur but prohibited by our Yohanan when Ardimi came from Palestine he said both salted fish and roasted eggs are permitted by Hezekiah and Bar Kippur but prohibited by our Yohanan our high part visited the house of the exilarch where he was asked how is it when an egg is roasted by a heathen he replied Hezekiah and Bar Kippur permitted but our Yohanan prohibits it and the opinion of one authority cannot stand against that of two Arzi but said to them pay no attention to him because of a Declared that the legal decision agrees with our Yohanan, the exilarch's heathen servants were infuriated by Arzibid's remark and gave him a draft of spiced vinegar from which he died. Our rabbis taught the caper flour leeks and liverwort preserved by heathens, water boiled, and ears of corn roasted by them are permitted, but a roasted egg is prohibited as regards oil. Our Judah the prince and his court took a vote on it and declared it permitted. It has been taught the rule which applies to liver. Word holds good also of the beans called Pisaliyah and Egyptian beans. Shiatha, what are Shiatha? Rabbi Barhana said in the name of our Yohanan, it is 40 years since this preparation was imported from Egypt, while Rabbi Barhana himself said it is 60 years since this preparation was imported from Egypt. There is no contradiction since each statement was made in the corresponding year. The manner of its preparation is as follows take the seeds of parsley, flax, and fenugreek, soak them. Together in lukewarm water and leave them until they begin to sprout then take new earth and wear pots fill them with water and soak therein red clay into which the seeds are planted after that go to the bathhouse and by the time of coming out they will have blossomed and on eating of them you will feel cool from the hair of the head down to the toenails Arashi said Arhanan had told me that this is an empty tale according to another version he told him that the effect was achieved through magical spells our rabbis taught date husks belonging to a heathen when boiled in a large cauldron are prohibited but if in a small cauldron they are permitted which is a small cauldron Arjane said one into which a swallow cannot enter but perhaps it is cut up in pieces and placed in it to be cooked rather must a small cauldron be defined as one into which the head of a swallow cannot enter but it has been taught whether it be a large or small cauldron the brew is permitted there is no contradiction for where the teacher forbids a large cauldron he is in agreement with the view that when the forbidden element of a mixture imparts a worse in flavor it is prohibited while in the other case the teacher is in agreement with the view that when the forbidden element imparts a worse in flavor the mixture is permitted our she's hate said the cooked oil of a gentile is prohibited our saffir said why should we be concerned about it to declare it prohibited if because of the possibility that he may have mixed yen with it the effect would be to turn it rancid if it is on account of the prohibition against all things cooked by a heathen it is something which is eatable in its raw state if on account of the rule that vessels used by heathens must be scoured before they may be used by a Jew it is an instance where a worse in flavor is imparted and it should therefore be permitted RC was asked what of dates cooked by a gentile as regards the sweet Species the question does not arise since they are certainly permitted as regards the bitter species the question also does not arise since they are certainly prohibited but there is a question about the middle species how is it with them you replied why do you ask me this question seeing that my teacher is Levi has declared them prohibited as for shady they brewed by a heathen rap permits it but Samuel's father and Levi prohibited if it is made from wheat or barley they all agree that it is permitted if from lentils and vinegar all agree that it is prohibited where there is disagreement is when it is made from lentils and water Samuel's father and Levi are of the opinion that we decree it prohibited from fear that being permitted with water people will drink it when it has been prepared with vinegar whereas Rab held that we do not declare it prohibited because of that fear another version is when the shady they is made from lentils and water all agree that it is Prohibited where there is disagreement is when it is made from wheat or barley and prepared with water Samuel's father and Levi being of the opinion that we decree it prohibited from fear that being permitted with water people will drink it when it has been prepared with vinegar
Something actual but with the pressed foodstuffs it is not something actual pickled herring which had been minced brine in which no fish etc. What is the meaning of Helicar Naman B. Abbasid in the name of rabbit is the sultanate why is it prohibited because other species of a similar kind but prohibited are caught together with it are rabbis taught those species of fish which have no fins and scales at the time but grow them later as e.g. the sultanate and aphids are permitted those which have them at the time but shed them when drawn out of the water as e.g. the coleus comber swordfish anthias and tunny are permitted are announced in Caesarea that fish entrails and fish roe may be purchased from anybody since the presumption is that they only come from Pelusium and Aspamia this is like what Abbe said the Zahanta from the river Babnahara is permitted on what ground if I answer because of the rapid flow of the stream and an unclean species of fish cannot exist in fast flowing water since the backbone is lacking in them we do see them existing there if it be suggested that the reason is because the water is salty and an unclean species of fish cannot exist in salty water since scales are lacking in them we do see them existing there rather must the explanation be that the river bed is such that it does not permit the breeding of the unclean species of fish Robin has said since nowadays the rivers Goza and Gamda flow into Babnahara it's Zahanta is Prohibited base said the CSIE is permitted the Seahawks prohibited and an aid to the memory is the unclean on land visias is clean in the water and vice versa Arashi said Shafarnana is permitted Kiteshana prohibited and an aid to the memory is holy coach to the Lord but not to men according to another version he said that the Kavarnana is prohibited and an aid to the memory being the phrase graves Kibra of Evans when our Akiba visited Kazak they set before him a fish resembling them a fish he covered it over with a basket and noticing scales in it declared it permitted when Arashi visited Tom Jariah they set before him a fish resembling an eel holding it up against the sun he noticed that it had growths like scales so he declared it permitted when Arashi visited a certain place they set before him fish resembling the Shafarnana he covered white basins over them and perceiving scales in them declared them permitted when Rabbi Barhanna visited the fort. Of Agama they set before him some Zahanta but when he heard somebody call it Roach he said since this has been called Roach I conclude that there is something unclean in it he did not eat any of it and looking at it the following day he found something unclean in it so he applied to himself the verse there shall no mischief happen to the righteous drops of a zafi on what ground are they prohibited when obtained by a heathen because to secure them the root must be cut with a knife and although a master has said that when the forbidden element imparts a worsened flavor the mixture is permitted yet on account of the pungency of the zafi it sweetens the fatty substance which had been absorbed in the knife and it therefore becomes a case where the forbidden element imparts an improved flavor and as such is prohibited our Levi slave used to sell a zafi and when our Levi died people asked our Yohan and whether it was permissible to buy of him he replied to them that Slave of Haber is like a Haber Arhuna Bimini my bought blue wool from the wife of Aram Rum the pious and came before our Joseph he was unable to answer him and when Hanan the tailor chanced to meet him Arhuna mentioned the matter to him he replied how could the poor Joseph be acquainted with this but it once happened that I bought blue wool from the household of Rabban brother of Arhai Biaba and I came before our Matina who could not answer the same question so I went to our Judah of Hadronia who said to me you have need of my instruction thus said Samuel the wife of Haber is like a Haber for our rabbis have taught the wife of Haber is like a Haber the slave of Haber is like a Haber and when Haber dies his wife children and members of his household remain in that state of confidence until they give grounds for suspicion similarly a story in which blue wool is sold remains in a state of confidence until its wares are disqualified our rabbis have taught the wife of Amhiras who marries a Haber likewise the daughter of an Amhiras who marries a Haber and the slave of an Amhiras who is sold to a Haber are all required to take the obligation relating to the status of a Haber but the wife of a Haber who marries an Amhiras likewise the daughter of a Haber who marries an Amhiras and the slave of a Haber who is sold to an Amhiras are not of an issue required to take the obligation relating to the status of a Haber such as the statement of our Meir R. Judah says these two are required of an issue to take the obligation relating to the status of a Haber similarly declared our Simeon B. Eliezer it happened that a woman married to a Haber used to bind the phylacteries upon his arm she afterwards married a tax collector and she used to attach the tax seals for him Rab said milk meat wine and blue wool if transmitted through was no longer alive at the time of the purchase and the wife might have sold him some imitation instead of the genuine blue. Even with only one seal attached to identify them are prohibited, but a zafi tida fish sauce bread and cheese are permitted with one seal. Milk meat wine and blue wool talmud. Moss abad azarabi are prohibited with one seal, but a zafi fish sauce bread and cheese are permitted with one seal. Why need we be concerned about bread? Were he to change a fresh loaf for a stale one or a wheaten loaf for one of barley, it could be readily detected if the fear is that he might substitute one loaf for another, like it baked by a heathen. Since there is one seal attached, he would not take the trouble to commit a fraud. Why, however, should Rab make a distinction that with cheese a heathen would not take the trouble to commit a fraud and allows one seal? Likewise, with milk he would not take the trouble to commit a fraud. And yet Rab demands two seals. Our Kahana said, strike out the word milk and insert slices of fish which have no distinguishing mark, but that is the same as meat. Rab. Differentiates two kinds of meat. Samuel, on the other hand, said meat wine and blue wool are prohibited with one seal, but fish sauce is afi and cheese are permitted with one seal. According to Samuel, a slice of fish which has no distinguishing mark is regarded as the same as meat, and we do not say that there are two kinds of meat. Our rabbis taught we do not buy in Syria wine, fish sauce, milk, sal, condom, as afi or cheese, unless it be from a reliable dealer. But if an Israelite is a guest of a host, there all these foodstuffs are permitted. This supports the statement of our Joshua B. Levi, who said if a Syrian householder sends him as a gift any of these foodstuffs to his house, he may eat them. For what reason a householder would not leave what is allowed and eat what is forbidden? And if he sends anything to him, it may be assumed that he sends him from what he himself eats. And sal condom, what is sal condom? Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel, salt of which all. Roman guests partake our rabbis have taught black sal condom is prohibited and the white is permitted such is the statement of our Meir Arjuda says the white is prohibited and the black permitted Arjuda B. Gamaliel says in the name of our Hannah B. Gamaliel both kinds are prohibited Rabbi B. Barhana said in the name of our Yohanan in the opinion of him who declared the white to be prohibited the intestines of unclean white fish are mixed with it in the opinion of him who declared the black to be prohibited the intestines of unclean black fish are mixed with it and in the opinion of him who declared both kinds to be prohibited the intestines of both species of fish are mixed with them are about said in the name of our Hannah B. Gamaliel there was an old man in our neighborhood who used to polish the salt with swine's fat behold these are prohibited what does this intend to exclude according to Hezekiah it excludes those preserved foods in which it is known that wine is included According to our Yohanan, it excludes fish brine and cheese from Bithynia. This anonymous statement in the Mishnah is that of our Meir Mishnah, the following are permitted to be eaten by an Israelite milk, which a heathen milk with an Israelite washing him honey great clusters, even when these exude moisture, the law which renders food susceptible to defilement by a liquid does not apply to them. Preserved foodstuffs into which they are not accustomed to put wine or vinegar pickled herring, which has not been minced brine containing fish, a leaf of a safi and rolled olive cakes. Our Jose says those olives having stones ready to drop out are prohibited. Locusts which come out of a shopkeeper's basket are prohibited, but if from his stock they are permitted, the same rule applies to the heat offering tomorrow. What we learn here in the Mishnah is a support for what the rabbis have taught elsewhere. If an Israelite is sitting near a heathen's flock and the latter milks and brings some to him. He need have no concern and is allowed to drink it. How is this to be understood? If there is no unclean animal in the flock, obviously so. But if there is an unclean animal in the flock, why should he be permitted to drink the milk? It certainly deals here with the circumstance when there is an unclean animal. But the Israelite is in such a position that when he stands up, he can see the heathen, and when sitting, he is unable to see him. You might argue that since he cannot see him when sitting, he should fear that he might bring him milk in which something
Called the fish Talmud, Mas Abed Azara floating in it since you declare it permitted when there is one called the fish in it is there any need of mentioning two there is no difficulty in open barrels two are necessary but enclosed one suffices it has been stated Arhuna said pickled herring is not considered as minced so long as the head and backbone are recognizable Arnam and said either the head or the backbone are Akbabi have objected we learned with regard to fish only such as have fins. And scales may be eaten. Abay said the Mishnah deals with the skate and blemish, the heads of which resemble those of unclean fish. Rab Judah said in the name of all the difference of opinion between Arhuna and Arnaman is over the permissibility to dip bread in the brine, but as regards eating the chopped herring, all agree that it is prohibited unless both the head and backbone are recognizable. Arzara said at first I used to dip bread in the brine, but when I heard the statement of Rab Judah in the name of all of his, the difference of opinion is over the permissibility to dip bread in the brine, but as regards eating the chopped herring, all agree that it is prohibited unless both the head and backbone are recognizable. I would not also dip in it. Or Papa said the legal decision is that both the head and backbone of each fish must be recognizable. An objection is raised. Pieces of fish are all permitted so long as a mark that the fish was of the clean species is found in the hole. Of it or a portion of it, even a hundredth part of it, and it once happened that I even brought a barrel containing pieces of fish and a mark of the clean species was found in one of them. Thereupon, Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel declared the whole barrel to be permitted. Our Papa gave this explanation such a decision is correct when the pieces are alike. If this be so, why mention it? You might argue that we are concerned lest that fish which had the mark of cleanness happen to fit in by chance. So he informs us that we need have no such fear. A boatload of Zahanta once came to secure our Hunabi Hidna went to inspect it and noticing scales on the sides of the boat declared the fish to be permitted. Rabbi said to him, How is it possible to give permission in a place where fish with scales are common? So Rabbi issued an announcement prohibiting the fish, whereupon our Hunabi Hidna issued an announcement that they were permitted. Our Jeremiah Dipti said, Our Papi told me that our Hunabi Hidna only allowed the brine but not the eating of the fish Rashi she said our papa told me that our Hunabi Hidna even allowed the fish to be eaten but as for myself I cannot prohibit it after what our papa told me nor can I permit it in view of what Rab Judah declared in the name of all of his the difference of opinion is over the permissibility to dip bread in the brine but as regards eating the fish all agree that it is prohibited unless both the head and backbone are recognizable in each one are. Hidna B. Edi was sitting in the presence of our Adabi Ahaba and while sitting there he said if he even brought a boat laden with barrels of fish brine and called the fish is found in one of them should they be open barrels they are all permitted but if closed that barrel is permitted and the rest are prohibited our Ada asked him once have you this he replied I heard it from three eminent scholars his Rab Samuel and our Yohanan our Barana said in the name of Rab fish entrails and Roshu. Only be bought of a reliable man will remark to our dust high of grace since Rab mentioned that fish entrails and row should only be bought of a reliable man it follows that unclean fish have row but against this I quote unclean fish are viviparts whereas clean fish eject eggs he replied then strike out the word row our said to him do not strike out the word because they both eject eggs but whereas the clean species breed by ejecting eggs which mature in the sand of the river bed the other is actually viviparts why however is it necessary to buy the row from a reliable man surely we could examine the marks which differentiate the clean and unclean species for it has been taught the marks of clean birds eggs are the same as those of clean fish but how can such a thought enter your mind since scripture mentions fins and scales as the marks of clean fish the meaning is the marks of clean birds eggs are the same as those of fish row which may be eaten and it Following are the marks of clean birds eggs such as are arched and rolling i.e. one end is rounded and the other pointed are clean if both ends are pointed or round and they are unclean if the yolk is outside and the white inside the egg is unclean if the white is outside and the yolk inside the egg is clean if the white and yolk are mixed up it is a reptile's egg Rabbi said Rab's statement that it must only be bought of a reliable person refers to when the row has been pressed but as for our dust high of who said that the word row should be struck out Talmud, Mas Abed Azara be surely it has been taught the marks of clean birds eggs are the same as those of fish row which may be eaten must not this very that all events be explained read therefore thus are the same as fish entrails but where is it found that the marks of fish entrails are rounded and pointed this is actually found with the fish bladder if there be no reliable man what then Rab Judah said so long as he declares I salted the fish it is permitted Arnam and said he must be able to declare these are the fish and these their entrails Rab Judah instructed out of the attendant so long as he declares I salted the fish it is permitted a leaf of a zafi tida obviously it may be eaten it would not have been necessary to mention it except for the drops which may be attached to the leaf you might argue that we must be concerned lest he even bring other drops of a zafi tida which he had cut from it root with his knife and mix them with it hence he informs us that the drops which are found on the leaf detached themselves without cutting and came off together with it and rolled olive cakes obviously they may be eaten no it is necessary to mention that they may be eaten even when they are very soft for you might argue that they even put wine on them hence he informs us that their softness is due to the oil our Jose says those olives having stones ready to drop out Jalahin are Prohibited what is to be understood by Shalihin our Jose Bihanada said those olives whose kernels drop out as soon as one takes them in his hand locusts which come etc. Our rabbis taught locusts capers and leeks which come from the warehouse the stock or from a ship are permitted but those sold on the counter in front of a shop are prohibited because the shopkeeper sprinkles wine upon them similarly the apple cider of a heathen taken from the warehouse the stock or a basket is permitted but if it is sold on the counter it is prohibited because they mix wine with it our rabbis taught rabbi once suffered from a disorder of the bowels and said does anyone know whether apple cider of a heathen is prohibited or permitted our Ishmael son of our Jose replied my father once had the same complaint and they brought him apple cider of a heathen which was 70 years old he drank it and recovered he said to him you had this information all this time and let me suffer they made inquiry and found a even who possessed 300 jars of apple cider 70 years old rabbi drank some of it and recovered whereupon he exclaimed blessed be the all-present who delivered his universe into the keeping of guardians the same rule applies to the heat offering how is this phrase to be understood Arshis hate said it means that the same rule applies to a priest who is suspected of selling his portion of the heat offering as though it were common food if it is in front of him it is prohibited to buy it but if it comes out of a warehouse or the stock or a basket it is permitted because he would be afraid to include the heat offering among the wares thinking that should the rabbis hear of it they would deprive him of the lot chapter 3 mission all images are prohibited because they are worshipped once a year such as the statement of our mayor but the sages declare an image is not prohibited except one that has a staff or bird or orb in its hand rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel. Says also any image which has anything in its hand is prohibited Gemara if they are worshipped once a year what is the reason of the rabbis our Isaac B. Joseph said in the name of our Yohanan in the place where our Meir lived the heathens used to worship each image once a year and since our Meir takes a minority into consideration he decreed against the use of images in the other places on account of the place where they are worshipped the rabbis on the other hand who do not take a minority into consideration did not decree against the use of images in the other places on account of the place where they are worshipped Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel the teaching of the mission refers to the royal statues Rabbi Barhana said in the name of our Yohanan the teaching of the mission only applies to these statues when they stand at the entrance of a city Talmud Mas Abedazara Rabbi said there is a difference of opinion with regard to statues in villages but as for those which are in cities all agree that they are permitted what is the reason for their being permitted they are made for ornamentation but is there anyone who says that the images set up in villages are made merely for ornamentation surely those in the villages were made to be worshipped if however Rabbi's statement is quoted it must be in this form Rabbi said there is difference of opinion with regard to statues in cities but as for those in villages all agree that they are prohibited but the sages declare an image is not prohibited etc it is prohibited when holding a staff because the implication is that it rules the whole world as with a staff it is prohibited when holding a bird because the implication is that it grasps the whole world as
or the figure of a foot behold it is prohibited because such an object is worshipped Gemara Samuel said even fragments of idols are permitted but have we not learned fragments of images the same law applies even to fragments of idols and the reason the Mishnah uses the phrase fragments of images is because of the intention to continue with the teaching if one found the figure of a hand or the figure of a foot behold it is prohibited because such an object is worshipped we learned in the Mishnah if one found the figure of a hand or the figure of a foot behold it is prohibited because such an object is worshipped but why should they be prohibited Talmud Mas Abed Azarabi their only fragment Samuel explained that the prohibition only applies when the hand and foot are set upon their base it has been stated if an idol was broken of its own accord Aryohan and said that its fragments are prohibited and Arsimian Bilakish said that they are permitted Aryohan and said that they are prohibited because the idol has not been annulled Arsimian Bilakish said that they are permitted because the owner certainly annuls the idol without expressly doing so by saying it could not save itself so how can it save me Aryohan and quoted against Arsimian Bilakish and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands lay cut off therefore neither the priests of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread etc he replied to him can any proof be brought from therein that passage we learned that they abandoned Dagon and worshipped the threshold because said they the divinity left Dagon and went and settled itself upon the threshold are Yohanan and quoted against him if one finds fragments of images behold they are permitted consequently fragments of idols are prohibited are Simeon replied do not deduce that fragments of idols are prohibited but deduce that the images themselves when whole are forbidden and the anonymous statement in the Mishnah is it. View of Armeir now as to are Yohanan are we not to infer from the view of Armeir what is the opinion of the rabbis did not Armeir say that images are prohibited but the fragments of images are permitted hence likewise according to the rabbis while an idol itself is prohibited its fragments are permitted but is the analogy correct there in the case of images they were perhaps worshipped or perhaps not and even if you assume that they had been worshipped perhaps they had been annulled but in the Case of an idol, it has certainly been worshipped, and who can say whether it has been annulled? Consequently, there is a doubt and a certainty, and a doubt cannot set aside a certainty, and cannot a doubt set aside a certainty. Behold, it has been taught if a haber died and left a storeroom full of fruits, even if they are only then due to be tithed, they are presumed to have been properly treated. Now, here it is certain that the fruits were once untithed, and there is a doubt whether he had tithed. The more not yet the doubt does set aside the certainty. No, here it is a case of certainty and certainty, because it is regarded as certain that he had tithed the produce according to the teaching of our Hanan of Hosi. For our Hanan of Hosi said it is presumed with a haber that he does not allow anything to pass out of his control unless it had been properly treated, or if you wish, I can say that it is a case of doubt and doubt as he might have acted according to the advice of our Ashai who said. A man may act cunningly with his produce and store it together with the chaff so that his cattle may eat of it and it become exempt from the tithe and cannot a doubt set aside a certainty. Behold, it has been taught our Judah said it once happened that a female slave Talmud, Mas Abedazara of a certain tax collector in Rimen threw the body of a premature child into a pit and a priest came and gazed into the pit to ascertain whether it was male or female. The matter came before the sages and they pronounced him clean because weasels and martins are commonly found there. Now here is a certainty that the woman had cast a premature child into the pit and a doubt whether animals dragged it elsewhere or not. Yet the doubt sets aside the certainty. Do not say she cast a premature child into a pit but she cast a kind of embryo into a pit but it is stated that the priest gazed to ascertain whether it was male or female. It must be understood thus he gazed to ascertain whether she had. Aborted wind or cast a premature child into the pit and if you assume that she threw a premature child there he gazed to ascertain whether it was male or female or if you wish I can say that since weasels and martins are commonly found there they certainly dragged it elsewhere are Yohanan quoted against Arsimian Bilakish if one found the figure of a hand or the figure of a foot behold it is prohibited because such an object is worshipped why should they not be permitted they are only fragments but surely Samuel explained that the prohibition only applies when the hand and foot are set upon their base are Yohanan further quoted against Arsimian an idolater can annul an idol belonging to himself or to another idolater but an Israelite cannot annul the idol of an idolater why should not an Israelite be able to annul it let it be considered the same as an idol which was broken of its own accord Abbe said the mission refers to a case where he only defaced the idol and Supposing he only defaced it, what of it? Behold, we have learned if he defaced it, although there was no reduction in the mass of the material, it is annulled. This rule only applies when an idolater defaced it in this manner, but if an Israelite did so, it is not annulled. Rabbah, however, said in reality, when an Israelite only defaces it, it is also annulled, but it was feared that he might lift it up and then annul it in that event, it would be an idol in the possession of an Israelite, and an idol which is in the possession of an Israelite can never be annulled. Are Yohanan further quoted against our Simeon? If an idolater brought stones from the statue of Mercurius and used them for paving roads or theaters, they are permitted to be walked on by an Israelite, but if an Israelite brought stones from the statue of Mercurius and used them for paving roads or theaters, they are prohibited, but why are they not permitted? Let them be considered the same as an idol which was broken of its own accord. This case has also to be explained according to the exposition of Rabbi Yohan and further quoted against our Simeon. If an idolater chipped off an idol to make use of the pieces it and the pieces are permitted and if he did so to embellish it it is prohibited but its pieces are permitted but if an Israelite chipped off an idol whether to make use of the pieces or for its embellishment it and the pieces are prohibited now why are they not allowed let them be considered the same as an idol which is broken of its own accord. This case has also to be explained according to the exposition of Rabbi Yohan and further quoted against our Simeon. Our Jose says he may grind an idol to powder and scatter it to the wind or throw it into the sea. They said to him even so it may then become manure and it is stated and there shall cleave not of a devoted thing to thine hand now why is it not permitted let it be considered the same as an idol which is broken of its own accord. This case. Has also to be explained according to the exposition of Rabbi Yohan and further quoted against our Simeon. Our Jose B. Jason says if he found the figure of a dragon with its head cut off, should there be a doubt whether an idolater or an Israelite had mutilated it, it is permitted. But if it is certain that an Israelite had mutilated it, it is prohibited. But why let it be considered the same as an idol which is broken of its own accord? This case has also to be explained according to the exposition of Rabbi Yohan and further quoted against our Simeon. Our Jose says nor may vegetables be planted beneath an asher in winter because the foliage falls upon them. But why let it be considered the same as an idol which is broken of its own accord? It is different in this case because the basic part of the idol remains Talmud, Mas Abed Arabi. But there is the analogous instance of chips where the basic part of the idol remains and it was taught above if he did so to embellish it, it is. Prohibited, but its pieces are permitted. Arhuna, the son of Arjashua, said there is a difference because an idol cannot be annulled by a natural cause. Arsimian Bilakish quoted against Arjuhan, and if there be a bird's nest upon the top of a tree which had been dedicated to the sanctuary, no use may be made of it. But if wrongful use of it had been made, the law of trespass does not apply to it. If, however, the nest be on top of an asherah, he knocks it off with a stick. Now it is to be assumed, is it? Not that the case dealt with here is, for example, where the bird broke twigs from the asherah and built a nest of them, and yet it is taught he knocks it off with a stick. No, we are dealing here with the case where, for example, the bird brought twigs from all sorts of places and built a nest of them. This conclusion is proved to be correct from the fact that in connection with a tree dedicated to the sanctuary, it is stated no use may be made of it. But if wrongful use had been made of it, the Law of trespass does not apply to it now. This is quite right if you say that the bird brought twigs from all sorts of places that it is stated in connection with a tree dedicated to the sanctuary, no use may be made of it. But if wrongful use had been made of it, the law of trespass does not apply to it. No use may be made of it according to rabbinical ruling, and no law of trespass applies to it according to the law of the Torah because the twigs were not dedicated to the sanctuary. But if on the other hand you say that the bird broke twigs from that tree which had been dedicated and built a nest with them, why is there no trespass
They take hold of but in regard to the making of images for worship they do so only of these three objects enumerated in the mission which are specially honored by them but as for the other figures they only make them for ornamental purposes are she's hate used to collect difficult extra mission passages and expound them pictures of all the planets are permissible except that of the sun and moon of all faces are permissible except that of a human face and of all figures are permissible except that of the dragon the master said pictures of all the planets are permissible except that of the sun and moon with what are we dealing here shall I say with the making of them if it is with the making of them or any of the planets allowed seeing that it is written ye shall not make with me i.e. ye shall not make according to the likeness of my attendants who serve before me in the heights obviously then it must refer to finding them and it is in accord with our mission if one finds utensils upon which is the figure of the sun or moon or a dragon he casts them into the salt sea if then it refers to finding them consider the middle clause of all faces are permissible except that of a human face now if this refers to finding them is the picture of a human face prohibited surely we have learned if one finds utensils upon which is the figure of the sun or moon or a dragon he casts them into the salt sea which implies that he does this to the figure of a dragon but not to the picture of a human face obviously then it must refer to making them and it is in accord with the view of Arhuna the son of Arjashua if then it refers to making them consider the last clause of all figures are permissible except that of the dragon now if this refers to making them is the image of the dragon prohibited seeing it is written ye shall not make with me gods of silver or gods of gold Talmud, Mas Abedazare implying these are prohibited but not the image of the dragon obviously then it refers to finding them and it is in accord with our mission if one finds utensils upon which is the figure of the sun or a dragon they are prohibited therefore the first and last clauses deal with the act of finding and the middle clause with the act of making Abbe said that is so the first and last clauses deal with the act of finding and the middle clause with the act of making Rabbi said they all deal with the act of finding and as for the middle clause it is the teaching of Arjuna for it. Has been taught Arjuna also includes a picture of a woman giving to suck and Serapis a woman giving to suck alludes to Eve who suckled the whole world Serapis alludes to Joseph who became a prince star and a peace the whole world the picture of Serapis is only prohibited when he is represented as holding a measure and is measuring and that of Isis when she is holding a child and giving it to suck our rabbis taught which is the figure of a dragon that is prohibited our Simeon B. Eliezer explained such as has scales between its joints upon this RC commented between the joints of the neck our Hamas son of Hanan said the Halashah is in accord with the view of our Simeon B. Eliezer Rabbi B. said in the name of our Joshua B. Levi I was once walking with the eminent our Eliezer Hakafar along the road and he found a ring upon which was a figure of a dragon there passed by a heathen child but he said nothing to him and there passed by an adult heathen and our Eliezer said to him annul it but he refused to do so and he struck him until he annulled it draw three deductions from this first a heathen can annul an idolatrous object which belongs to himself or to a fellow heathen secondly if the heathen understands the nature of the idolatrous object and its mode of worship he can annul it but if he is ignorant of its nature and mode of worship he cannot annul it and thirdly force may be used to make a heathen annul the object our Hanan ridiculed the foregoing statement saying does not the eminent R. Eliezer Hakafar agree with the following teaching if a person rescued something from a lion bear leopard or from a robber river or from what the tide throws up or the overflow of a river or if a person finds something in a camp or main highway or in a place where many people congregated behold the object belongs to him because the owner despairs of recovering it Abbe explained granted that the owner despaired of recovering it but did he despair of its sacred character he must have said to himself if an idolater finds it he will worship it if an Israelite finds it since it is a valuable object he will sell it to an idolater who will worship it we have learned elsewhere our Gamaliel had a picture of lunar diagrams in his upper chamber in the form of a chart hanging on the wall which he used to show to the unlearned and ask then did you see the moon thus or thus but is such a picture allowed for behold it is written ye shall not make with me i.e. ye shall not make according to the likeness of my attendants who serve before me Abbe explained the Torah only forbids the making of his attendants which can be reproduced in fact simile according to the teaching a man may not make a house after the design of the temple or a porch after the design of the temple porch a courtyard after the design of the temple court a table after the design of the table in the temple or a candelabrum after the design of its candelabrum he may However, make one with five, six, or eight branches, but with seven he may not make it, even though it be of other metals. Our Jose B. Judah says also of wood he may not make it, because thus did the Hasmoneans make it. The rabbi said to him, Is any proof to be deduced from that it consisted of metal staves overlaid with tin? When the Hasmoneans grew rich, they made one of silver, and when they grew still richer, they made one of gold, and are his attendants, which cannot be reproduced in facsimile. Allowed for behold, it has been taught, Ye shall not make with me, i.e., ye shall not make according to the likeness of my attendants who serve before me in the heights. Abbe explained Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi, the Torah only prohibited the making of the likeness of the four faces together according to this. A human face by itself should be permitted, so how can it have been taught of all faces are permissible except that of a human face? Our Judah, the son of Rab Joshua said from the discourse of R. Joshua I learned ye shall not make it with me this should be rendered as though it was ye shall not make me other but the other attendants are permitted but are the other attendants permitted behold it has been taught ye shall not make with me i.e. ye shall not make according to the likeness of my attendants who serve before me in the heights as e.g. the Ophanim seraphim holy hey and ministering angels have explained the Torah only prohibited the reproduction of the attendants who are in the highest stratum are then those in the lower stratum permitted behold it has been taught that is in heaven this is to include the sun moon stars and planets above this is to include the ministering angels that teaching alludes to serving them but if it is a matter of serving them even a tiny worm is also prohibited that is so and the thought is derived from the continuation of the verse for it has been taught or that is in the earth this is to include seas rivers mountains and Hills beneath this is to include a tiny worm, but is a mere making of them permitted. Behold, it has been taught ye shall not make with me, i.e., ye shall not make according to the likeness of my attendants who serve before me in the heights, as e.g., the sun, moon, stars, and planets. It was different with our Gamaliel because others made the chart for him, but there is a case of Rab Judah for whom others made a design on a ring, and Samuel said to him, You clever person, blind its eyes in this instance. It was a ring whose signet was cut in relief, and on account of suspicion that it might be worshipped, Samuel objected to it, for it has been taught it is forbidden to put on a signet ring which is cut in relief, but it is allowed to seal with it, and if the signet is cut in one may put the ring on, but not seal with it. Do we, however, take into account the suspicion that an object might be worshipped? Behold, in the synagogue of Shafway, the Ben Nehardia, a statue was set up, yet Samuel's father and Levi entered it and prayed there without worrying about the possibility of suspicion. It is different when there are many people together, but our Gamaliel was a single individual since he was president of the community. Many persons were always found with him, or if you wish, I can answer that his chart was in sections. As a further alternative, I can answer that when it is for the purpose of study, the matter is different as it has been taught. Thou shalt not learn to do, but thou mayest learn in order to understand and teach. Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel says, etc., which utensils are precious and which common. Rab said, The precious are those which have the figures above the water, the common those which have them under the water. Samuel said, Both these kinds are to be regarded as common, but those are precious which are upon bracelets, nose rings, and signet rings. There is a teaching in agreement with Samuel. The precious utensils are those which have figures upon bracelets, nose rings, and Signet rings the common those which have them upon kettles, pots, vessels for boiling water, sheets, and towels. Mission R. Jose says he may grind an idol to powder and scatter it to the wind or throw it into the sea. They said to him, Even so it may then become manure as it is stated, and there shall cleave not of a devoted thing to thine hand. Tomorrow it has been taught. R. Jose said to the rabbis, Has it not been stated? And I took your sin Talmud, Mas Abedazara, the calf which he had made, and burnt it with fire and stamped it, grinding it very small until it was as fine as dust. And I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount. They replied to him, Can any proof be just from this passage? Behold, it states, and he strewed it upon
Moses make Liga, the fiery serpent Liga means from what belongs to thee and a man cannot render prohibited what is not his property in the affair of the brazen serpent there was really no necessity for it to have been broken in pieces but when Hezekiah saw that the Israelites were erring after it he arose and destroyed it our Jose said to the rabbis but has it not been stated and they left their images there and David and his men took them away and what means and David took them away it is an expression for scattering as our Joseph translated the word in the passage thou shalt fan them and the wind shall carry them away and we translate it thou shalt winnow them and the wind will disperse them they replied to him can any proof be adduced from this passage behold it states and they were burned with fire and since it is not written and he burnt them and took them away conclude that took them away must be interpreted in the literal sense and not as scattered Nevertheless the two verses are contradictory it is as Arhuna pointed out for Arhuna objected it is written and David gave commandment and they were burned with fire and it is written he took them away there is no contradiction the first passage refers to the time before Itai the Gittite came the latter two after his coming for it is written and he took the crown of Malcam from off his head and the weight thereof was a talent of gold but was that permissible since any advantage is prohibited. From an idol Arnam explained Itai the Gittite came and annulled it if the weight of the crown was a talent of gold how could David have put it on Rab Judah said in the name of Rab the meaning is that it was fit to rest upon David's head Arhuse son of Arhanan said there was a lodestone in it which raised it up our Eliezer said the meaning is that there was a precious stone in it worth a talent of gold this I have had because I kept that precepts what does this intend the following? As a reward for keeping that precepts, this is a testimony on my behalf. What was its testimony? Our Joshua B. Levi said he used to wear the crown in the place of the phylacteries and it fitted him, but it would be necessary for him to put on the phylacteries. Our Samuel, son of our Isaac, said there is sufficient room on the forehead to lay two sets of phylacteries. It is written, and he brought out the king's son and put upon him the Nezer and the testimony Nezer that is the crown. What is it? Testimony Rab Judah said in the name of Rab it was a testimony to the house of David that whoever was eligible for the throne the crown fitted, but it would not fit anyone who was not eligible. It is written that Adonijah the son of Hajith exalted himself, saying, I will be king. Rab Judah said in the name of Rab he exalted himself, thinking that the crown would fit him, but it did not fit him, and he prepared his chariots and horsemen and fifty men to run before him in what did there. Superiority consisted has been taught all of them had had their spleen cut out and the solace of their feet hollowed Talmud, Mos Abedaz Arabi Mishnah Proclo son of a philosopher put a question to our Gamaliel in Akko when the latter was bathing in the bath of Aphrodite he said to him it is written in your Torah and there shall cleave not of a devoted thing to thine hand why are you bathing in the bath of Aphrodite he replied to him we may not answer questions relating to Torah in a bath when he came out he said to him I did not come into her domain she has come into mine nobody says the bath was made as an adornment for Aphrodite but he says Aphrodite was made as an adornment for the bath another reason is if you were given a large sum of money you would not enter the presence of a statue reverenced by you while you were nude or had experienced seminal emission nor would you urinate before it but the statue of Aphrodite stands by a sewer and all people urinate before IT in the Torah IT is only stated their gods i.e. what is treated as a deity is prohibited what is not treated as a deity is permitted tomorrow but how did our Gamaliel act in this matter for Rabbi Barhana has said in the name of Aryohanan it is permitted to ponder over matters of Torah in any place except the bath and privy should you reply that he spoke to him in the vernacular behold Abbe has said it is permitted to discuss secular subjects in the holy tongue but it is forbidden to discuss holy subjects in the vernacular Aitan had taught when he came out he replied to him we may not answer questions relating to Torah in the bath Arhamabi Joseph said in the name of Arashai our Gamaliel made a fallacious reply to that general proclose but I maintain that it was not fallacious what was the fallacy because he told him the statue stands by a sewer and all people urinate before IT and if people do urinate before it what of it for Rabbi has said Peer proves the contrary because people evacuate in its presence every day but it is not annulled as a consequence but I maintain that our Gamaliel's answer was not fallacious because in the case of Peer such was the mode of its worship but with Aphrodite it was not the mode of her worship Abbe said it can be shown that the reply was fallacious from the fact that he told him I did not come into her domain she has come into mine and if he had come into her domain what of it for we learn if an idol has a bath house or garden we may use either so long as it is not to the advantage of idolatry but we may not use either if it is to its advantage but I maintain that our Gamaliel's answer was not fallacious because no token of recognition by our Gamaliel was as valued as a token of recognition by other men our Shai Mai said it can be shown that the reply was fallacious from the fact that he told him the statue stands by a sewer and all people urinate before IT and if people do urinate before it what of it for we learn if he spat before it urinated before it dragged it in the dust or hurled excrement and it behold it is not annulled but I maintain that his answer was not fallacious there in the mission just cited the man may have been momentarily incensed against the idol and subsequently made his peace with it but here in the case of the Aphrodite image it is constantly treated in this contemptuous manner Rabbi Biola said it can be shown that the reply was fallacious from the fact that he told him nobody says the bath was made as an adornment for Aphrodite but Aphrodite was made as an ornament for the bath and if one said that the bath was made as an adornment for Aphrodite what of it for it has been taught if one says this house is for an idol this cup is for an idol he has said nothing because there can be no dedication to an idol but I maintain that his answer was not fallacious granted that the use of the bath is not actually forbidden it is nevertheless Intended as an ornament of the idol and is consequently prohibited. Talmud, Mos Abed Azara, Mishnah, if idolaters worship mountains and hills, these are permitted, but what is upon them is prohibited, as it is said, Thou shalt not covet the silver or the gold that is on them. Our Jose the Galilean says, It is stated, Their gods upon the high mountains, not their mountains which are their gods, and their gods upon the hills, not their hills which are their gods, but why is an Asherah prohibited? Because there was manual labor connected with it, and whatever has manual labor connected with it is prohibited. Our Akiba said, Let me expound and decide the interpretation before you, wherever you find a high mountain or elevated hill or green tree, know that an idolatrous object is there tomorrow. But our Jose the Galilean holds the same opinion as the first teacher in the Mishnah Rami Bihama said in the name of our Simeon Belakish, the issue between them is whether the covering on a mountain is identical with the mountain the first tana holds that the covering on a mountain is not identical with the mountain and is prohibited whereas our Jose the Galilean holds that the covering on a mountain is identical with the mountain and is permitted our she's hate said all agree that the covering on a mountain is not identical with the mountain Talmud, Mos Abed is Arabi and here they differ with regard to a tree which had been planted and was subsequently worshipped the first tana holds that a tree which had been planted and was subsequently worshipped is permitted whereas our Jose the Galilean holds that such a tree is prohibited from where is it deduced that our Jose is of this opinion from what he stated in the latter part of the mission but why is an Asherah prohibited because there was manual labor connected with it and whatever has manual labor connected with it is prohibited and what does the phrase whatever has manual labor connected with it mean to include it surely Includes the case of a tree which had been planted and was subsequently worshipped. Our Jose son of Arjuda likewise holds that a tree which had been planted and was subsequently worshipped is prohibited for it has been taught. Our Jose son of Arjuda says since it is stated their gods upon the high mountains and not the mountains which are their gods, their gods upon the hills and not the hills which are their gods, I might have similarly understood their gods under every green tree and not the green tree itself which is their god. Therefore, there is a text to state and burnt their asherim with fire. Why then is there need for the phrase under every green tree? This is required in accordance with the teaching of our Akiba. For our Akiba said, Let me expound and decide the interpretation before you wherever you find a high mountain or elevated hill or green tree. Know that an idolatrous object is there. What do the rabbis make of and burn their asherim with fire? It is required to cover the Case of a tree which had been planted in the first instance for idolatry and does not our Jose son of Arjuda likewise require the same text for this rule indeed so whence and does he derive his teaching that a
be left they must be burnt. Arhuna said the meaning is pursue the enemy after breaking the altars and pillars and then burn them immediately afterwards. Whence does our Jose son of Arjuna derive this rule? He derives it from Yeshal surely destroy destroy by breaking them and after conquering the land Yeshal destroy the Asherim by burning them. How do the rabbis explain this phrase? They require it for the rule that when one destroys an idol he must eradicate every trace of it. Whence does our Jose son of Arjuna derive the rule that he must eradicate every trace of it? He derives it from and Yeshal destroy their name out of that place. And how do the rabbis explain that phrase that the idol must be renamed for it has been taught? Our Eliezer says whence is it that when one destroys an idol he must eradicate every trace of it? There is a text to state and Yeshal destroy their name Talmud. Mas Abedazara said to him but has it not been already stated yet? Shall surely destroy if so why is there a text to state and ye shall destroy their name out of that place its purpose is to teach that an idol must be renamed it is possible to think it may be renamed for praise can it enter your mind that the renaming is for praise but it is possible to think that the renaming may be neither for praise nor contempt therefore there is a text to state thou shalt utterly detest it and thou shalt utterly abhor it how is it then if the heathens called it Beth Dalia house of revelation call it Beth Carrot house of concealment if they called it and called the all seeing I call it and cause the eye of the thorn to tanner recited as follows in the presence of our she's hated idolaters worship mountains and hills these latter are permissible but the worshippers should be destroyed with the sword if they worship plants and herbage these latter are prohibited but the worshippers should be destroyed with the sword our she's hate said to him who Tells you that it must be our Jose son of Arjuna who declared a tree which had been planted and was subsequently worshipped is prohibited, but let our Shishate apply the statement reported by the Tanna to a tree which had been planted for idolatry at the outset and make it agree with the view of the rabbis. This cannot enter your mind because it states the analogy of a mountain as with a mountain it was not planted for idolatry at the outset, so with this also it was not planted for idolatry. At the outset it has been stated if boulders become detached from a mountain, the sons of our high and our Yohan and take different views. One says that they are prohibited and the other that they are permitted. What is the reason of him who says they are permitted? The boulders are like the mountain, and as the mountain is something with which no manual labor has been connected and is permitted, so these likewise have had no manual labor connected with them and are permitted, but it may be argued. That a mountain is immovable, the case of an animal will prove the contrary here again. It may be argued that an animal is only permitted because it is an animate being. The case of a mountain proves the contrary, therefore the conclusion returns because the two examples are dissimilar, but the point common to them both is that with neither has there been any manual labor and each is permitted, consequently everything is permitted with which there has been no manual labor, but it may be argued that the point common to them both is that they have not changed from their natural form well then derive that a boulder is permitted by an analogy drawn between an animal which has become blemished and a mountain, or it may be drawn also between an unblemished animal and a withered tree as for him who prohibits the boulders, it is because scripture declares thou shalt utterly detest it and that shall utterly abhor it, although it is possible to reason to the conclusion that they are permitted yet do not draw that conclusion it can be proved that it is the sons of our high who permit their use because Hezekiah asked how is it if a man set up an egg to worship it this question must be understood in the sense that the man had the intention of worshipping it and did worship it and the point of Hezekiah's query is whether the setting up of the egg is to be considered an action or not consequently his opinion must be that if the man had not set it up it is not prohibited to be used conclude therefore that it was the sons of our high who permitted the use of the boulders no I can always maintain that it was the sons of our high who prohibited their use because if the man worshipped the egg even though he had not set it up it would be prohibited according to their view and the circumstance with which we are dealing here is where he set up an egg to worship but did not worship it now according to whom is the question of its permissibility to be decided if According to him who says that the idolatrous object of an Israelite is prohibited forthwith then it is prohibited if according to him who says that such an object is not prohibited until it has been actually worshipped behold the man has not worshipped it no but it is necessary to suppose the following case of he e.g. set up an egg to worship but did not do so and an idolater came and worshipped it is it permitted regard being had to what Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel even Israelite set up a brick to worship but did not do so and an idolater came and worshipped it it is prohibited and Hezekiah asked us the question does he specify a brick because its erection is conspicuous but the law is otherwise with an egg or perhaps there is no difference the question remains unanswered Rami Biham asked if a man worshipped a mountain may its stones be used to build an altar to God Talmud Mas Abed Azarabi does the law prohibiting the use in the divine service of objects which have been worshipped apply to things fixed in the ground or does it not and if you decide that this law does apply to things fixed in the ground are objects necessary for the preparation of a sacrifice analogous to the sacrifice or not Rabbi said it is an a fortiori conclusion if the hire of a harlot is usable for secular purposes when it is an object which is not fixed in the ground but is prohibited in the divine service when it is an object fixed in the ground as it is written thou shalt not bring the hire of a harlot or the wages of a dog consequently it is immaterial with the divine service whether it is not fixed in the ground or is fixed how much more must a worshipped object whose use for secular purposes is prohibited when it is not fixed be prohibited in the divine service when it is fixed Arhuna the son of our Joshua said to Rabbi the reverse conclusion may be deduced thus if a worshipped object may not be used for secular purposes when unfixed but is Permitted in the divine service when fixed as it is said their gods upon the high mountains not the mountains which are their gods consequently it is immaterial whether it is for secular use or for the divine service how much more must the hire of a harlot which is usable for secular purposes when it is unfixed be permissible in the divine service when it is fixed and if you would argue that this conclusion is inadmissible because of the words into the house of the Lord thy God they are required in accordance with this teaching into the house of the Lord thy God excludes a red heifer which does not enter the sanctuary such as the statement of our Eliezer but the sages say their purpose is to include plates of beaten gold robber reply to our Hunah I reason from the lenient to the strict view and you reason from the strict to the lenient view and the rule is that where it is possible to reason to both conclusions we argue to the strict view our Papa said to Rabba, but is it a fact? That where it is possible to reason to both conclusions we never argue to the lenient view behold there is the example of the sprinkling in connection with the Passover on which our Eliezer and our Akiva differ for our Eliezer holds a strict view and makes a man liable to bring the Paschal Lamb and our Akiva holds a lenient view and absolves him and still our Akiva argues for the lenient conclusion for we have learned our Akiva said rather conclude the reverse if the sprinkling which is only forbidden on the Sabbath on account of Shabbat does not supersede the Sabbath how much more must the act of slaughtering the Paschal Lamb which is a form of work prohibited by the Torah not supersede the Sabbath no in that matter our Eliezer had himself taught him but had forgotten his own teaching so our Akiva came and reminded him of it that is why our Akiva said to him my master do not make me an atonement in the time of judgment thus have I received the teaching from you sprinkling is Prohibited on account of Shabbat and it does not supersede the Sabbath. Rami Biham asked how is it if a man had worshipped standing corn in a field may it be subsequently used for meal offerings does a change in form make permissible what had been used for idolatry's worship or does it not have that effect Marzitra son of Arnam and said come and here in cases where animals are prohibited from being offered upon the altar their young are permissible for that purpose and in this connection. It was taught that our Eliezer forbids the young as offerings but was it not stated on that subject Arnam and said in the name of Rabbi Biabab the difference of opinion is over the circumstance where the animals had been unnaturally used and had then conceived Talmud, Mas Abedazara but when they had conceived and then been unnaturally used all agree that the young are forbidden as offerings similarly here with the standing corn it is analogous to the circumstance where the animals Conceived and had then been unnaturally used, others declare that Marzitra himself quoted the following statement of Arnam and the difference of opinion is over the circumstance where the animals had been unnaturally used and then conceived, but when they had conceived and then been unnaturally used, all agree that the young are forbidden as offering similarly here with the standing corn. It is analogous to the circumstance where the animals
which had been annulled does a disability continue in respect of commandments or not you can solve this problem from what we have learned if one covered it and it became uncovered he is free from the obligation to cover it again but if the wind covered it he is obliged to cover it himself and Rabbi B. Barhanna said in the name of our Yohanan this teaching only applies when the wind again uncovered it but if the wind did not again uncover it he is free from the obligation to cover it and we raise the question against this point of view if the wind again uncovered it what of it since the blood has been obliterated by the covering it is obliterated once for all thereupon our papa said this proves that a disability does not continue in respect of commandments but there is a question in connection with this very statement of our papa is it quite clear to our papa that disability does not continue in respect of commandments either to take a lenient or strict view or perhaps he is Doubtful and we apply accordingly this rule to the strict view only and not to the lenient the question remains unanswered our papa asked how is it if a man worshipped an animal may its will be used for blue thread blue thread for what purpose if it is for the blue material of the priest's garments that is dealt with in the question of Rami Bihama if it is for the blue thread of the tzitzis that is dealt with in the question of our simian bilakish quite so there was no need for our papa to ask about this but the reason why he raised the question is because there are other similar matters about which he asked his may its will be used for blue thread its horns for trumpets the bones of its legs for flutes its intestines for harp strings according to him who says that the basis of temple dash music is in the instrument the question does not arise because these are certainly prohibited but the question does arise according to him who says that the basis of temple dash music is in the mouth is then the purpose of the instrument only to sweeten the sound and we may introduce them when made of these materials or perhaps even then it is prohibited the question remains unanswered Rabbi asked how is it if a man worshipped a fountain may its water be used for the drink offerings what is the point of his question is it whether the man worshipped his reflection in the water or perhaps he worshipped the water itself he could then have put the same question about a bowl of water and it's used for secular purposes certainly it is assumed that he worshipped the water and this is the point of his question did he worship the water which was in front of him and that water has flowed away or did he worship the whole stream of water but can water which has been worshipped be prohibited at all for behold our Yohanan said in the name of our Simeon Bejahos that water which is public property is not prohibited if an individual worshipped it no it was necessary to ask the question where it is water which wells up front the earth mission if an Israelite has a house adjoining an idolatrous shrine and it collapsed he is forbidden to rebuild it how should he act he withdraws a distance of four cubits into his own ground and there builds if the wall belong both to him and the shrine it is judged Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi as being half and half its stones timber and rubbish defile like a creeping thing as it is said thou shalt utterly detest it or Akiba says it defile. Like in it as it is said thou shalt cast them away as an unclean thing thou shalt say unto it get thee hence as in it a defile an object by carrying it so also an idolatrous object defile by its being carried tomorrow but by acting as directed in the Mishnah he enlarges the space for the shrine our Hanan of Surah said he should use the four cubits for constructing a privy but it is necessary to safeguard modesty he should make a privy for use at night but behold the master has said who is modesty who relieves himself at night in the same place where he relieves himself by day and although we explain that in that statement the phrase in the same place is to be understood as in the same manner still it is necessary to safeguard modesty he should then make a privy for children or let him fence in the space with thorns and shrubs Mishnah there are three types of shrines a shrine originally built for idolatrous worship behold this is prohibited if a man plastered and tiled an ordinary house for idolatry and renovated it one may remove the renovations if he had only brought an idol into it and taken it out again the house is permitted Gemara Rab said if one worship the house he has rendered it prohibited conclude then that he holds that an object which is not fixed in the ground and subsequently becomes fixed is like an unfixed object but the Mishnah deals with a shrine built originally for idolatry the prohibition applies to a shrine built originally for idolatry although nobody has yet worshipped in it and to one in which somebody worshipped although he had not built it if that be so the three types mentioned in the Mishnah should be for since the reference is to the subject of an element the erection of a shrine and worshipping there are considered one and the same thing Mishnah there are three kinds of idolatrous stones a stone which a man hewed originally to serve as a pedestal for an idol behold this is prohibited if a man Merely plastered and stuccoed a stone for idolatry one may remove the plaster and stucco and it is then permitted if he set an idol upon it and took it off behold the stone I is permitted Gemara our animi said it is only prohibited if he plastered and stuccoed in the stone itself but surely it is as we learn analogous to a house and in the case of a house the plastering was not inserted into the material and yet it is prohibited also with the house there is that kind of plastering in the space between the bricks since however the mission does not mention this may we not be dealing with the circumstance where he plastered a house not for idolatry and then replastered it for idolatry therefore if RMI's teaching is quoted it must be with reference to an element and although the man plastered and stuccoed in the stone itself if he removes the renovation it is all right for what you might have said was that since he plastered and stuccoed in the material of the stone it is analogous to a stone which had been originally hewn for idolatry and the whole of it is prohibited he consequently informs us that it is not so Talmud, Mas Abed Azara Mishnah there are three kinds of Asherah a tree which has originally been planted for idolatry behold this is prohibited if he locked and trimmed a tree for idolatry and it sprouted afresh he removes the new growth if he only set an idol under it and took it away behold the tree is permitted tomorrow those of it. School of Arjane said when the Mishnah declares that he removes the new growth and then the tree is permitted it applies only when he trailed the branch and grafted it on the trunk of the tree but surely we learned in the Mishnah if he merely locked and trimmed therefore if the statement of the school of Arjane is quoted it must be with reference to an element visit although he trained the branch and grafted it on the trunk of the tree if he removes the new growth on the grafting it is. All right for what you might have said was that since he trained the branch and grafted it on the trunk of the tree it is like a tree which had been originally planted for idolatry and the whole of it is prohibited consequently we are informed that it is not so Samuel said if a man worshipped the tree the branches which subsequently grow are also prohibited our Eliezer quoted against him if he merely locked and trimmed a tree for idolatry and it sprouted afresh he removes the new growth. Therefore if he locked and trimmed it the new growth is prohibited otherwise it is not Samuel could reply whose is the teaching of the Mishnah it is the rabbis whereas Samuel's view agrees with that of our Jose B. Judah who said if a tree was planted and subsequently worshipped it is prohibited our Ashi objected to this explanation how do we know that our Jose B. Judah and the rabbis differ on the question of the new growth perhaps they all agree that it is prohibited and it is on the question of the permissibility of the trunk itself that they are at variance for our Jose B. Judah holds that the trunk of the tree which has been worshipped is likewise prohibited since it is stated and burned their Asherim with fire and the rabbis hold that the trunk of the tree is permitted since it is stated and hew down their Asherim which tree has its hewn part prohibited while the trunk is permitted answer that it is a tree which had been planted and was subsequently worshipped should you retort to this. But we have not explained the verses in this way above I could reply reverse the interpretation of the passages cited respectively by the rabbis and our Jose B. Judah this is an impossible suggestion because if that were so who taught the passage in the Mishnah if he locked and trimmed it cannot be either the rabbis or our Jose B. Judah because according to the rabbis even if he did not lock and trim the tree the new growth would still be prohibited and according to our Jose B. Judah even it. Trunk of the tree is prohibited. No, if you wish, I can say that the mission agrees with either the rabbis or our Jose B. Judah. I can say that it agrees with our Jose B. Judah because he maintained that the trunk is prohibited when the tree has not been locked and trimmed. But if the man locked and trimmed it, then he revealed that his intention was to worship the new growth and not the trunk. I can likewise say that it agrees with the rabbis. And as to the phrase, if he locked and trimmed it, is necessary to mention it since I might have otherwise imagined that for the reason that he does this to the tree itself, the trunk is also prohibited. Consequently, we are informed that the prohibition extends only to the new growth mission. What is an Asherah? Any tree beneath which there is an idol. Our Simeon says any tree which is worshipped. It happened at Sidon that
Decision is in agreement with Samuel Talmud, Mas Abed Azara Bimish one may not sit in its shadow but if he sat he is undefiled nor may he pass beneath it and if he pass he is defiled if it encroaches upon the public road and he pass beneath he is undefiled Gemara the Mishnah states one may not sit in its shadow this is obvious Rabbi Bibar Hanna said in the name of Aryuhan and there is no necessity to mention it but for the case of the shadow of its shadow is it to be inferred. That if he sat in the shadow corresponding to the height of the tree he is defiled no because even if he sat in the shadow corresponding to the height of the tree he is also undefiled yet we are informed that one may not sit even in the shadow of its shadow there are some who apply this teaching to the continuation but if he sat he is undefiled this is obvious Rabbi Bibar Hanna said in the name of Aryuhan and there is no necessity to mention it but for the case of the shadow corresponding to the height of the tree is it to be inferred that even of an issue he may sit in the shadow of its shadow no but we are informed that even if he sat in the shadow corresponding to the height of the tree he is undefiled nor may he pass beneath it and if he pass he is defiled what is the reason because it is impossible that there should be no remains of idolatry's offerings there whose teaching is this it is that of Arjuna Bibathera for it has been taught Arjuna Bibathera says whence is it that an idolatry's offering communicates defilement within a space which is covered over because it is said they joined themselves also unto Baal Pier and ate the sacrifices of the dead as a dead body communicates defilement in a space which is covered over so an idolatry's offering communicates defilement in a space which is covered over if it encroaches upon the public road and he passed beneath it he is undefiled the question was asked is the word to be read past or passes are Isaac B. Eliezer said in the name of Hezekiah it should be passes but Aryohan and said the reading is if he passed and yet there is no difference of opinion between them one has in mind if there is another road and the other if there is not another road Arshis hate said to his attendant when you reach there hurry me past how is this to be understood if there was no other road why need he say hurry me past since it is permitted if however there was another road when he said hurry me past was that permissible certainly there was no other road but with an eminent man it is different Mishnah they may sow vegetables beneath it in winter but not in summer and let us neither in summer nor winter our Jose says nor may vegetables be planted in winter because the foliage falls upon them and becomes manure for them Gemara is this to say that our Jose holds that a product of combined causes is prohibited and the rabbis hold that a product of combined causes is permitted but we heard the reverse in Connection with them, for we have learned our Jose says he may grind an idol to powder and scatter it to the wind or throw it into the sea. They said to him, Even so, it may then become manure as it is stated, and there shall cleave not of a devoted thing to thine hand. Here we have the rabbis contradicting themselves, and our Jose contradicting himself. It is quite right, there is no contradiction in the teaching of our Jose in the case just cited, since the man proceeds to destroy the idol. Our Jose permits the use of the dust as manure, but in the case dealt with in our mission, where he does not proceed to destroy the idol, the dust is prohibited as manure, but the rabbis contradict themselves, reverse the statements in our mission, or if you wish, I can say that there is no need to reverse them. The opinion of our Jose is as we explained, and that of the rabbis is as our Mari, the son of our Kahana, said, What makes the high valuable decreases the value of the meat? Similarly, here the benefit. Gain through the foliage is lost by reason of the shade does however our Jose hold that a product of combined causes is prohibited behold we have learned our Jose says we may plant a young shoot which is orla but not a nut which is orla because it is fruit and Rab Judah said in the name of Rab our Jose admits that if one planted a nut which is orla or trained and grafted a young shoot which is orla on an old tree the fruit it grows is permitted it has been similarly taught our Jose admits. Talmud, Mas Abed that if he planted a nut which is orla or trained and grafted a young orla shoot on an old tree the fruit it grows is permitted and should you say that our Jose makes a distinction in respect of combined causes between idolatry and other prohibitions does he really make this differentiation has it not been taught if a field has been manured with the manure derived from an idolatry source or a cow has been fattened on beans derived from an idolatry source. One tanna decides that the field may be sown and the cow slaughtered while another decides that the field must lie fallow and the cow grow lean is it not then that the former decision is that of our Jose and the latter that of the rabbis no the former decision is that of our Eliezer and the latter that of the rabbis where have we a difference between our Eliezer and the rabbis on this question can I say it is the difference between them in the matter of leaven for we have learned if common leaven and leaven of heat offering fell into dough and in each there was an insufficient quantity to cause fermentation but added together they caused fermentation our Eliezer says I decide according to which leaven entered the dough last but the sages say whether the disqualifying matter fell in first or last the dough is not prohibited unless it is of a sufficient quantity by itself to cause fermentation and have they explained the teaching of our Eliezer only applies when he first removed it disqualifying matter but if he did not first remove the disqualifying matter the dough is prohibited but once do we know that our Eliezer's meaning is that offered by a vapor perhaps his meaning is to be derived from the words I decide according to which leaven entered the dough last i.e. if it ended with what is forbidden then the dough is forbidden and if it ended with what is permitted then the dough is permitted whether he first removed the disqualifying matter or not rather is it the difference between our Eliezer and the rabbis on the question of the wood of an asherah for we learn if one took pieces of wood from it they are forbidden to be used if he heated a new oven with them it must be taken to pieces if he kindled an old oven with them it must be allowed to cool if he baked bread in an oven so heated it is forbidden to be used and if the loaf became mixed with other loaves they are all prohibited our Eliezer says let him cast the advantage he derives into the salt sea the sages said to him there is no redemption with an idol now which rabbis differ from our Eliezer if I say it is the rabbis whose opinion has been quoted on the subject of the pieces of wood they take the stricter view therefore it must be the rabbis whose opinion has been quoted on the subject of the leaven but then even though you understood the rabbis to take the lenient view in connection with leaven does it follow that they take the lenient view in connection with idolatry surely then one opinion is our Jose's and the other is the rabbis and our Jose is merely discussing the statement of the rabbis saying to them according to my opinion the product of combined causes is permitted but according to you who maintain that the product of combined causes is prohibited at least admit to me that also the sowing of vegetables in winter is prohibited but the rabbis make reply as our Mari son of our Kahana stated Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel the Halacha. Agrees with our Jose there was a garden manured with the manure obtained from an idolatry source our Amram sent to our Joseph to know how to act with the fruits he replied to him thus said Rab Judah in the name of Samuel the Halacha agrees with our Jose Mishnah Talmud, Mas Abed Azara if one took pieces of wood from it they are forbidden to be used if he heated a new oven with them it must be broken to pieces if he heated an old oven with them it must be allowed to cool if he baked bread. In an oven so heated it is forbidden to be used and if the loaf became mixed with other loaves they are all prohibited our Eliezer says let him cast the advantage he derives into the salt sea the sages said to him there is no redemption with an idol if one took a piece of wood from it to use as a shuttle it is forbidden to be used if he wove a garment with it it is forbidden to be used if the garment became mixed with others and these with others they are all forbidden to be used are. Eliezer says let him cast the advantage he derives into the salt sea the sages said to him there is no redemption with an idol tomorrow it was necessary to mention both illustrations baking and weaving because if he had informed us of only the first it might have been supposed that our Eliezer makes his remark because at the time when the loaf is finished baking the wood which is the prohibited material has been consumed but in the case of the shuttle since it remains discernible as a forbidden object after the weaving is finished conclude that he agrees with the rabbis if on the other hand he had only informed us of the illustration of the shuttle it might have been supposed that the rabbis make their remark in connection with it alone but in the case of a loaf conclude that they agree with our Eliezer therefore both are necessary our highest son of Rabbi Naman he said in the name of our Histah I said that the Halacha agrees with our Eliezer others declare that our Histah Said Abba son of Arhista informed me that Zeir said the Halacha agrees with our Eliezer Arhabi Ahabba said they only differ in the matter of the loaf but not in the matter of a cask of wine but Arhista said even a cask of wine is
But thus he means to say an idol need not be annulled except when it is in its natural form is this to say that they differ on this point one holds that idolaters worship fragments of idols and the other holds that they do not worship fragments no they all agree that idolaters worship fragments and here they differ with respect to the fragments of the fragments one holds that the fragments of the fragments are prohibited and the other holds that they are permitted or if you wish I can say that they all agree that the fragments of the fragments are permitted and here they differ with respect to an idol which is formed in sections and in connection with an ordinary man who is able to restore it one holds that since an ordinary man is able to restore it it is not annulled while the other holds that an idol can only be annulled when it is in its natural form that is the form it normally assumes so in this instance it is not in its natural form and there is no need to annul it ch Pterib Mishnah Arish Mail says if three stones are lying side by side next to a Mercurius they are prohibited if there are two they are permitted the sages however say if the stones are seen to be connected with it they are prohibited but if they do not appear to be connected with it they are permitted Gamara the opinion of the rabbis is clear they maintain that idolaters worship the fragments of their idol so that when the stones are seen to be connected with it the assumption is that they fell from it and are prohibited but if they do not appear to be connected with it they are permitted what however does Arish Mail maintain if he holds that idolaters worship the fragments then even two stones should be prohibited and if he holds that they do not worship the fragments then even three stones should not be prohibited our Isaac B. Joseph said in the name of our Yohan and when it is certain that they drop from the idol all agree that they are prohibited and even according to him who says that they do not worship fragments and so these may be used this only applies to an idol which has not that form whereas here with the Mercurius the stones are from the outset detached and that is its normal form when therefore our Ishmael and the rabbis differ it must be in connection with stones which cannot be determined Talmud, Mas Abed Azara with regard to stones which are near we may likewise assume that they fell from the idol and all agree that they are prohibited the point of variance between them must therefore be with respect to stones which are at a distance but the Mishnah uses the phrase next to a Mercurius what means next to within four cubits of its side our Ishmael holds that they make a small Mercurius by the side of a large Mercurius if then there are three stones which together resemble a Mercurius they are prohibited and if there are two they are permitted the rabbis on the other hand hold that they do not make a small Mercurius by the side of a large Mercurius consequently it is immaterial whether there are three or two stones if they are seen to be connected with it they are prohibited otherwise they are permitted the master said above when it is certain that they drop from the idol all agree that they are prohibited against the statement I cite the following when stones drop from a Mercurius if they are seen to be connected with it they are prohibited and if they do not appear to be connected with it they are permitted and our Ishmael says three stones are prohibited but two are permitted Rabbi explained do not read in this extract drop but were found but is our Ishmael's opinion that if they are within four cubits two stones are permitted behold it has been taught our Ishmael says if two stones were found within the idol's reach they are prohibited and three are prohibited even at a greater distance Rabbi explained there is no contradiction here they were within one reach and they're within two Reaches how is this to be understood there is a mound between the stones and the Mercurius when they are lying in this manner are they to be considered a Mercurius for behold it has been taught the following are the stones of the Beth one year a second next to it and a third on the top of them Rabbi explained this teaching refers to the basis of a Mercurius the palace of King Janius was destroyed idolaters came and set up a Mercurius there subsequently other idolaters came who did not worship Mercurius and removed the stones with which they paved the roads and streets some rabbis abstained from walking in them while others did not our Yohan and exclaimed the son of the holy walks in them so shall we abstain who was the son of the holy Armenaham son of Arsimai and why did they call him the son of the holy because he would not gaze even at the image on Azuz what was the reason of him who abstained from walking in these streets he agreed with what Argyll said in it. Name of our high B. Joseph whence is it that an idolatrous offering can never be annulled as it is stated they joined themselves also unto Baal Pier and ate the sacrifices of the dead as a dead body can never be annulled. Similarly an idolatrous offering can never be annulled as for him who did not abstain he said we require such an offering to resemble what was offered within the temple and we have not such here. Our Joseph B. Abba said Rabbi B. Jeremiah once visited our town when he came he brought with him this teaching if an idolater took stones from a Mercurius and paved roads and streets with them Talmud, Mos Abed Azarabi they are permitted if an Israelite took stones from a Mercurius and paved roads and streets with them they are prohibited and he added that there was no scholar or scholar's son who could elucidate this teaching. Our she's hate said I am neither a scholar nor a scholar's son yet I can elucidate it. What is the difficulty the statement of our to this I Make the reply given above we require such an offering to resemble what was offered within the temple and we have not such here our Joseph B. Abba said Rabbi B. Jeremiah once visited our town when he came he brought with him this teaching we may remove worms from a tree and patch the bark with dung during the sabbatical year but we may not perform these operations during the non-holy days of a festival on both these occasions we may not prune but we may smear oil on the place of pruning either during the non-holy days of a festival or during the sabbatical year and he added that there was no scholar or scholar's son who could elucidate this teaching Rabbi said I am neither a scholar nor a scholar's son yet I can elucidate it what is the difficulty in it shall I say that the difficulty lies in the operations mentioned in connection with the non-holy days of a festival and the sabbatical year is why is the latter occasion different that the work is permitted from it Former occasion when it is prohibited is then the sabbatical year analogous to the non-holy days of a festival since the divine law forbade labor then but permitted occupation whereas on the non-holy days of a festival even occupation is also prohibited perhaps the difficulty is in connection with patching the bark and smearing the place of pruning what is the distinction that the former is permitted and the latter prohibited but is patching the bark the purpose of which is the preservation of the tree and is permitted analogous to smearing the place of pruning the purpose of which is to strengthen the tree and is prohibited perhaps the difficulty is in the contradiction about patching the bark because the teaching was we may remove worms from a tree and patch the bark with dung during the sabbatical year and against this I quote we may patch the bark of plants and wrap them cover them with powder make supports for them and water them up to the new year up to the new Year this is permissible but not in the sabbatical year itself perhaps the contradiction might be solved according to the view of our Akbabama who said there are two kinds of hoeing olive trees one to strengthen the tree and this is prohibited in the sabbatical year and the other to close up cracks and this is permitted similarly here there are two kinds of patching one is to preserve the tree and is permitted and the other to strengthen the tree and is prohibited perhaps the difficulty is in the contradiction about smearing the place of pruning because the teaching was we may smear oil on the place of pruning either during the non-holy days of a festival or during the sabbatical year and against this I quote we may smear fix and perforate them to fatten them with oil up to the new year up to the new year this is permissible but not in the sabbatical year itself but are the two cases analogous in the former the purpose is to preserve the tree and is permitted whereas in the latter it is to fatten the fruit and is prohibited. Arsama the son of Arashi said to Rabbi Rabbi B. Jeremiah's difficulty is in connection with smearing the place of pruning on the non-holy days of a festival and patching the bark on that occasion since the purpose of both is to preserve the tree why the distinction that one is permitted and the other prohibited that is why Rabbi B. Jeremiah remarked there was no scholar or scholar's son who could elucidate it. Rabbi Judah said in the name of Rabbi if an idol is worshipped by tapping before it with a stick and an Israelite broke a stick in its presence he is liable if he threw a stick in front of it he is free of penalty. Abbe said to Rabbi why is it different when he broke the stick because it resembles the slaughter of an animal in the temple than the act of throwing a stick resembles the right of sprinkling the blood in the temple he replied we require a sprinkling which is broken up and that we have not here against. This explanation of Rabbah is quoted if he offered to the idol excrement or poured out before it a vessel of urine Talmud, Mas Abed Azara he is liable it is clear why he is liable if he poured out a vessel of urine because it is a kind of sprinkling which is broken up but where is there a sprinkling which is broken up with excrement with moist excrement is it to be said that Rab's statement is a matter of dispute between Tanaim if one slaughtered a locust to an idol Arjuna holds him
This reply is satisfactory for him who maintains that the idol of an idolater is prohibited forthwith, but according to him who maintains that the idol is not prohibited until it has been worshipped, the stone should be permitted since it has not been worshipped. Arnaman answered Rabbah, each stone becomes an idolatrous object in itself and also an offering to the one next to it. Rabbah asked if this is so, the last stone at least should be permitted. Arnaman retorted, if you know which is the last stone, go and remove it. Or as she said, each stone becomes an offering in itself and an offering to the one next to it. We learn if he found on top of a mercury whose garment or coins or utensils, behold, these are permitted, but if he found great clusters, wreaths of corn, gifts of wine oil, or fine flour, or anything resembling what is offered upon the altar, it is prohibited. This is all right with gifts of wine oil and fine flour since they have a resemblance to what is within it. Temple and also to the sprinkling which is broken up, but great clusters and wreaths of corn have no resemblance to what is within the temple and to sprinkling which is broken up. Rabba said in the name of Allah the prohibition applies when e.g. the man cut them at the outset for an idolatrous purpose. Rabba said in the name of our Yohan and whence is it that he who sacrifices a blemished animal to an idol is free of liability as it is stated he that sacrificeth unto any god save unto the Lord. Alone shall be utterly destroyed. The Torah only prohibits what resembles that which is within the temple. Rabba objected what sort of blemish has Rabba in mind shall I say it is a cataract in the eye since however such an animal was qualified to be offered by the sons of Noah to God upon their altars how much more so to an idol rather must he be thinking of a blemish like being defective in a limb and it is in accord with our Eliezer who said whence is it that an animal defective in a limb is prohibited as an offering to the sons of Noah as it is stated and of every living thing of all flesh to of every sort the Torah declares bring an animal which has all its limbs living but the phrase of every living thing is required to indicate the exclusion of an animal which is trefah this is derived from the phrase to keep them alive with thee this reply is satisfactory for him who maintains that an animal which is trefah cannot bring forth young but for him who maintains that it can. What is there to say scripture states with the i.e. animals like yourself perhaps however Noah was himself unsound of limit is written concerning him that he was perfect perhaps that means perfect in his ways it is written concerning him that he was righteous perhaps the meaning is perfect in his ways and righteous in his actions it is impossible to say that Noah himself was unsound of limb for if it entered your mind that he was then the all merciful said to him animals like yourself which are defective take into the ark and exclude those which are unblemished since now the thought that the animals were not defective is derived from with thee what is the purpose of to keep them alive if the Torah had only written with thee I might have imagined that the reason was merely to provide him with company and the animals could include the old and even the castrated therefore we are informed to keep them alive our Eliezer said whence is it that if one slaughters an animal to Mercury he is liable as it is stated and they shall no more sacrifice their sacrifices unto the satyrs since this text cannot apply to the subject of worshipping idols in their regular way for it is written how do these nations serve their gods apply it to the subject of worshipping idols in a way which is not regular to them but is the verse and they shall no more sacrifice etc to be used for this purpose surely it is required in accordance with the following teaching Talmud, Moss. Abed is Arabi up to here it speaks of sacrificial animals which had been dedicated as offerings during the time that improvised altars were prohibited and were offered during the time such altars were prohibited because the penalty is actually stated viz and hath not brought it unto the door of the tent of meeting etc. Here we learn the penalty but whence is the prohibition there is a text to state take heed to thyself lest thou offer thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest and it is. As Arabin said in the name of Arlay wherever it is stated take heed or lest or do not it denotes a negative command from and they shall no more sacrifice onwards it speaks of sacrificial animals which had been dedicated as offerings during the time that improvised altars were permitted and were offered during the time such altars were permitted as it is stated to the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices which they sacrifice in the open field viz which I previously permitted you to offer upon improvised altars in the open field this teaches that whoever sacrifices upon an improvised altar at a time when such is prohibited scripture ascribes it to him as though he sacrifices in the open field and bring them unto the lord this is a positive command but once is the negative precept in this connection there is a text to state and they shall no more sacrifice their sacrifices it is possible to think that the penalty for transgressing the law about sacrificing to satyrs is excision therefore there is a text to state this shall be a statute forever unto them i.e. this is for them but the other is not for them rabba said scripture reads and they shall no more sacrifice mishnah if he found on top of a mercurius a garment or coins or utensils behold these are permitted but if he found great clusters reeds of corn gifts of wine oil or fine flour or anything resembling what is offered upon the altar such is prohibited tomorrow whence have we this our high be Joseph said in the name of our Ashai one verse states and ye have seen their abominations and their idols wood and stone silver and gold which were among them and another verse states thou shalt not covet the silver or the gold that is on them how is it then among them is analogous to on them as with the things on them what is ornamental is prohibited and what is not ornamental is permitted so with the things among them what is ornamental is prohibited and what is not ornamental is permitted but reason the other way about on them is analogous to among them as among them means that everything that is among them is prohibited so on them means that everything that is upon them is prohibited in that case there would have been no need to mention on them coins are surely an ornament the school of our said the mission deals with the circumstance where they are tied in a bag and suspended from the idol a garment is surely an ornament the school of our Janay said the Mishnah deals with the circumstance where it is folded and placed upon the head of the idol a utensil is surely an ornament our Papa said the Mishnah deals with the circumstance where a basin is inverted over its head our CB high said whatever is within the veils even water and salt is prohibited of the things outside the veils what is ornamental is prohibited and what is not ornamental is permitted our Jose Bihan said we have a tradition that this regulation concerning veils applies neither to the idol peer nor to a Makarius for what purpose does he mention this if I answer that non-ornamental objects which are even within the veils are like those outside and are permitted since people relieve themselves before it would they not the more bring water and salt as an offering to it rather must the reason be that even what is outside is like what is within the veils and is prohibited Mishnah if an idol has a garden or bathhouse we may use either so long as it is not to the advantage of idolatry but we may not use either if it is to its advantage if they belong jointly to it and to others use may be made of them whether it be to the advantage of idolatry or not the idol of an idolater is prohibited forthwith but if it belongs to an Israelite it is not prohibited until it is worshipped Kamar Abbe said the term advantage means that payment is made to the heathen priests and not to its advantage means that no payment is made to them thus excluding the circumstance where payment is made to the idol worshippers which is permitted there are some who apply this explanation to the second clause of the mission if they belong jointly to it and to others use may be made of them whether it be to the advantage of idolatry or not Abbe said the term advantage means that the payment is made to the other joint owners and not to their advantage means that no payment is made to the heathen priests if one applies this explanation to the Second clause it clearly holds good all the more of the first clause but if he applies it to the first clause then it could not hold good of the second clause for the reason that there being others sharing the ownership with it it would be right even to make payment to the heathen priests the idol of an idolater is prohibited forth with whose is the teaching of our mission it is our archivist for it has been taught ye shall destroy all the places wherein the nation served the verse refers to the utensils which are used for idolatry it is possible to think that if they were made but not completed or completed but not brought into the heathen shrine or brought there but not yet used they would still be prohibited therefore the text states wherein the nation served i.e. they are not prohibited until they have been used in the worship hence it is said the idol of an idolater is not prohibited until it is worshipped but if it belonged to an Israelite it is prohibited forth with such is the statement of our Ishmael but our Akiva says the opposite the idol of an idolater is prohibited forthwith but if it belonged to an Israelite it is not prohibited until it is worshipped the master said above the verse refers to the utensils which are used for idolatry but the verse speaks of places and not utensils since however it cannot refer to places which are not prohibited for it is written their gods upon the high mountains not their mountains
Conclusion that when it belongs to an Israelite it is prohibited not at all since it has to be removed out of sight shall it not be prohibited at all but why not say that when it belongs to an Israelite it is to be treated in the same way as when it belongs to an idolater scripture stated and I took your sin the calf which he had made from the moment it was made it came within the category of sin but again conclude from these words that a man is guilty of sin when he makes an idol. But not that it is prohibited scripture stated curse be the man that make the graven or molten image from the moment it is made he comes under the curse conclude from these words that a man becomes involved in a curse when he makes an idol but not that it is prohibited it is written an abomination unto the Lord how does our Akiba explain this phrase the idol is a thing that leads to an abomination whence does our Akiba derive his view that the idol of an idolater is prohibited forthwith. Well, as said, scripture stated, the graven images of their gods shall yet burn with fire as soon as they have been made into graven images, they become deities. And how does the other explain this verse? He requires it in accordance with the teaching of Rab Joseph, who learned whence is it that an idolater can and all his deity, as it is stated, the graven images of their gods shall yet burn with fire. And whence does the other IER Akiba derive this regulation? He deduces it from the statement of Samuel, who asked, It is written, Thou shalt not covet the silver or the gold that is on them, and it continues, Thou shalt take it unto thee. So, how is this to be understood when the idolater fashions it into a god? Do not covet it, but when he has annulled it so that it is no longer a god, you may take it for yourself. We have ascertained our Akiba's reason for the view that the idol of an idolater is prohibited forthwith, but whence does he derive that if it belong to an Israelite, it is not? Prohibited until it is worshipped. Rab Judah said scripture stated and stated up in secret, i.e., he is not involved in the curse until he performs towards the things which are done in secret. And how does the other IER Ishmael explain this phrase? He requires it in accordance with the teaching of our Isaac, who said, Whence is it that an idol belonging to an Israelite must be removed out of sight as it is stated and stated up in secret? And from where does the other IER Akiva derive this? Regulation he deduces it from what Arhista said in the name of Rab, Whence is it that an idol belonging to an Israelite must be removed out of sight as it is stated, Thou shalt not plant thee an Asherah of any kind of tree beside the altar as an altar must be removed out of sight. So an Asherah belonging to an Israelite must be removed out of sight. And what does the other IER Ishmael make of this verse? He requires it in accordance with the teaching of our Simeon Belakish, who said, Whoever. Appoints an unworthy judges as though he plants an Asherah in Israel as it is stated judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates and near it is stated thou shalt not plant thee an Asherah of any kind of tree and our Ashi said should he have appointed such a judge in a place where there are disciples of the sages it is as though he had planted an Asherah by the side of the altar as it is stated beside the altar our Hamnon asked how is it if one repent the vessel which has been broken for an idol whose idol if I answer the idol of an idolater then both according to our Ishmael and our Akiva there are pertinences of idolatry and appurtenances of idolatry are not prohibited until they are used it must therefore be the idol belonging to an Israelite so according to whom is the question to be decided if I say it is according to our Akiva since the idol itself is not prohibited until it is worshipped obviously its appurtenances must first be used before they are prohibited. If on the other hand according to our Ishmael who said that the idol of an Israelite is prohibited forthwith the question will then be do we draw a deduction about the appurtenances of an Israelite's idol from the appurtenances of a heathen's idol just as with the latter they are not prohibited until they are used so with the former they are not prohibited until they are used or do we draw the deduction from the idol itself that as an Israelite's idol is prohibited forthwith also. Its appurtenances are prohibited forthwith but if this is what our Hamnana meant to ask why does he specify one repetitive vessel in his question let him ask about one who made a vessel our Hamnana put the question in that form because of the problem of the former defilement for we have learned of metal utensils those which are flat and those which are formed as receptacles contract defilement if they are broken they lose their defilement but if repaired they return to their former defilement so. Thus did Arhamnon ask when its defilement returns does it mean to the biblical defilement or to the rabbinical defilement or perhaps there is no difference but if that were his intention let him put his question with reference to the other rabbinical defilements his purpose was that one question should embrace another is does rabbinical defilement return or not and if you decide that it does not return do the rabbis make defilement caused by idolatry on account of its severity equal to biblical defilement or not the question remains unanswered Are and asked Arjane how is it with foodstuffs offered to an idol does the annulment of the idol avail to purify them of their defilement or not but he should have framed his question with reference to utensils there is no question about utensils because for them there is purification by immersion in a ritual bath so the defilement by idolatry can likewise be annulled what he does ask is about foodstuffs offered to an idol but let him frame his question with reference to footsteps which are themselves the object of idolatry's worship. He does not frame his question with reference to footsteps which are themselves the object of idolatry's worship. Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi, because when its prohibited character is annulled, its defilement is likewise annulled. What he does ask is with reference to footsteps offered to an idol. How are we to decide? Shall we say since its prohibited character cannot be annulled according to our guild, it follows that its defilement can likewise never be annulled, or perhaps though what is prohibited by the Torah cannot be annulled, its defilement, which is a rabbinical ordinance, can be annulled. The question remains unanswered. Our Jose B. Saul asked Rabbi May utensils which were used in the Temple of Onias be used in the sanctuary. This question follows on the view of him who said that the Temple of Onias was not an idolatry's shrine, for we have learned priests who Served in the temple of Onias may not serve in the sanctuary which is in Jerusalem and it is unnecessary to state that priests who served an idol are disqualified were the priests penalized by the rabbis because they were rational beings but they did not penalize the utensils or perhaps there is no difference and the utensils are also disqualified rabbi replied to him they are prohibited and I had a scriptural text upon which to support this decision but I have forgotten it our Jose. Peace all quoted against him moreover all the vessels which King Haas in his reign did cast away when he trespassed have we prepared and sanctified does not have we prepared mean that we immerse them in a ritual bath to purify them and sanctified that we have made them holy again he said to him may the blessing of heaven be upon you for having restored my loss to me have we prepared means we have stored them away and sanctified that we have substituted others for them is this to say that Rabbi has support from this mission in the northeast the Hasmoneans stored away the altar stones which the Greeks had made abominable and Arshis had remarked thereon they had made them abominable through idolatry our Papa said there in the case of the Hasmoneans they found a verse and expounded it to support their action for it is written and robbers shall enter into it and protect it when the Hasmoneans recaptured the temple they said how shall we act if we have them broken the all merciful declared that they were to be whole stones if we saw them the all merciful declared thou shalt lift up no iron tool upon them but why did they not have them broken and take them for their own private use has not Arshis said the rabbis wished to store away all the silver and gold in the world on account of the silver and gold plundered from the sanctuary of Jerusalem and to this it was objected is Jerusalem the greater part of the world but said Abbe what the rabbis aimed at Doing was to store away every Hadrianic and Trajanic denarius which had become worn by use because it was coined from metal captured from Jerusalem until they discovered a verse of the Torah according to which it was permitted this and robbers shall enter into it and profane it there in the case of the coins they had not been used in the divine service but here in the case of the altar stone since they had been used in the divine service it would not be respectful to put them to a secular use mission an idolater can annul an idol belonging to himself or to another idolater but an Israelite cannot annul the idol of an idolater he who annuls an idol annuls its appurtenances if he only annuls the appurtenances these are permitted but the idol is prohibited Demar Rabbi taught his son Ar Simeon an idolater can annul an idol belonging to himself or to another heathen the latter said to him my master in your youth you taught us that an idolater can annul an idol belonging to Himself or to an Israelite, but can the idol of an Israelite be annulled? For behold, it is written and stated up in secret. Our Hillel, the son of our Wallah, said, No rabbi's teaching is necessary for the circumstance where there was joint ownership of the idol by an Israelite and a heathen. On this point, what view
thereby informs us that the Israelite worships the idol on his own account. Mishnah, how does he annul it if he cut off the tip of its ear, the tip of its nose, or the tip of its finger, or if he defaced it? Although there was no reduction in the mass of the material, he has annulled it if he spat before it urinated, before it dragged it in the dust, or hurled excrement at it. Behold, it is not annulled if he sold or gave it as a pledge. Rabbi says that he has annulled it, but the sages say that he has. Not annulled it, Gemara, since there was no reduction in the mass of the material, how could it be annulled? Arzara said because he defaced its appearance if he spat before it urinated before it. Whence is this Hezekiah said because scripture stated and it shall come to pass that when they shall be angry they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their god and turn their faces upward and it continues and they shall look unto the earth and behold distress and darkness etc. Thus although the heathen curse his king and his god and turn upward to the true god he still looks unto the earth if he sold or gave it as a pledge. Rabbi says that he has annulled it etc. Zari in the name of Aryohanan and Arjeremiah B. Abba in the name of Rabbar at variance one said that the difference is over a heathen smelter but if it was sold to an Israelite smelter all agree that he annulled it. The other said that the difference is over an Israelite smelter. The question was asked is it Difference over an Israelite smelter, but with a heathen smelter, all agree that he has not annulled it, or perhaps in either case there is a difference. Come in here, for Rabbi said, My view is the more probable when he sold it to be broken up, and my colleague's view is the more probable when he sold it to be worshipped. What means to be broken up and to be worshipped? Am I to say that these terms are to be understood in their literal sense if that were so? What is the reason of him who says that he had annulled it, and the reason of him who says that he had not annulled it must not then to be broken up mean that he sold it to someone who would break it up as an Israelite smelter, and to be worshipped means that he sold it to someone who would worship it as a heathen smelter, and are we not to conclude that in either case there is a difference of opinion? No, this is the meaning Rabbi said, My view is acceptable to my colleagues when he sold it to be broken up, i.e. to an Israelite. Smelter because even my colleagues do not differ from me except in the case where he sold it to be worshipped but when it is sold to be broken up they agree with me that it had been annulled against the above the following is quoted if one brought scrap metal from a heathen and found an idol amongst it should he have drawn it into his possession before paying over the purchase price he can return the idol but should he have drawn it into his possession after paying over the purchase money he cast it into the salt sea this is quite right if you say that the above difference is over an Israelite smelter then whose is this teaching it is the rabbis but if you say that the difference is over a heathen smelter and all agree that with an Israelite smelter he has annulled it whose is this teaching it is otherwise in the present illustration because his intention was to sell scrap metal and not an idol our rabbis taught if a heathen borrowed money on an idol or ruins fell upon it or Robert stole it or the owners left it behind and journeyed to a distant land Talmud, Moss Abbot Azarabi if with the intention of returning to claim it as happened during the war waged by Joshua it is not annulled it was necessary to cite all these circumstances for if there had only been taught the case where he borrowed money on it from the fact that he had not sold it it follows that he had not annulled it but if ruins fell upon it since he does not clear them away to recover it. Conclude that he had annulled it therefore it was necessary to mention that in the latter circumstance the idol is not annulled if there had only been taught the case where ruins fell upon it because he thought that the idol is lying there and whenever I want it I can take it he did not annul it but in the case where Robert stole it from the fact that he does not go searching for it it might be assumed that he had annulled it therefore it was necessary to mention that in the latter. Circumstance the idol is not annulled if there had only been taught the case where robbers stole it because he thought that if a heathen took it he would doubtless worship it and if an Israelite took it, it being an article of value he would sell it to a heathen who would worship it therefore it is not annulled but in the case where the owners left it behind and journeyed to a distant land since they did not take it with them it might be assumed that they had annulled it therefore it was necessary to mention that in the latter circumstance the idol is not annulled if with the intention of returning to claim the idol as happened during the war waged by Joshua it is not annulled but in the instance of the war waged by Joshua did the Amorites return this is the meaning if the owners have the intention of returning it is analogous to the war waged by Joshua and there can be no annulment why then compare it to the war waged by Joshua either by informs us of something. Incidentally, and it is as Rab Judah said in the name of Rab, if an Israelite set up a brick to worship but did not do so, and an idolater came and worshipped it, it is prohibited. Once have we that it is prohibited? Our Eliezer said it is the same as happened at the beginning of the settlement in the land of Israel, for the divine law declared and burned their Asherim with fire. Now it was an inheritance to the Israelites from their ancestors, and a man cannot make prohibited what does not belong to him. If it is assumed that the reason was on account of those Asherim which existed there originally, then just an annulment would have sufficed. But inasmuch as the Israelites worshipped the golden calf, they revealed their proneness for idolatry. So when the idolaters came and worshipped Asherim, they acted according to the Israelites' bidding. Similarly, when an Israelite set up a brick, he revealed his proneness for idolatry. Therefore, when he even came and worshipped it, he acted according. To the Israelites' bidding, but perhaps the proneness was only for the golden calf and for nothing else. No scripture states these be thy gods, O Israel, which proves that they lusted for many gods. Conclude then that all the Asherim which existed at the same time as the golden calf are prohibited, but those planted subsequently are permitted. Who is able to distinguish between the mission and idol which its worshippers abandoned in time of peace is permitted in time of war is prohibited. Pedestals of kings are permitted because the heathens only set them up at the time the kings passed by Gemara or Jeremiah B. Abba said in the name of Rab the temple of Nimrod is to be regarded the same as an idol which its worshippers abandoned in time of peace and is permitted for although due to the fact that the all merciful dispersed them it was like a time of war if they had wished to return and claim the idols they could have returned but since they did not they must have annulled them. Pedestals of kings are permitted because the heathens only set them up at the time the kings pass by. They are permitted. Rabbi Barhana said in the name of Aryohanan. The meaning is because they only set them up at the time kings pass by, and the kings may abandon that road and proceed by another road. When Ula came, he seated himself on a damaged pedestal. Rab Judah said to him, Behold, both Rab and Samuel declared that a damaged pedestal is prohibited, and even according to him who said that, heathens do not worship fragments of idols. That applies only to an idol because it is an act of contempt to worship fragments. But with this pedestal, one does not care. He replied to him, Who would give me some of the dust from the bodies of Rab and Samuel that I might fill my eyes with it? Nevertheless, both Aryohanan and Arsimian Belakish declared that a damaged pedestal is permitted, and even according to him who said that heathens do worship fragments that applies only to an idol. Because from the fact that they worship it, they would regard it a desecration to annul it. But as for these pedestals, they throw them aside when damaged and bring another. There is a teaching in agreement with our Yohanan and our Simeon Belakish. A damaged pedestal is permitted. A damaged altar is prohibited until the greater part of it is demolished. What constitutes a pedestal and what an altar are Jacob B. E. said in the name of our Yohanan. A pedestal consists of a single stone and altar of several stones. Talmud, Mos Abed Azara, Hezekiah said, which is the text when he makes all the stones of the altar as chalk stones that are beaten in sunder so that the Asherim and the sun images shall rise no more. I.e., if the altar becomes like chalk stones that are beaten in sunder, then the Asherim and the sun images shall rise no more. Otherwise, they will rise again. Atan taught if a man worshipped an animal which is his own, it is prohibited, but if it belonged to another, it is. Permitted against this I quote which animal is considered to have been worshipped any which was worshipped whether inadvertently or deliberately whether under compulsion or voluntarily how is the term under compulsion to be understood is it not e.g. when a man took his neighbor's animal by force and worshipped it Rami B. Hava said no it is e.g. when heathens brought pressure to bear upon a man and he worshipped his own animal to this interpretation Arzara objected but the all-merciful absolves. Anyone who acts under pressure as it is written but unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing but said Rabbah all were included in the general law nor serve them so when scripture specifies he shall live by them i.e. and not die through them it excludes a man who acts under pressure after that however the all-merciful wr
It is different with priests because they are rational beings and if I answer that it may be derived from the altered stones perhaps it is as our Papa explained Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi rather must it be derived from the sanctuary vessels for it is written moreover all the vessels which King Ahaz in his reign did cast away when he trespassed have we prepared and sanctified and the master declared have we prepared means that we have stored them away and sanctified means that we have substituted others for them but there is a rule that a man cannot render prohibited what is not his property since however an act of idolatry's worship was performed on them King Hezekiah and his followers declared them prohibited for themselves similarly here with the animal since he performed an act of idolatry's worship on it he has rendered it prohibited when Ardimi came from Palestine he reported in the name of Aryohan and although the rabbis declared that he who worships a Piece of ground does not render it prohibited yet if he dug in it wells pits or caves he has rendered it prohibited when our Samuel B. Judah came from Palestine he reported that our Yohanan said although the rabbis declared that he who worships animate beings has not rendered them prohibited if he obtained them in exchange for an idol he has rendered them prohibited when Rabin came from Palestine he said on this point our Ishmael son of our Jose and the rabbis are at variance one said that the animals obtained in exchange for an idol are prohibited but the animals obtained in exchange for these are permitted while the other says that even these are prohibited what is the reason of him who says that even these are prohibited scripture states and become a devoted thing like unto it i.e. whatever you bring into being from a devoted thing is to be treated like it what is the reason of the other scripture states for it is a devoted thing it is a devoted thing but not what is Obtained as a result of a double exchange, how does the second authority explain this phrase? He requires it for the exclusion of Orla and the mixed plantings of a vineyard, so that if he sold them and with the proceeds married a wife, she is legally married. Why does the first authority not explain the word it similarly? Because Orla and the mixed plantings of a vineyard do not require to be specially excluded, since in connection with idolatry and the sabbatical year we have two texts, which have an identical purpose, and the rule is we draw no deduction when two texts have an identical purpose as regards idolatry. It is as we have stated as regards the sabbatical year, it is written for it is a jubilee, it shall be holy unto you as the holiness affects the redemption money and is prohibited. Similarly, the sabbatical year described as holy like the sanctuary affects its money and is prohibited. If this conclusion is correct, then as the holiness affects its redemption money and the object which is redeemed becomes not holy similarly the sabbatical year should affect its money and the produce which had been sold become not holy but there is a text to state it shall be holy i.e. it shall remain in that state how is it then if he bought meat with fruits grown in the seventh year both must be removed during the sabbatical year but if he bought fish with that meat the meat ceases to be holy and the fish becomes holy if he then bought wine with the fish the fish ceases to be holy and the wine becomes holy if he then bought oil with the wine the wine ceases to be holy and the oil becomes holy how is it then it is the last thing in the series of exchanges which is affected by the sabbatical year and the fruit itself is prohibited what however of the second authority he holds that we do draw a deduction when two texts have an identical purpose and the phrase for it is a devoted thing is required for the exclusion of orla and the mixed plantings of a Vineyard as explained above Mishnah the elders in Rome were asked if your God has no desire for idolatry why does he not abolish it they replied if it was something unnecessary to the world that was worshipped he would abolish it but people worship the sun moon stars and planets should he destroy his universe on account of fools they said to the elders if so he should destroy what is unnecessary for the world and leave what is necessary for the world they replied if he did that we should merely be strengthening the hands of the worshippers of these because they would say be sure that these are deities for behold they have not been abolished Gemara our rabbis taught philosophers asked the elders in Rome if your God has no desire for idolatry why does he not abolish it they replied if it was something of which the world has no need that was worshipped he would abolish it but people worship the sun moon stars and planets should he destroy the universe on account of fools they world pursues its natural course and as for the fools who act wrongly they will have to render an account another illustration suppose a man stole a measure of wheat and went and sowed it in the ground it is right that it should not grow but the world pursues its natural course and as for the fools who act wrongly they will have to render an account another illustration suppose a man has intercourse with his neighbor's wife it is right that she should not conceive but the world pursues its natural course and as for the fools who act wrongly they will have to render an account this is similar to what our Simeon B. said the holy one blessed be he declared not enough that the wicked put my coinage to vulgar use but they trouble me and compel me to set my seal thereon a philosopher asked Argamaliel it is written in your Torah for the Lord thy God is a devouring fire a jealous God why however is he so jealous of its worshippers rather than of the idol itself he replied I will give you a parable to what is the matter like to a human king who had a son and the son reared a dog to which he attached his father's name so that whenever he took an oath he exclaimed by the life of this dog my father when the king hears of it with whom is he angry his son or the dog surely he is angry with his son the philosopher said to him you call the idol a dog but there is some reality in it the rabbi asked what is your proof he replied once a fire broke out in our city and the whole town was burnt with the exception of a certain idolatrous shrine he said to him I will give you a parable to what is the matter like to a human king against whom one of his provinces rebelled if he goes to war against it does he fight with the living or the dead surely he wages war with the living the philosopher said to him you call the idol a dog and you call it a dead thing in that case let him destroy it from the world he replied if it was something unnecessary to the world that was Worship he would abolish it but people worship the sun and moon stars and planets brooks and valleys should he destroy his universe on account of fools and thus it states Talmud, Mas Abedazara am I utterly to consume all things from off the face of the ground set the Lord am I to consume man and beast am I to consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea even the stumbling blocks of the wicked i.e. because the wicked stumble over these things is he to destroy them from the world do they not worship the human being so am I to cut off man from off the face of the ground the general Agrippa asked Argamaliel it is written in your Torah for the Lord thy God is a devouring fire a jealous God is a wise man jealous of any but a wise man a warrior of any but a warrior a rich man of any but a rich man he replied I will give you a parable to what is the matter like to a man who marries an additional wife if the second wife is her superior the first will not be jealous of her but if she is her inferior the first wife will be jealous of her and Israelite names and said to our Akiba we both know in our heart that there is no reality in an idol nevertheless we see men enter the shrine crippled and come out cured what is the reason he replied I will give you a parable to what is the matter like to a trustworthy man in a city and all his townsmen used to deposit their money in his charge without witnesses one man however came and deposited his money in his charge with witnesses but on one occasion he forgot and made his deposit without witnesses the wife of the trustworthy man said to her husband come let us deny it he answered her because this fool acted in an unworthy manner shall I destroy my reputation for trustworthiness it is similar with afflictions at the time they are sent upon a man the oath is imposed upon them you shall not come upon him except on such and such a day nor depart from him except on such and such a day and at such an hour and through the medium of so and so and through such and such a remedy when the time arrives for them to depart the man chance to go to an idolatrous shrine the afflictions plead it is right that we should not leave him and depart but because this fool acts in an unworthy way shall we break our oath this is similar to what our Yohanan said what means that which is written and sore and faithful sickness is sore in their mission and faithful to their oath Rabbi son of our Isaac said to Rab Judah there is an idolatrous shrine in our place and whenever the world is in need of rain the idol appears to its priest in a dream saying slay a human being to me and I will send rain they slay a human being to it and rain does come he replied now were I dead nobody could have related to you a certain dictum of Rab is what means that which is written which the Lord thy God hath divided halak unto all the peoples under the whole heaven this teaches that he made smooth halak. Their words to banish idolaters from the world this is similar to what our Simeon Belaker said what means that which is written surely he scorneth the scorners but he giveth grace unto the lowly if one comes to defile himself he is granted facilities for so doing and if he comes to purify himself support is given to him Mishnah one press containing trodden grapes may be purchased from a heathen even though it was he that lifted the trodden grap
and here and the juice does not become yen nizek until it descends into the vat. Similarly, here says Arhuna, the Mishnah deals with a vat which is stoppered and full come, and here when it has descended into the vat, what is in the vat is prohibited, but the remainder is permitted. Arhuna said there is no contradiction. One teaching is from the older Mishnah and the other from the later Mishnah, for it has been taught at first the sages used to say BTT that Israelites may not glean grapes. Together with the heathen and bring them into a wine press for the reason that it is forbidden to cause defilement to the ordinary foodstuffs of the land of Israel, nor may they tread grapes together with an Israelite who works with his fruits while he is in a state of defilement for the reason that it is forbidden to assist transgressors, but they may tread grapes together with a heathen in a wine press. Consequently, no attention is here paid to the view of Arhuna later. The rabbi said DBB. Israelites may not tread grapes together with a heathen in a wine press for the reason given by Arhuna Talmud, Mas Abedazara, nor may they glean grapes together with an Israelite who works with his fruits while he is in a state of defilement. So how much more may they not tread grapes but may glean them together with a heathen since it is permitted to cause defilement to the ordinary foodstuffs of the land of Israel and the juice does not become yen nizek until it descends into the vat. But we have learned wine becomes subject to the tithe when it is skeen. Rabbi said there is no contradiction because this latter teaching is our Akibas and that of the Mishnah is the Rabbis for it has been taught the liquid is considered to be wine when it descends into the vat whereas our Akibas says when it is skeen the question was asked does this mean skimming of the wine while it is in the vat or when it is in the cask come and here we have learned it is to be considered wine. When it is skeen and although he has skeen it he may draw some off from the upper trough and from the pipe and drink it deduce from this that we mean the skimming while it is in the vat draw this conclusion but our Zibid learned in the collection of Berithas of the school of Arashaya it is to be considered wine when it descends into the vat and is skeen whereas our Akibas says when it is drawn into casks that former Beritha must be also explained in the sense just given this it is. Considered to be wine when it descends into the vat and is skeen, whereas our Akiba says when it is drawn into casks, but since our Mishnah teaches it does not become yen nizek until it descends into the vat, conclude that there are three tanim offering different definitions. No, it is different as regards yen nizek because the rabbis take a strict view Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi, but as for Rabbi who draws no distinction, he makes his explanation on the hypothesis that there are three tanim offering different definitions. What is in the vat is prohibited, but the remainder is permitted. Arhuna said they only taught this in the case where he did not return the network to the press, but if he did return it to the press, the whole of it is prohibited. Why, however, should that which is in the network itself be prohibited on account of the outflow? Deduce from this that the outflow is a connecting medium. No, as our taught his jar force the wine back, and similarly here the contents. Of the vat forced the wine back there was a boy who had learned the tractate on idolatry when he was six years old he was asked may an Israelite tread grapes together with a heathen in a press he replied it is lawful to tread grapes together with a heathen in a press to the objection but he renders it yen nizek by the touch of his hands he answered we tie his hands up to the further objection but he renders it yen nizek by the touch of his feet he answered wine touched by the feet is not called nizek it happened in Nihartia that an Israelite and a heathen pressed out wine together on the question being put to him how this wine was to be considered Samuel delayed three festivals before replying what was his reason for the delay shall I say that he thought to himself Talmud Mas Abedazara if I find a tana who forbids its use as does our Nathan then I will forbid it even to be used for any purpose whatever since it has been taught if a heathen measured it. Quantity of wine either by using his hand or leg for that purpose it may be sold whereas our Nathan says if he used his hand it is prohibited but if his leg it is permitted but then admit that our Nathan declared his prohibition where the wine was touched by the hand but did he say so when it was touched by the leg rather must he have thought to himself if I find a teacher who permits like our Simeon then I will permit it even for drinking it happened at Byram that he even climbed a palm tree and took one of its branches while descending he unintentionally touched a cask of wine with the branch rab on being consulted permitted it to be sold to heathens Arkahana and R.C. said to him but the master it was who declared that a child only a day old can render wine nizek he replied I merely decided against its being drunk by Israelites but did I say against its use otherwise by them the text states the master himself has declared that a child only a day old can render Wine Nizek Arshai Mai Bihai quoted in objection to Rab's statement if an Israelite bought slaves from a heathen who had been circumcised but not immersed and similarly with the children of female slaves born in an Israelite's house who had been circumcised but not immersed their spittle and the place where they tread in the street are unclean but others declare that they are clean as for wine adults render it Nizek by contact with it but minors do not render it Nizek the following are adults and minors adults are such as understand the nature of an idol and its appurtenances whereas minors are such as do not understand this at all events it here teaches that adults do render wine Nizek and minors do not Rab explain the teaching as referring to the children of female slaves but in the passage cited above we have the words and similarly that refers to their spittle and place of treading this answer is all right according to him who declared that these are unclean but According to him who declared that they are clean what is there to say it informs us of the similarity of slaves to the children of female slaves as the children of female slaves when circumcised but not immersed render one nizek and if both circumcised and immersed do not so is it also with slaves this excludes what Arnaman said in the name of Samuel is if an Israelite bought slaves from a heathen although they had been both circumcised and immersed they render one nizek until idolatry is entirely banished from their lips hence we are informed that it is not so the text states Arnaman said in the name of Samuel if an Israelite bought slaves from a heathen although they had been both circumcised and immersed they render one nizek until idolatry is entirely banished from their lips how long is this our Joshua believe I said up to 12 months Rabbi quoted against Arnaman if an Israelite bought slaves from a heathen who had been circumcised but not immersed and similarly with the children of female slaves who had been circumcised but not immersed their spittle and the place where they tread Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi in the street are unclean but others declare that they are clean as for wine adults render it nizek but minors do not render it nizek the following are adults and minors adults are such as understand the nature of an idol and its appurtenances whereas minors are such as do not understand this at all events it here teaches that when circumcised but not immersed they do render wine nizek and if both circumcised and immersed they do not are and explain the teaching is referring to the children of female slaves but in the passage cited above we have the words and similarly that refers to their spittle and place of treading this answer is all right according to him who declared that these are unclean but according to him who declared that they are clean what is there to say it informs us of the similarity of slaves to the children of female slaves as the adult children of female slaves render one nizek but if minors they do not so also with slaves they render one nizek when adults but not when minors this excludes what rap said a child only a day old can render one nizek hence we are informed that it is not so it happened at Mahuza that a heathen came and entered the shop of an Israelite he asked them have you wine to sell they replied we have not there was some wine contained in a bucket into which the heathen plunged his hand and splashed about and said to them is not this wine in his anger the shopkeeper took the wine and poured it back into the cask Rabbah permitted him to sell it to Gentiles but Arhuna Bihin and Arhuna son of Arnaman differed from him an announcement issued from Rabbah permitting the sale of the wine and an announcement issued from Arhuna Bihin and Arhuna son of Arnaman forbidding it Talmud Mas Abedazara later on Arhuna son of Arnaman visited Mahuza and Rabbah Said to his attendant Arliak and bolt the door so that nobody shall enter to disturb us. Arhuna son of Arnaman entered the room and asked him in such circumstances how is the law? He replied it is forbidden even for use. Arhuna exclaimed but the master it was who declared that such splashing does not render one nizek. Rabba replied I was referring to the contents of the cask apart from the value of that wine which had been in the bucket. I said nothing with reference to the value of that. Wine Rabba continued when I came to Pumbadai the Namani overwhelmed me with precedence and teachings to the effect that it is prohibited as to precedence. There was a similar occurrence in Nihardia where Samuel prohibited it and another in Tiberias where Aryohan and prohibited it and when I replied to him that they g
be used for any purpose while the other permitted it even for drinking are Joshua B. Levi said he who prohibited it acted rightly and he who permitted it acted rightly he who prohibited it Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi acted on this supposition the heathen must have said to himself would it occur to such rabbis as these to drink beer it must surely be wine and he rendered it Nizek he who permitted it acted rightly on this supposition the heathen must have said to himself would it occur to such Rabbis as these to drink wine and ask me to pour out for them it must be beer they are drinking and he did not render it nizek but he could have seen whether it was wine or beer it was night but he could have smelled it was new but he must have touched it when he drew the liquor from the cask with a measure so it is a case where he even touched wine unintentionally and it is prohibited no it is necessary to understand it as a case where he merely poured out and so it is a circumstance of unintentional action and the rabbis did not decree against a circumstance of unintentional action rc asked are you and how is it when wine is mixed by a heathen he said to him use the verb mazik rc replied i use the scriptural word as in she hath killed her beast she hath mingled mazik her wine he said to him the language of the torah is distinct and so is the language of the sages how is it then if a heathen mixes it with water are you and answered it is Prohibited on the principle keep off we say to a Nazi right go round the vineyard and come not near it or Jeremiah once visited Sekitha and there saw heathens mixing the wine and Israelites drinking it he prohibited it to them on the principle keep off we say to a Nazi right go round the vineyard and come not near it it has likewise been stated Aryohan and said another version is RC said in the name of Aryohan and wine mixed by a heathen is prohibited on the principle keep off we say to a Nazi right go round the vineyard and come not near it or Simeon Belakish once came to Basra and there saw the Israelites eating untied fruits and he prohibited them he saw water which had been worshipped by idolaters being drunk by Israelites and he prohibited it he came before Aryohan and related to him what he had done and the latter said to him while your cloak is still upon you return Bezer is not Basra and water belonging to the public cannot become prohibited Aryohan and here followed his own Opinion Talmud, Mas Abed Azara for Aryohan and said in the name of Arsimian B. Jehozadak water belonging to the public cannot become prohibited consequently when it belongs to an individual it does become prohibited but it should be excluded for the reason that it is something fixed in the ground no it is necessary to mention it because it can be prohibited in the case where a wave caused some of the water to flow away at all events such water may be compared to boulders which had broken away and it must therefore be concluded that it was Aryohan who said they were prohibited no it is necessary to suppose a case where a heathen collected the waters with his own hand Arhai B. Abba once visited Gabla and there saw Israelite women who were pregnant by heathens who had been circumcised but not immersed he also saw one being drunk by Israelites which had been mixed by heathens and lupins eaten when cooked by heathens but he said nothing to them when he came before our Yohanan and reported the matter to him. The latter exclaimed, Go and announce that their children are illegitimate. Their wine is Nizek and their lupins are prohibited as something cooked by heathens because the inhabitants of Gabla are not students of Torah. In announcing that their children were illegitimate, Yohanan followed his own opinion. For Yohanan said, A Gentile is never to be regarded as a proselyte until he is both circumcised and immersed, and since he has not undergone immersion, he is a Gentile. And Rabbi B. Barhana has said in the name of Yohanan, If a Gentile or a slave has intercourse with an Israelite woman, the child is a mom's or he decreed that their wine was Nizek on the principle, Keep off, we say to a Nazi right, Go round the vineyard and come not near it. And he decreed against their lupins as something cooked by heathens because the inhabitants of Gabla were not students of Torah. His reason was that they were not students of Torah. Consequently, if they had been students of Torah, the Lubins would have been permitted, but surely our Samuel, son of our Isaac, said in the name of Rab, whatever is eaten raw does not come within the law of what is prohibited on account of having been cooked by heathens or Yohanan follows a different version of the teaching. This our Samuel, son of our Isaac, said in the name of Rab, whatever is not brought upon the table of kings to serve as a relish with bread does not come within the law of what is prohibited on account of having been cooked by heathens. Therefore, his reason was that they were not students of Torah, and if they had been students of Torah, the Lubins would have been permitted. Our Kahana was asked, May a heathen be allowed to convey grapes to a wine press? He replied, It is prohibited on the principle, keep off, we say to a Nazi right, go round the vineyard and come not near it. Our Jemar quoted against our Kahana, if a heathen carried grapes to a wine press in baskets, Talmud, Mas Abed, Azarabi, or Barrels, even though the wine drips upon them, it is permitted. Our Kahana replied to him, You used the word carried, whereas I was speaking of a case of initio. A citron once fell into a cask of wine, and a heathen sprang for war to pull it out. Our Ashi said to them, Hold his hand so that he does not splash about until the cask until it is emptied. Our Ashi said, When a heathen has deliberately rendered the wine of an Israelite Nizak, although it is prohibited to sell it to another heathen, the owner is allowed to receive the cost from the person who disqualified it on what ground because he involved him in a loss. Our Ashi said, Whence do I derive this from this teaching? If an idolater offered wine of an Israelite as a libation, not in the presence of an idol, it is prohibited. But our Judah be Baba and our Judah be, but they are permitted for two reasons. First, because wine can be rendered Nizak only in the presence of an idol, and secondly, because the owner can say to him, You have no right to make my Wine prohibited through no fault of my own. It once happened that the bung fell out of a cask of wine and a heathen sprang forward and placed his hand over it. Our Papa said, All the wine that is on the level with the bunghole is prohibited. Talmud, Mas Abed Azara, and the remainder is permitted. Another version is our Papa said, The wine above the bunghole is prohibited and the remainder is permitted. Our Jemar said, This is like the Tanaim who are at variance over the following if a cake became perforated, whether on top, the bottom, or its sides, and a tibble touched it, it is defiled. Our Judah says, If it was perforated on top or bottom, it is defiled, but if on its sides, it is altogether undefiled. Our Papa said, If a heathen was holding the barrel and an Israelite the cask, the wine is prohibited on what ground because the pouring results from the effort of the heathen. If, however, an Israelite was holding the barrel and a heathen the cask, the wine is permitted, but should the heathen Tilt it sideways it is prohibited our papa said if a heathen carries a skin bottle of wine and an Israelite follows behind him should it be full it is permitted because the wine does not shake but should it not be full it is prohibited because there is a possibility of shaking in the case however of a full cask being so carried it is prohibited because he might have touched it but should it not be full it is permitted because there is less likelihood that he touched it or as she said in the case of a skin bottle whether full or not it is permitted on what ground because such is not the way of rendering wine nizek wine from a press where beams are used is permitted by our papi but prohibited by our ashi or according to another version by our shimai b ashi in the case of direct action there is certainly no difference of opinion that it is prohibited the difference being over the circumstance where there was indirect action some declare that in the case of indirect action there is Certainly no difference of opinion that it is permitted the difference being over the circumstance where there was direct action an instance of such indirect action occurred and our Jacob of Nihar Pekot prohibited it, it once happened that a cast Talmud, Mas Abed Azara be split lengthwise and a heathen sprang forward and clasped it in his arms Raphram B. Papa another version is Arhuna the son of Rab Joshua permitted it to be sold to heathens this rule applies only when it split lengthwise but if crosswise it is permitted even to be drunk by Israelites on what ground a heathen only did what a brick might have done a heathen was once found standing in the empty wine press of an Israelite on being consulted our Ashi said if it was sufficiently moist to moisten other objects it needs to be rinsed with water and rubbed dry otherwise mere rinsing is sufficient mission if a heathen was found standing by the side of a vat of wine should he have a lean upon it then it is prohibited but should he not have a lean upon it then it is permitted if a heathen fell into a vat and climbed out or measured it with a rod or flicked out a hornet with a rod or tapped on the top of a frothing cask it happened so with all these circumstances and the rabbi said that it may be sold while our Simeon permits it if he took a cask and in his anger threw it into the vat this actually happened and the rabbis declared it fit for drinking Gamar Samuel said the first clause of it. Mishnah only applies when he has a lean on that
Istas said in the name of Zeiri the Halachah agrees with Arsimi and others declare that Ar Istas said Abu Bihin and remarked to me that Zeiri said the Halachah agrees with Arsimi but the Halachah is not in accord with Arsimi if he took a cask and in his anger threw it into the vat this actually happened and the rabbis declared it fit for drinking Arashi said whatever is rendered unclean by Zab makes wine in a similar circumstance Nizak by a heathen and whatever is not rendered unclean by Zab makes wine not to be Nizak by a heathen are who not quoted against Arashi if he took a cask and in his anger threw it into the vat this actually happened in Beth Shan and the rabbis declared it fit for drinking consequently if he did this in anger it is fit for drinking but if he had not done it in anger it would not be fit Talmud Mas Abed Zara Arashi replied there it refers to the circumstance where the cask was being roiled by him the whole distance into the Bat Mishnah if an Israelite prepares a heathen's wine in a state of ritual purity and leaves it in the latter's domain in a house which opens onto the public domain should it be in a city where heathens and Israelites reside it is permitted but should it be in a city where only heathens reside it is prohibited unless an Israelite sits and watches there is no need for the supervisor to sit and watch the whole time even if he keeps going out and coming in it is permitted Arsimian B. Eliezer says it is all one with the domain of a heathen if an Israelite prepares a heathen's wine in a state of ritual purity and leaves it in the latter's domain who writes for him I have received the money from you then the wine I is permitted if however the Israelite wished to remove it and the heathen refuses to let it go until he paid him this actually happened in Beth Shan and the rabbis prohibited it Imar in a city where only heathens reside it should also be permitted. Without a supervisor, since there are Israelites by sellers going about the city, Samuel said the mission refers to a city which has doors and bolts. Or Joseph said if there is a window, it is the equivalent of the house being in a public domain, or if there is a rubbish heap, it is the equivalent of the house being in a public domain. And similarly, a date palm makes it the equivalent of a public domain if the top of the date palm had been cut off, or aha and rub in a different one forbidding. The one and the other permitting it, he who forbids it does so for the reason that the heathen thinks that the owner of the tree has no cost to climb it, and he who permits it does so for the reason that an occasion may occur that the Israelites' cattle will stray and he will climb it to look for them. Or rabbis taught whether an Israelite purchases or rents an apartment in the court of a heathen and fills it with casks of wine, and an Israelite resides in that court, it is permitted. Even though the key and seal be not in his Israelite's possession Talmud, Mas Abed Azara be Talmud, Mas Abed Azara be if however he resides in another court it is permitted only when the key and seal are in his possession if an Israelite prepares the wine of a heathen in a state of ritual purity in the latter's domain and an Israelite resides in that court it is permitted should the key and seal be in his possession are Yohanan said to the Tanner read as follows even though the key and seal be not in his possession it is permitted should he reside in another court it is prohibited even if the key and seal are in his possession such as the statement of Armeir but the sages prohibited unless a supervisor sits and watches or until somebody is appointed to go there for stated periods to which of the four circumstances just enumerated do the sages refer if I say it is to the last the first ten also prohibits it perhaps it is to the third but are Yohanan informed the Tanner. Read as follows even though the key and seal be not in his possession the wine is permitted rather must it be to the second for the first tana declared if however he resides in another court it is permitted only when the key and seal are in his possession whereas the sages hold that it is always prohibited unless a supervisor sits and watches or until somebody is appointed to go there for stated periods but his going there for stated periods is a disadvantage rather must the statement be amended to until somebody is appointed to go there not for stated periods Arsimian B. Eliezer says it is all one with the domain of a heathen the question was asked is the purpose of Arsimian B. Eliezer to make the law lenient or strict Rav Judah said in the name of Zeiri to make it lenient but Arnaman said in the name of Zeiri to make it strict Rav Judah said in the name of Zeiri that it is to make the law lenient and the statement of the first tana must be understood thus just as it Wine is prohibited in the domain of that heathen, it is similarly prohibited in the domain of any other heathen, and we take into account the possibility of heathens being partial one to another. But Arsimian B. Eliezer says that only applies to his own domain, but when it is in the domain of another heathen, it is permitted because we do not take into account the fear of partiality. Our novel said in the name of Zeiri that it is to make the law strict, and the statement of the first tana must be understood. Thus, this only applies to his own domain, but when it is in the domain of another heathen, it is permitted, and we do not take into account the fear of partiality. But Arsimian B. Eliezer says it is all one with the domain of a heathen. There is a teaching in accord with what our novel said in the name of Zeiri. If the purpose is to make the law strict, this Arsimian B. Eliezer said it is all one with the domain of a heathen because of the fraudulent Israelites once bought grapes from it. House of Parzak the king's field marshal and having made wine from them left it in charge of his tenant laborers the rabbis in the presence of Rabbah thought to declare it permitted on the ground that we only take into account the fear of partiality where there might be mutual agreement but in this instance since it could not be the custom of the tenant laborers to enter into an agreement with Parzak the king's field marshal we take no account of the fear of partiality Rabbah however said to them on the contrary even according to him who maintains that we take no account of the fear of partiality that only applies where there is no possibility of terrorization but in this instance since the tenants are afraid of him they would conceal any action on his part to interfere with the wine to shield him in a certain town where there was wine belonging to an Israelite even was found standing among the jars Rabbah said if he would be arrested on that account as a thief the wine is Permitted otherwise it is prohibited Talmud, Mas Abed Azara Achapterv Mishnah if a heathen hire an Israelite workman to assist him in the preparation of Yen Nizek his wage is prohibited if he hired him to assist him in another kind of work even saying to him remove from your cask of Yen Nizek from this place to that his wage is permitted if he hired an Israelite's ass to carry Yen Nizek its hire is prohibited but if he hired it to sit upon even though the heathen rested his jar of Yen Nizek upon it its hire is permitted tomorrow why is the workman's wage prohibited if I answer that inasmuch as Yen Nizek is prohibited for use of any kind and therefore the wage which came to him from it is likewise prohibited behold Orla and the mixed plantings of a vineyard are prohibited for use of any kind and yet we have learned if he sold them and with the proceeds married a wife she is legally married on the other hand should I answer that the reason is because his money which comes to him on account of Yen Nizek is affected as though it were an idolatrous object. Behold, the sabbatical year affects the money obtained from the sale of its produce, and yet we have learned if one said to a workman in the sabbatical year, Here is a dinar, and for it gather vegetables for me today, his wage is prohibited. But if he said, Gather vegetables for me today, his wage is permitted. Arabab said in the name of Aryohan, and the true explanation is that it is a penalty which the sages imposed upon Astribers, and in connection with Yen Nizek, as for Yen Nizek, it is as has just been stated, and what is the case of the Astribers, as it has been taught, if Astribers work with the fruits of the sabbatical year, their wage is the produce of the sabbatical year. What means their wage is produce of the sabbatical year? If I say it means that they receive their wage in fruits of the sabbatical year, consequently the employer discharges his obligation with fruits of it. Sabbatical year and the Torah stated and the Sabbath of the land shall be for food but not for trading if on the other hand I answer that the meaning is that their wage is holy like the holiness of the produce of the sabbatical year is it holy for it has been taught if one said to a workman in the sabbatical year here is a dinar and gather vegetables for me today his wage is permitted only if he said gather vegetables for me today for this dinar is his wage prohibited Abbe said. It certainly means that they receive their wage in fruits of the sabbatical year and the difficulty you raise is for food but not for trading is met by the supposition that he paid them in a lawful manner as we have learned one may not say to his neighbor Talmud, Mas Abed Azara be carry up for me these fruits to Jerusalem and for doing so have a share in them but he may say to him carry them up so that we may eat and drink of them in Jerusalem they may also make a free gift of them too. Each other Rabbah however said the meaning is certainly that their wage is holy like the holiness of the produce of the sabbatical year and the difficulty you raise over the teaching concerning
In this latter instance since the persons were buried by the court it would be generally known that they had been executed under sentence of the court but in the former instance the circumstances would not be generally known and a person might suppose that somebody had stolen the wheat and brought it to be buried there the scholars in the school of Arjana used to borrow fruits of the sabbatical year from the poor and repay them in the eighth year when this was reported to our Yohan and he said to them they act rightly and an analogy may be found in the matter of a harlot's hire which is permitted for it has been taught if he gave her an animal without having intercourse with her or had intercourse without giving it to her her hire is permitted for use in the sanctuary now if he gave her it without having intercourse with her obviously it may be devoted to the sanctuary for the reason that having had no intercourse with her he merely presented her with a gift further if he had intercourse without giving it to her behold he gave her nothing and since he made no presentation to her what means that her hire is permitted this is what he intends if he gave her it and subsequently had intercourse with her or had intercourse with her and subsequently gave it to her the hire is permitted but if he gave it to her and subsequently had intercourse with her since he did have intercourse with her Talmud, Mas Abedazara the prohibition of the harlot's hire should apply. Retrospectively to the animal our Eliezer replied it is permitted when she first offered it how is this to be understood if he said to her take possession of this at once then obviously it is permitted because it is no longer there at the time of intercourse and he merely presented her with a gift but if he had not said to her take possession of this at once how could she offer it since the all merciful has declared and when a man shall sanctify his house to be holy as the house which he Sanctifies must be in his possession so must everything which is dedicated to the sanctuary be in the person's possession rather must we suppose the circumstance where he said to her let it be with you until the time of intercourse but should you require it then take possession of it at once our hashai asked how is it if she dedicated the animal to the sanctuary beforehand since a master has said that a declaration in connection with the divine service is like the act of delivery in a secular transaction is she like one who has actually offered it or perhaps the animal is after all still in existence at the time of intercourse but why not solve the question from the statement of our Eliezer who said only if she actually offered it beforehand is the offering lawful but not if she merely dedicated it on the statement of our Eliezer itself the question is to be asked is it clear to our Eliezer that only if she had actually offered it is it permitted but not if she merely Dedicated it because it is in her possession at the time of intercourse or perhaps he is clear in the circumstance where it had been offered but doubtful when it had only been dedicated the question remains unanswered it was stated if he had intercourse with her and subsequently gave it to her her hire is permitted against this I quote if he had intercourse with her and subsequently gave it to her even after the lapse of three years her hire is prohibited our nomin B. Isaac said in the name of our Arhistah there is no contradiction the latter teaching referring to the circumstance where he said to her have intercourse with me for this lamb and the former teaching to the circumstance where he said to her have intercourse with me for a lamb and if he did use the phrase for this lamb what of it inasmuch as the act of drawing towards oneself is lacking it deals here with a gentile harlot who does not acquire an object by the act of drawing it towards herself or if you wish I can say that it surely deals with an Israelite harlot when e.g. it is standing in her courtyard but if it was standing in her courtyard how can it be taught that he had intercourse with her and subsequently presented it to her seeing that she already had possession of it no it is necessary to suppose a case where he used it as a pledge saying to her if I bring you a certain number of zoos by such a date well and good otherwise take the lamb for your hire or she's hate quoted in objection a man can say to his ass drivers and workmen go and eat for this dinar go out and drink for this dinar and he need not be concerned Talmud, Mas Abed Azara be about their eating and drinking the produce of the sabbatical year or what has not been subject to the tithe or yen nizek, but if he said to them go out and eat and I will pay go out and drink and I will pay he must be concerned about their eating and drinking the produce of the sabbatical year or what has not been subject to the tithe or yen. Nizek consequently when he pays them he does so at the price of what is prohibited and similarly in the case of the school of Arjane when they made repayment they did so for something that was prohibited Arhista explained the teaching just quoted deals with the shopkeeper who gives the employer credit so that he is indebted to him and since it was his custom to give him credit it is as though the latter had himself bought for a dinar of him when on the other hand he does not give him credit how is it it is permitted if that is so when he teaches the circumstance of go and eat for the steenarius go out and drink for the steenarius he should draw a distinction in this very case and teach as follows when does this apply when they make their purchase of a shopkeeper who gives him credit so that he is indebted to him it is prohibited but of a shopkeeper who does not give him credit it is permitted and further as regards a shopkeeper who does not give him credit it is not it. Employer in such a circumstance indebted to him for Rabbah has declared if a man says to his neighbor give so and so a mina and let all my possessions be surety to you the lender has acquired them by the law of security but said Rabbah it is immaterial whether he gives him credit or not but although the employer is indebted to him for the reason that he does not specify his indebtedness it is not prohibited why then in the present circumstance should he be concerned about their eating and drinking the produce of the sabbatical year inasmuch as he does not specify his indebtedness our Papa said here it is when he, he paid him the dinar in advance our Kahana said I cited this teaching in the presence of Arzibat of Nihartia who remarked to me if that were so then instead of the words go out and eat and drink and I will pay we should have expected I will have a reckoning with him our Kahana said to him red go out and I will have a reckoning with him or as she said it is when he, he did. Employer took the foodstuffs from the shopkeeper and handed them to his workman. Arjemar said to Arashi, if that were so, then instead of the words go out and eat, go out and drink, we should have expected take and eat, take and drink. He replied to him, Red, take and eat, take and drink. Our Naminullah and Abami B. Poppy were sitting together, and our high BM I sat with them as they sat. The question was raised, How is it if an Israelite was hired to break a cask of Yen Nizek and pour out it? Contents do we say that since his wish is the preservation of the cask, it is prohibited, or perhaps it is right in every case where the effect is to reduce what is improper. Our Naman said, Let him break it and may a blessing alight upon him. For so doing is it to be assumed that his opinion receives support from this teaching. We may not hold together with a heathen among mixed plantings, Talmud, Mas Abed Azara, but we may uproot them together with him in order to reduce what is improper. They maintained that the statement that uprooting is permitted was even according to our Akiva who said he who helps to preserve mixed plantings is liable to the punishment of lashes for it has been taught he who weeds or covers mixed plantings with soil is liable to the punishment of lashes our Akiva says also he who helps to preserve them what is our Akiva's reason scripture stated thou shalt not sow thy field with two kinds of seed I have here mentioned only of sowing whence is it that the prohibition applies also to preserving them there is a text to state not with the diverse kinds so deduce from this that if the purpose is to reduce what is improper it is permitted no we have here not the opinion of our Akiva but of the rabbis if however it is the opinion of the rabbis why specify we may uproot them since their teaching holds good even with the preservation of the plants with what circumstance are we dealing here when he worked for nothing and it is in accord with it teaching of our Judah who said it is forbidden to make them a free gift but nevertheless from our Judah statement can we not infer what is our Akiva's view our Judah having declared that it is forbidden to make them a free gift but it is all right for the purpose of reducing what is improper similarly with our Akiva although he declared that he who preserves mixed plantings is liable to the punishment of lashes it is all right for the purpose of reducing what is improper there is nothing further to discuss on this subject again while the aforementioned rabbis were sitting together the question was raised how is it with the price of an idol in the possession of an idolater does the prohibition affect the money which is in the possession of an idolater or not our said to them the more probable view is that the price of an idol in the possession of an idolater is permitted as may be seen from the incident where some would be proselytes came before Rabbi Abba and he told them go and sell all your possessions and then come to be converted what was his reason was it not because he held that the price of an idol in the possession of an idolater is permitted but perhaps it is different in this latter circumstance because having the intention of becoming a proselyte each of them must surely have an all his idolatrous objects rather may support for our nomin's view be obtained from this teaching if an israelite has a claim for a main against an idolater and the
Case of partnership it is prohibited that again the aforementioned rabbis were sitting together and the question was raised can a GER Tasha have annul idol must a worshipper annul it so that a non-worshipper cannot or perhaps anybody who belongs to them can annul it and he belongs to them or and said to them the more probable view is that a worshipper must annul it and a non-worshipper cannot against this is quoted if an Israelite found an idol in a public place before it comes into his possession he may ask an idolater to annul it but after it comes into his possession he may not ask an idolater to annul it because the rabbis declared an idolater can annul the idol belonging to himself or to another idolater whether he worships or does not worship it what means he worships it and what means he does not worship it if I say that in either case it refers to an idolater then it is identical with belonging to himself or to another idolater must we not then suppose that the Subject of worships is an idolater and of does not worship a GER Tashav and deduce from it that a GER Tashav can also annul no I can always tell you that in either case it refers to an idolater and when it is argued that it is then identical with belonging to himself or to another idolater the reply I make is that in the first clause it means when each of them worships peer or each worships Mercurius whereas in the second clause it means when one worships peer and the other worships Mercurius against this is quoted who is a GER Tashav any Gentile who takes upon himself in the presence of three Habram not to worship idols such as the statement of Armadir but the sages declare any Gentile who takes upon himself the seven precepts which the sons of Noah undertook and still others maintain these do not come within the category of a GER Tashav but who is a GER Tashav a proselyte who eats of animals not ritually slaughtered i.e. he took upon himself to observe all the precepts Mentioned in the Torah apart from the prohibition of eating the flesh of animals not ritually slaughtered we may leave such a man alone with wine but we may not deposit wine in his charge even in a city where the majority of residents are Israelites we may however leave him alone with wine even in a city where the majority of residents are heathens and his oil is like his wine how can it enter your mind to say that his oil is like his wine can oil become nizek the wording must be amended to his wine is like his oil but in every other respect he is like a heathen Rabban Simeon says his wine is yen nizek another version of Rabban Simeon's statement is it is allowed to be drunk by Israelites at all events it teaches that in every other respect he is like a heathen for what practical purposes is mentioned is it not that he can annul an idol in the same manner as an idolater Arnam and B. Isaac said no it is in connection with his power to transfer or renounce ownership is it has been taught an apostate Israelite who publicly observes the Sabbath may renounce his ownership but if he does not observe the Sabbath publicly he may not renounce his ownership because the rabbi said an Israelite may transfer or renounce his ownership whereas with a heathen this can only be done by renting his property in one way one Israelite can say to another Israelite my ownership is acquired by you my ownership is renounced in your favor and the latter has thereby acquired the property without the necessity of a formal assignment Rab Judah sent a present Talmud Mas Abed Azariah to Abed Arnon a heathen feast day saying I know that he does not worship idols or Joseph said to him but it has been taught who is a GER Tashav any Gentile who takes upon himself in the presence of three Habram not to worship idols Rab Judah replied this teaching only applies to the matter of supporting him or Joseph retorted but Rabbi Barhana said in the name of Aryohanan a GER Tashav who allows 12 months to pass without becoming circumcised is to be regarded as a heretic among idolaters. Rab Judah answered this refers to the circumstance where he undertook to be circumcised but did not undergo the right. Rabbah once sent a present to Barshashak on a heathen feast day saying I know that he does not worship idols but on paying him a visit he found him sitting up to his neck in a bath of rose water while naked harlots were standing before him. Barshashak said to him have you Israelites anything like this in the world to come he replied we have much finer than this. He asked is there anything finer than this. Rabbah answered there is upon you the fear of the ruling power but for us there will be no fear of the ruling power. He said to him what fear have I at any rate of the ruling power while they were sitting together the king's courser arrived with the message arise the king requires your presence as he was about to depart. Barshashak said to Rabbah may the eye burst that wishes to see evil of you to this Rabbah responded Amen and Barshashak's eye burst our poppy said Rabbah should have answered him by quoting the verse King's daughters are for thine honor at thy right hand doth stand the queen in gold of over Arnam and B. Isaac said Rabbah should have answered him by quoting the verse No I have seen what God and nobody but thee will work for him that wait for him if he hired him to assist him in another kind of work is his wage. Permitted even if he did not ask him to remove the cask of Yenizek towards evening against such a conclusion I quote if he even hires an Israelite workman and towards evening says to him remove a cask of Yenizek from this place to that his wage is permitted the reason why it is permitted is because he asked him to do so towards evening consequently if he was asked to do so throughout the day it would not be permitted Abbe said our mission likewise refers to when he asked. Him to do so towards evening, Rabbah said, even if we assume that our mission does not refer to the time towards evening, there is no contradiction because the second teaching deals with the circumstance where he says to him, Remove from me a hundred casks for a hundred perutas, and the mission where he says to him, Remove from me some casks for a parata each, and thus it has been taught if he even hires an Israelite workman saying to him, Remove from me a hundred casks for a hundred perutas. And a cask of Yenizek was found among them, his wages prohibited, but if he said, Remove from me some casks for a parata each, and a cask of Yenizek was found among them, his wages permitted, if he hired an Israelite asked to carry Yenizek, its hire is prohibited. What need is there for this to be mentioned since it is identical with the first clause, it was necessary on account of the continuation viz, but if he hired it to sit upon, even though he rested his jar of Yenizek upon it. Its hire is permitted is this to say that it is not lawful to rest the jar upon the ass against this I quote if a man hires an ass the hire may rest upon it his clothes jar and the food which is required for that journey but as regards anything beyond this the ass driver may object an ass driver may rest upon it barley straw and food required by him for that day but as regards anything beyond this the hire may object have said granted that it is lawful to rest the jar upon the animal. Nevertheless should the hire not rest the jar upon it do we say to him deduct the carriage of the jar how is this since the hire is able to purchase food on the journey the ass driver should also be allowed to object and should the driver not be able to purchase food on the journey the hire should also not be allowed to object our papa said no it is necessary to suppose conditions where one is able by trouble to make purchases from station to station and ass driver is accustomed to. The trouble of making such purchases whereas the hire is not accustomed to it the father of Araha the son of Araka Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi used to pour out the wine for heathens into their own vessels and carry it across the fort for them receiving from them the jars as the reward for doing so people reported the matter to Abe who told them when he lobbered he did so with what was permitted but it was objected he had an interest in the preservation of something that was unlawful. Viz that their skin bottles should not split no he had made a condition with them or as an alternative explanation they brought barrels with them but it was objected he carried them across the fort for them and consequently he lobbered with what was prohibited no he instructed the ferryman from the outset to convey the buyers across or as an alternative explanation they carried with them certain identification marks mission if Yenizek fell upon grapes one may rinse them and they are permitted, but if they were split, they are prohibited. If it fell upon figs or upon dates, should there be in them sufficient wine to impart a flavor, they are prohibited. It happened with Boethus Bezun and that he conveyed dry figs in a ship, and a cask of Yenizek was broken, and it fell upon them. So he consulted the sages who declared them permitted. This is the general rule: whatever derives advantage from Yenizek by its imparting a flavor is prohibited, but whatever does not derive advantage from Yenizek by its imparting a flavor is permitted. As e.g. vinegar which fell upon split beans tomorrow, but there is an incident narrated which contradicts the first clause of the mission. The wording of the mission is defective and should read as follows: If the wine affects the flavor adversely, it is permitted. And thus it happened with Boethus Bezun and that he conveyed dry figs in a ship, and a cask of Yenizek was broken, and it fell upon them. So he consulted the sages. Who declared them permitted a cask of Yenizek once fell upon a heap of wheat and Rabba permitted it to be sold to heathens Rabba Bilu I quoted against Rabba if mixed stuffs occur in a
Suffices to disqualify Raba on the other hand said that it must impart a flavor for the reason that we use the criterion of name and since they each have a distinctive name it is a case of one species being mixed with a different species and in such circumstances the disqualification depends upon the prohibited element imparting its flavor to the mixture we learned if Yenizek fell upon grapes etc. Now it is assumed that the reference is to new wine upon grapes and yet are they not disqualify only if it imparts a flavor no they are prohibited however small the quantity be since however it states in the sequel this is the general rule whatever derives advantage from Yenizek by its imparting a flavor is prohibited whatever does not derive advantage from Yenizek by its imparting a flavor is permitted it follows that we are dealing here with a case where it does impart a flavor what then Abbe, he explains our mission as referring to old wine which Fell upon grapes if wine vinegar becomes mixed with malt vinegar or wheat yeast with barley yeast. Abe said the mixture is prohibited when the unlawful element imparts a flavor and we use the criterion of flavor and since each has a separate flavor it is a case of one species being mixed with a different species and in such circumstances the disqualification depends upon the prohibited element imparting its flavor to the mixture. Rob on the other hand said it is prohibited. However small the quantity be and we use the criterion of name and since each is called vinegar or yeast they belong to the same species and a minimum quantity suffices to disqualify with what belongs to the same species. Abe said once do I declare that we use the criterion of flavor as we have learned spices of two or three different categories which belong to the same species or three species of one category are prohibited and may be combined together and Hezekiah said we are dealing. Here with kinds of condiments which impart a flavor of sweetness because they are appropriately used for sweetening what is cooked now this is quite right if you maintain that we use the criterion of flavor since they all taste alike but should you maintain that we use the criterion of name each of them has a separate name Rabbah however can reply whose teaching is this it is Armaeurs as it has been taught our Judah says in the name of Armaeur once is it that all the prohibited things of it Torah may be combined together as it is stated thou shalt not eat any abominable thing everything which I declare to be abominable comes within the law of thou shalt not eat if prohibited vinegar fell into permitted wine all agree that it depends on whether it imparts a flavor but if prohibited wine fell into permitted vinegar Abbe said that it is prohibited however small the quantity be and Rabbah said that it depends upon whether the forbidden element imparts a flavor Abbe. Said that it is prohibited, however small the quantity be Talmud, Mas Abad is Arabi because where the smell of the wine is that of vinegar and the taste is of wine, it is regarded as vinegar. It is then a case of one species being mixed with the same species, and in such circumstances, a minimum quantity suffices to disqualify Rabbah. On the other hand, said that it depends upon whether the forbidden element imparts a flavor because when the smell of the wine is vinegar and the taste is of wine, it is regarded as wine, and it is a case of one species being mixed with a different species, and in such circumstances, the disqualification depends upon the prohibited element imparting its flavor to the mixture. If a heathen smelt the wine of an Israelite through the bunghole, it is all right, but if an Israelite does this with the wine of a heathen, Abbe declared it prohibited, whereas Rabbah declared it permitted, Abbe declared it prohibited because the smell is something actual. Whereas Rabbah declared it permitted because the smell is not something actual Rabbah said once do I maintain that the smell is not considered anything at all as we have learned if they use cumin of a heap offering as fuel for an oven and bake the loaf in it the loaf is permitted because it absorbs not the taste but the smell of the cumin how does Abbe meet this argument it is different in this instance because the prohibited element was burnt Armari said this is like the difference between the following tanaim if a man removes a warm loaf from the oven and places it upon a cask of wine which is he offering our mayor prohibits and our Judah permits it our Jose permits it with a wooden loaf but prohibits it with a barley loaf because the latter absorbs the fumes of the wine is not the issue here that one master regards smell as something actual and the other regards it as nothing at all from Rabbah's viewpoint the tanaim do certainly differ on this matter but from Abbe's Viewpoint are we to say that the Tanaim differ on this matter? Abbe can reply has it not been stated in this connection? Rabbi Bar said in the name of Arsimian B. Lakish with a hot loaf and open cask Talmud. Mas Abed Azara all agree that it is prohibited with a cold loaf and a stoppered cask all agree that it is permitted. They only differ when the loaf is hot and the cask stoppered or when the loaf is cold and the cask open and the case under consideration is like a hot loaf upon an open cask. This is the general rule whatever derives advantage from Yenizek by its imparting a flavor etc. Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel such is a legal decision further declared Rab Judah in the name of Samuel this teaching only applies when the vinegar fell into hot split beans but if it fell into cold split beans and he then warms them the effect is to improve them and only in the end are they deteriorated and therefore they are prohibited similarly when Rabin came from. Palestine he reported that Rabbi Barhana said in the name of our Yohanan this teaching only applies when the vinegar fell into hot split beans but if it fell into cold split beans and he then warms them the effect is to improve them and only in the end are they deteriorated and therefore they are prohibited there was a similar report from Rabdimi when he came from Palestine and he added that they used to do this on Sabbath eves in Sephoris and they called them Crestish or Simeon B. Lakish said when the rabbis use the phrase it imparts a worse in flavor they do not mean that we are to say that a certain dish lacks salt or is oversalted or lacks spice or is overspiced but what they do mean is any food which is not lacking in anything and is not eaten because of this another version is our Simeon B. Lakish said when the rabbis use the phrase it imparts a worse in flavor we do not attribute the bad flavor to the fact that a certain dish lacks salt or is oversalted or lacks spice or is overspiced but we declare that now only it has deteriorated owing to the mixture our said in the name of our Yohanan whenever the flavor and substance of the prohibited element in a mixture are perceptible it is prohibited and one who eats it is liable to the punishment of lashes and that is a quantity equal to the size of an olive of the prohibited element mixed with a quantity equal to half a loaf Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi if the taste is perceptible but not the substance it is prohibited but he is not punished with lashes should however the unlawful element have intensified the flavor so as to worsen it then it is permitted let him then say more explicitly that if it imparts a worsened flavor it is permitted either by informs us that it is so even when there is another element in it which worsens the flavor and that the legal decision is in accord with the second version of our Simeon Belakish statement our Kahana said we learn from the words of them all that when the forbidden element imparts a worse in flavor it is permitted Abbe said to him as regards all the rest of them very well but since our Simeon B. Lakish has the words when the rabbis use the phrase it follows that he personally does not hold that view are we then to infer that there are some who maintain that when the forbidden element imparts a worse in flavor it is prohibited yes for it has been taught whether it imparts a worse in or improved flavor it is prohibited such is the statement of our mayor our Simeon says if improved it is prohibited but if worsened it is permitted what is our mayor's reason he derives it from the vessels of Gentiles the vessels of Gentiles do they not impart a worse in flavor to the food cooked in them and yet the all merciful forbade them so here also it makes no difference and it is prohibited how does the other is our Simeon establish his view in the same manner as our Huna, the son of our high who said the Torah only forbade a utensil which had been used by a Gentile the same day the effect of which is not to worsen the flavor what reply is made to this by the other even in the case of a pot used by a Gentile the same day it is impossible that it should not worsen the flavor a little and what is our Simeon's reason because it has been taught ye shall not eat of anything that dieth of itself nibble thou mayest give it unto the stranger that is within thy gates whatever is fit for use by a stranger is called nibble Talmud, Mas Abed Azara and whatever is unfit for use by a stranger is not called nibble how does our mayor explain the verse its purpose is to exclude what was tainted from the outset how does our Simeon meet this argument an animal tainted from the outset does not require to be specially excluded because it is nothing more than dustful said the difference between our mayor and our Simeon is over the circumstance where the mixture is improved by the Addition of the forbidden element and in the end deteriorates, but if it deteriorates in the first instance, all agree that it is permitted. Our Hega quoted against Ola if wine which is Nizek fell into
The mixture deteriorated from the outset and yet they differ. Our Zara said it is otherwise with dough because it is capable of fermenting many other pieces of dough come and here a feast of a heave offering and also some which was not wholly fell into dough each being sufficient to cause leavening and they leavened it then it is prohibited but our Simeon permits it if the yeast of a heave offering fell in first all agree that it is prohibited but if the non-holy yeast fell in first and then it yeast of a heave offering or mixed plantings it is prohibited but our Simeon permits it now here is a case where it deteriorated from the outset and yet they differ should you answer that here also Talmud, Moss Abed Azara B. Our Zara's explanation applies come and here the continuation of this teaching if wine which is Nizek fell into lentils or vinegar into split beans it is prohibited but our Simeon permits it now here is a case where it deteriorated from the outset and for all that they Differ should you answer that here also what will it taught our Hega applies is where it first improved and only in the end deteriorated do they differ in the case where it first improves and only in the end deteriorates for behold it taught if the yeast of a heave offering fell in first all agree that it is prohibited is it not then to be concluded from this that there is difference of opinion even when it deteriorated from the outset draw that conclusion why were the three clauses which are taught necessary it is quite right that he quotes the third because he thereby teaches us that there is difference of opinion even when it deteriorated from the outset the second likewise taught us that if it improved and in the end deteriorated all agree that it is prohibited but why quote the first clause since in the third clause where no improvement at all occurred the rabbis prohibited how much more so must they prohibit it where there was improvement have they said the first clause is Necessary because of our Simeon and the rabbi spoke thus to our Simeon this dough should take two hours to leaven and what caused it to leaven in one hour yeast which was prohibited how does our Simeon meet this argument when there was improvement it was caused by both kinds of yeast and when there was deterioration it was also caused by both but according to our Simeon the lawful and prohibited elements should be combined and render the dough prohibited our Simeon follows his own opinion this that even two prohibited elements are not to be combined for we have learned orla and mixed plantings may be combined our Simeon says that they may not be combined a mouse fell into a cask of beer and rab prohibited the beer some rabbis mentioned this in the presence of our she's hate and remarked he evidently was of the opinion that when it imparts a worsened flavor it is prohibited our she's hate said to them rab certainly maintains elsewhere that when it imparts a worsened flavor it is permitted here, however, we have an anomaly since it is something repugnant and people recoil from it, and even then the divine law prohibited it with the consequence that although it imparts a worse in flavor, it is nevertheless prohibited. The rabbi said to our she's hate, according to your argument, the creeping thing should defile whether moist or dry. Why then have we learned to defile when moist but not when dry? And according to your reasoning, semen should defile whether moist or dry. Why then have we learned it defiles when moist but not when dry? What, however, you could say is that the semen of which the divine law speaks as defiling is such as is capable of causing fertilization, and likewise here in connection with creeping things, the divine law uses the expression when they are dead, i.e., when they have the appearance of being dead. Our shimai of Nihartia objected, is a mouse something repugnant? Is it not brought upon the table of kings? Our shimai of Nihartia said there is no contradiction. For what is served at meals is the field mouse and what fell into the beer was the domestic mouse. Rabba said the legal decision is that when it imparts a worse in flavor it is permitted but what was Rab's reason for prohibiting it in the case where a mouse fell into beer I do not know was it because he held that when it imparts a worse in flavor it is prohibited and the legal decision is not in agreement with him or because he held that when it imparts a worse in flavor it is permitted. But a mouse in the beer causes an improvement to the flavor the question was asked Talmud, Moss Abed Azara how is it if a mouse fell into vinegar Arhilal said to Arashi such an incident happened with Arkahana and he prohibited it Arashi replied to him in that case the mouse may have been dissolved into pieces Rabba thought to apply here the standard of 101 since it is not less than with the heave offering in connection with which we learned the heave offering mixed. With the non-holy is neutralized when the proportion is one in a hundred. Our Talaf Abi Giza said to Rabbin, perhaps the case under discussion is like spices of a heave offering which fell into a pot of food. The taste of which is not neutralized. Our Aha estimated that with vinegar the proportion must be fifty to one. Our Samuel the son of our Ika estimated that with beer the proportion must be sixty to one. The legal decision in either case is sixty to one, and it is so with all things. Prohibited by the Torah mission, if a heathen was conveying jars of wine together with an Israelite from place to place, and it may be presumed that the wine is under supervision, it is permitted. But if the Israelite informed him that he was going away and he was absent, a length of time sufficient for the other to bore a hole in a jar, stop it up, and the sealing clay to become dry, the wine is prohibited. Our Simeon Begamaliel says a length of time sufficient for him to open a cask. Rest opera and the new stopper to become dry if an Israelite left his wine in a wagon or a ship while he went along a shortcut entered a town and bathed it is permitted but if he informed him that he was going away and he was absent a length of time sufficient for the other to bore a hole stop it up and the ceiling clay to become dry the wine is prohibited our Simeon B. Gamaliel says a length of time sufficient for him to open a cask rest opera and the new stopper to become dry. If an Israelite left a heathen in his shop although he kept going in and out the wine there is permitted but if he informed him that he was going away and he was absent a length of time sufficient for the other to bore a hole stop it up and the ceiling clay to become dry the wine is prohibited our Simeon B. Gamaliel says a length of time sufficient for him to open a cask rest opera and the new stopper to become dry if he was eating with him at a table and set some flagons upon it. Table and others upon a side table and leaving them there went out what is upon the table is prohibited and what is upon the side table is permitted and should he have said to him mix some of the wine with water and drink what is upon the side table is likewise prohibited open casks are prohibited and the closed ones are permitted except when he was absent a length of time sufficient for the heathen to open rest opera and the new stopper to become dry gamara how is the phrase it may be presumed that the wine is under supervision to be defined as it has been taught behold a man's ass drivers and workmen are laden with things which are ritually clean and though he be more than a mill apart from them his ritually clean things retain their state of purity but if he said to them go on and i will follow you as soon as they are out of sight his ritually clean things lose their state of purity what is the difference between the first and second circumstance that one is Permitted and the other prohibited are Isaac said the first refers to when he purified his ass drivers and workmen for the task if that is so it should apply also to the second clause and Amhiraz is not particular about the touch of his fellow if that is so it should apply also to the first clause Rabbah said Talmud, Mas Abed Azara B it refers to when the owner could come upon them by some bypath if that is so it should apply also to the second clause since he had told them go on and I will follow you their mind is at rest if an Israelite left a heathen in his shop etc if an Israelite left his wine in a wagon or a ship etc both the circumstances are necessary for if he had only taught the case of a heathen conveying jars of wine since the man thought that perhaps the Israelite would come and observe him but when the wine is left in a wagon or a ship conclude that it must be prohibited because the heathen could put the ship to sea and do whatever he wished to. The wine, if however he had only taught the instance of wine being left in a wagon or ship, it might have been assumed that it was permitted because the man would have thought perhaps the owner will come by another path or stand upon the bank and observe me. But when a heathen is left in his shop, conclude that it must be prohibited because he could shut the door and do whatever he wished. Hence he informs us that in such a circumstance the wine is not necessarily prohibited. Rabbi Barhanna said in the name of our Yohanan the difference is over a stopper of lime, but with one of clay all agree that he must have been absent a length of time sufficient for him to open rest stopper and the new stopper to become dry against the statement. The following is quoted our Simeon B. Gamaliel said to the sages, but if he bored a hole in a jar, cannot his stopping be detected either on the outside or the inside? This is all right if you maintain that there is difference of opinion when. The stopper is of clay and hence our Simeon B. Gamaliel teaches that the stopping can be detected either on the outside or the inside if on the other hand you maintain that there is difference of opinion when the stopper is of lime then it is all right as regards the inside since it can be known but as regards the outside it cannot be known our Simeon B.
Obviously this teaching agrees with Arsimi and Bigamaliel so why does Rabba mention the fact you might have said that the whole of the passage was taught by Arsimi and Bigamaliel hence we are informed that it is not so now since we have established the fact that the Halacha agrees with Arsimi and Bigamaliel is we need not be concerned about the possibility of a hole being bored in a jar and inasmuch as the Halacha also agrees with our Eliezer is we need not be concerned about the possibility of the seal being forged what is the reason that we do not nowadays leave stoppered casks in charge of a heathen on account of the vent Rabba said if Israelites were reclining a table with a Gentile harlot the wine is permitted because while lust would be strong in them Talmud, Mos Abed a desire for Yenizek would not be strong in them if however Gentiles were reclining a table with an Israelite harlot the wine which belongs to her is prohibited why because she would be held in contempt by them and be influenced to follow them in a certain house with stored wine belonging to an Israelite a heathen entered and locked the door behind him there was a crack in the door through which the heathen was discovered standing among the jars Rabba said all those which were opposite the crack are permitted but those on either side are prohibited wine belonging to an Israelite was stored in a house where an Israelite resided above and a heathen below once they heard a sound of Quarreling in the street and went out the heathen came back first and locked the door behind him Rabba said the wine is permitted on the ground that the heathen must have thought just as I came back first so might the Israelite have come back first and be sitting upstairs watching me there was some wine belonging to an Israelite stored in an inn and a heathen was discovered among the jars Rabba said if he could be convicted of theft the wine is permitted otherwise it is prohibited wine of an Israelite was stored in a house and a heathen was discovered among the jars Rabba said if he has an excuse the wine is prohibited otherwise it is permitted against this is quoted if the inn was locked or the Israelite said to him keep watch it is prohibited is it not to be supposed that the wine is prohibited even when the heathen has no excuse no the side of teaching applies when he has an excuse an Israelite and a heathen were sitting and drinking wine together the Israelite heard it. Sound of prayer in a synagogue so he arose and went there Rabbah said the wine is permitted on the ground that the heathen must have thought he will remember the wine at any moment and return an Israelite and a heathen were sitting in a ship the Israelite heard the sound of the ram's horn announcing the advent of the Sabbath so he left the ship and went ashore Rabbah said the wine is permitted on the ground that the heathen must have thought he will remember the wine at any moment and return. But if it is supposed that the heathen would not think so on account of its being the Sabbath behold Rabbah has said Israel the proselyte once told me when we were still Gentiles we declared that Jews do not observe the Sabbath because if they did observe it how many purses would be found in the streets I did not then know that we follow the view of our Isaac who said if a person finds a purse on the Sabbath he may carry it for distances less than four cubits a lion once roared in an Israelite. One press and a heathen who was working in it on hearing this hit among the jars Rabbah said the wine is permitted on the ground that he must have thought just as I am hiding here so also may the Israelite be hiding behind me and watching me some thieves came up to Pumadiv and opened many casks Rabbah said the wine is permitted what was his reason because the majority of thieves in that part of the country are Israelites the same thing happened in Nehardia and Samuel said the wine is permitted according to whom was this decision made was it according to our Eliezer who said when there is uncertainty about his entrance he is undefiled for we have learned if a person entered the fields in a valley during the rainy season and there was a source of defilement in a certain field and he said I walked in that place but I am not sure whether I did or did not enter that field our Eliezer says when there is uncertainty about his entrance he is undefiled but if the uncertainty is about is having touched the unclean object he is defiled no it is different there in the case of the thieves because there are some who open the casks to search for money thus there is a double uncertainty Talmud, Moss Abed Azarabi a heathen girl was found among jars of wine holding some of the froth in her hand Rabbah said the wine is permitted on the ground that she probably obtained it from the outside of the cask and although none was there anymore at the time she was discovered we say she happened to find some some troops once came up to Nihardia and opened several casks when Ardini arrived from Palestine he said a similar occurrence came before our Eliezer and he permitted the wine but I do not know whether he did so because he agreed with the view of our Eliezer who said that when there is uncertainty about his entrance he is undefiled or whether he did so because he held the opinion that the majority of the men who were in the troops were Israelites but if that is so this is not a case of uncertainty about entrance but uncertainty about touching since however they opened many conclude that they opened them with the intention of searching for money and so it is like a case of uncertainty about entrance an Israelite woman who dealt in wine left the key of her door in charge of a heathen woman our Isaac said in the name of our Eliezer a similar occurrence was once brought before our house of study and they permitted the wine because they maintained that she only entrusted her with charge of the key of a said we have likewise learned similarly if a person entrusts his keys to an amhires his things which are in a state of ritual purity remain undefiled because he only entrusted him with charge of the key since his things which are in a state of ritual purity remain undefiled this must be all the more true in the matter of Yenizek is this to say that the law of ritual purity is more stringent than that of Yenizek yes for it has been stated if a courtyard is divided off by pigs. Rab said that the ritually clean things of Behaber are defiled, but if the resident on the other side is a heathen, he does not render the wine of Behaber. Nezek and Aryohan and said also his ritually clean things remain undefiled. Against this is quoted if there are two courtyards, one within the other, the inner belonging to a Haber and the other to an Amhires. A Haber may lay out his fruits there and leave utensils there, even though the hand of the M. Hires can reach to it. This contradicts Rab's statement. Rab can answer you. It is different in this case because he can be regarded as a thief. Come and hear our Simeon Begamaliel says if the roof of a Haber is higher than the roof of an Amhires, the former may lay out his fruits there and leave utensils there, provided the hand of the Amhires cannot reach to it. This contradicts Aryohan's statement. Aryohan can answer you. It is different in this case because he could offer the excuse that. His intention was to take measurements come and hear if the roof of a Haber joined that of an Amhire as the former may lay out his fruits there and leave utensils there even though the hand of the Amhire can reach to it this contradicts Rab's statement Rab can answer you is there not Arsimian Begamaliel who shares my view I made my statement in agreement with Arsimian Begamaliel Mishnah if a band of marauders entered a city in peacetime the open casks are prohibited and the sealed are permitted in wartime both are permitted because they have not the leisure to offer libations Talmud, Mos Abed Azara Gemara I quote in contradiction to this when a city has been captured by besieging troops all the wives of priests therein are disqualified to their husbands Armari said the soldiers have no leisure to offer libations but they have it to satisfy their lust Mishnah if a heathen sent to Israelite craftsmen a cask of Yen Nizek as their wage they are allowed to say give us its value in money but after the wine has come into their possession they exchange is prohibited Gemara Rab Judah said in the name of Rab a man is allowed to say to a heathen go and settle for me the king's portion against this is quoted a man may not say to a heathen go in my place and give a bribe to the official Rab retorted you speak of a case where a man says go in my place and give a bribe to the official but the circumstance where I give permission is quite different and is the equivalent of he may however say to him save me from the official mission if an Israelite sells his wine to a heathen should he have settled the price before he measured it out the purchase money is permitted but should he have measured it out before he settled the price the purchase money is prohibited Gemara Omimar said acquisition by Meshika does apply to a Gentile you may ascertain this from the practice of the Persians who send presents to one another and never retract our Ashi said I Certainly maintain that acquisition by Meshika does not apply to a Gentile and the reason why the Persians do not retract is due to the spirit of pride which possesses them or as she said what is my authority for the statement that which Rab told the Israelite wine sellers is when you measure wine for Gentiles first take the money and then measure for them and if they have not the cash with them lend it to them and get it back later so that it should be a loan of money with them for should you not act in this matter when it becomes Yen Nizek it will be in your possession and when you receive payment it will be for Yen Nizek now should it enter your mind argued Rab Ashi that acquisition by Meshika does apply to a Gentile Talmud, Mos Abed Azarabi then as soon as the Gentile drew the wine to himself he
According to whom will this be? It will not be in accord with Arsimi and be Gamaliel, for if it were in accord with him, behold, he has said all of it may be sold to a heathen with the exception of the value of the yen which is in it against whom is this argument directed against Rab, but he himself declared that the Halachah agrees with Arsimi and be Gamaliel only when a cask of yen became mixed with other casks, but not when wine which is Nizek became mixed with other wine against. The statement of Amimar that acquisition by Meshika does apply to a Gentile is quoted if one bought scrap metal from a heathen and found an idol amongst it should he have drawn it to himself before paying over the purchase price he can return the idol but should he have drawn it after paying over the purchase money he casts the profit he derives from it into the salt sea now if it enters your mind that acquisition by Meshika does apply to a Gentile how can he return it Abay said because it appears to be a purchase in error Rabbah said is there a purchase in error in the first circumstance and not in the second but said Rabbah there is a purchase in error in both circumstances but in the first since he had not paid over the money it does not appear like an idol in the possession of an Israelite whereas in the second since he had paid over the money it does appear like an idol in the possession of an Israelite Mark Ashish son of Arhista said to Arashi come and hear even Israelite sells his wine to a heathen should he have settled the price before he measured it out the purchase money is permitted now should you maintain that acquisition by Meshika does not apply to a Gentile why is the purchase money permitted Arashi replied with what are we dealing here when he paid him the dinar beforehand Mark Ashish said if so I quote the continuation but should he have measured it out before he settled the price the purchase money is prohibited now if he paid him the dinar beforehand why should the purchase money be prohibited Arashi replied but according to you who maintain that acquisition by Meshika does apply to a Gentile why in the first circumstance is the purchase money permitted and prohibited in the second what you have to say is that when he settled the price his mind is made up to acquire the wine and if he had not settled the price his mind is not made up similarly according to my view even when he has paid him the dinar in advance should he have settled the price his mind is made up and if he had not settled the price his mind is not made up Rabbanah said to Arashi come and hear our high Abba said in the name of our Yohanan a son of Noah is put to death for stealing less than a paratise worth of the property of an Israelite and is not obliged to make restitution now if you maintain that acquisition by Meshika does not apply to a Gentile why should he be put to death because he caused trouble to an Israelite Talmud. Mas Abed is and what means he is not allowed an opportunity of making restitution it signifies that he does not come within the scope of the law of restitution if that is so I quote the continuation of the teaching if his neighbor came and stole it from him that man is put to death on account of it now this is quite right with the first circumstance because the original thief caused trouble to an Israelite but what had the second thief done in the latter circumstance to be put? To death consequently we must deduce from this that acquisition by Meshika does apply to a Gentile yes at conclusion a man once said to his neighbor if I sell this piece of land I will sell it to you but he went and sold it to another person our Joseph said the first one acquired it Abbe said to him but he had not settled the price our Joseph asked and whence do you declare that wherever he had not settled the price he has not acquired it he replied as we learn in our mission if an Israelite sells his wine to a heathen should he have settled the price before he measured it out the purchase money is permitted but should he have measured it out before he settled the price the purchase money is prohibited now how is it then how can you ask how is it then it is as we have stated perhaps the seriousness of Yen Nizek makes a difference come and here our EDB Abin said a similar occurrence came before our Hista who referred it to our who not the latter expounded it from it. Following for it has been taught if a man took possession of another's ass drivers and workmen and brought them into his own house whether he settled the price before measuring the fruits or measured them without having settled the price he has not acquired them and both can retract if however he unloaded them and brought them into his house then should he have settled the price before he measured them neither can retract and should he have measured them before settling the price both can retract a man once said to his neighbor if I sell this piece of land I will sell it to you for a hundred zoos he later sold it to another for a hundred and twenty Arkahana said the first man acquired it Rab Jacob of Nihar Pekot objected as to this man it was those zoos that compelled him the legal decision agrees with our Jacob of Nihar Pekot if the seller said to the would-be purchaser when the article has been valued by three persons we will settle the price accordingly even if two of the three agree on the price it must be accepted but if he said as three will declare the price to be then there must be three who agree on the price if he said when it has been valued by four persons then there must be four who agree on the price so how much more so if he said to him as four will declare the price to be if he said to him when the article has been valued by three persons and three men came and valued it and then the other said let three different men come who are better qualified our papa said he has the right to object our the son of our joshua demurred how can we know that the latter three will be better qualified perhaps the first three were better qualified the legal decision agrees with our the son of our joshua mission if an israelite took the funnel and measured wine into a heathen's flask and then measured some into an israelite's flask should a drop of the first wine have remained in the funnel then the wine measured into the second flask is Prohibited if he poured from his own vessel into a heathen's vessel the wine in the vessel from which he poured is permitted and the wine in the vessel into which he poured is prohibited tomorrow we have learned elsewhere and outflow a downward stream of water and dripping liquid do not form a connecting link to communicate either defilement or purification but a pool of water is a connecting link to communicate both defilement and purification Arhuna said and outflow a downward stream of water and dripping liquid form a connecting link in connection with Yen Ezek Arnam and asked Arhuna once have you this if from the mission which we learned and outflow a downward stream of water and dripping liquid do not form a connecting link to communicate either defilement or purification and you argue that it is only in connection with defilement and purification that it does not form a link but it does in connection with Yen Ezek in that case I cite the continuation viz but a pool of Water is a connecting link to communicate both defilement and purification and you must by analogy deduce that it is only in connection with defilement and purification that it does form a link but it does not in connection with Yen Nizek so there is no inference to be drawn from this extract we learned if an Israelite took the funnel and measured wine into a heathen's flask and then measured some into an Israelite's flask Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi should a drop of the first wine have remained in the funnel then the wine measured into the second flask is prohibited how is the wine left in the funnel rendered prohibited must it not be by the outflow so deduce from this that the outflow is a connecting link but against such a conclusion our Hayatot our mission refers to the circumstance where his flask forced the wine back therefore if his flask did not force it back how is it it is not prohibited may you then not solve from the foregoing that the outflow is not a connecting link no it merely proves that when his flask forced the wine back it is prohibited but the question whether the outflow is or is not a connecting link remains come and here if he poured from his own vessel into a heathen's vessel the wine in the vessel from which he poured is permitted hence what is between the two vessels is prohibited so deduce from this that the outflow is a connecting link but if the outflow is a connecting link then what is inside the first vessel should likewise be prohibited this is no difficulty because we have here a case where he cuts off the outflow nevertheless we do deduce from this that the outflow is a connecting link but according to your reasoning I will quote the continuation and the wine in the vessel into which he poured is prohibited hence what is between the two vessels is permitted consequently no inference is to be drawn from this mission come and here if he pours from a cask into a vat which contains yen. Nizek the jet of liquid which descends from the rim of the cask is prohibited Arshis hate explained this extract as referring to a heathen pouring out so that the wine flows because of his action but if it is a heathen pouring out what is in the cask is likewise prohibited what is disqualified because of a heathen's action is prohibited by the rabbis and they decreed only against what issued from the cask and not against what was inside it Arhis told the Israelite wine dealers. When you measure wine for heathens either cut off the outflow or pour it in with a splash Rabbah told the Israelites whose occupation was to pour wine when you pour wine let no heathen come near to help you lest you forget yourselves and rest the vessel upon his hands and the pouring result from his action and the wine be prohibited a man was drawing wine through a siphon consisting of a large and small tube a heathen came and laid his hand upon the large tube and Rabbah disqualified. All the wine our papa said to Rabba
When the prohibited element imparts a flavor this is the general rule with the same species the mixture is disqualified by the smallest quantity but with a different species it is disqualified when the prohibited element imparts a flavor tomorrow when Ardini came from Palestine he reported that our Yohanan said if one pours Yenizek from a cask into a vat even the whole day long the former is all the while an old we learned Yenizek is prohibited and renders other wine prohibited by the smallest quantity does not this mean when the forbidden element fell into the permitted no when the permitted fell into the prohibited come and here wine mixed with water disqualifies when the prohibited element imparts a flavor does not this mean when prohibited wine fell into permitted water no when permitted wine fell into prohibited water if however the first clause deals with prohibited water the second clause must likewise deal with prohibited water but in the second clause he teaches water with wine disqualifies when the prohibited element imparts a flavor Ardini can reply to you throughout our mission it deals with the permitted falling into the prohibited the first clause when permitted wine fell into prohibited water and the second when permitted water fell into prohibited wine when our Isaac B. Joseph came from Palestine he reported in the name of our Yohanan if one pours Yen from a small cooler into a vat even the whole day long the former is all the while an old this applies only to a small cooler whose jet is not considerable but not to a cask whose jet is considerable when Rabin came from Palestine he reported in the name of our Yohanan if Yenizek fell into a vat and a year of water also fell into it we consider the permitted portion of the wine as non-existent and as for the remainder the water may prevail over it and annul it when our Samuel B. Judah came from Palestine he reported in the name of our Yohanan this teaching only applies when the ewer of water fell in first but if it did not fall in first a species met with its own species and is aroused there are some who connect the statement of our Samuel B. Judas with our mission of wine mixed with wine disqualifies by the smallest quantity our Samuel B. Judas said in the name of our Yohanan this teaching only applies when the ewer of water did not fall into it but if the ewer of water did fall into it we consider the permitted portion of the wine as non-existent and as for the remainder the water may prevail over it and annul it what difference is there whether our Samuel's statement is connected with our mission or Rabin's statement he who connects it with our mission does not require the ewer of water to fall in first but he who connects it with Rabin's statement does require it to fall in first it has been stated if Yenizek fell into a bat and the ewer of water also fell into a Talmud Mas Abed Azarabi Hezekiah said that should the mixture have become increased in quantity through the prohibited element then it is prohibited but should it have become increased in quantity through the permitted element then it is permitted our Yohanan however said even when it becomes increased in quantity through the prohibited element it is permitted our Jeremiah said to our Zerah does this mean that Hezekiah and our Yohanan differ over the same issue as our Eliezer and the rabbis for we have learned if leaven of non-holy and leaven of an offering fell into dough and in each there was an insufficient quantity to cause fermentation but added together they cause fermentation our Eliezer says I decide according to which leaven entered the dough last but the sages say whether the disqualifying matter fell in first or last the dough is not prohibited unless there is in it a sufficient quantity of disqualifying matter to cause fermentation but how can you understand the passage in this way for behold I may explain the teaching of our Eliezer only applies when he first removed the disqualifying matter but if he did not first remove the disqualifying matter the dough is prohibited now then with whom does Hezekiah agree but here the point of difference is whether we consider the pure wine as non-existent Hezekiah holding that we do not and our Yohanan that we do does however our Yohanan hold that we do consider the pure wine as non-existent for behold R.C. asked our Yohanan how is it if there were two goblets one containing secular wine and the other wine of a heap offering and a man diluted them with water and then mixed the two together and he did not offer a decision at first he gave no decision but subsequently he did for it has been similarly reported RMI said in the name of our Yohanan another version is RC said in the name of our Yohanan if there were two goblets one containing secular wine and the other wine of a heap offering and a man diluted them with water and then mixed the two together we consider the Permitted element as non-existent and as for the remainder the water may prevail over it and annul it this is the general rule with the same species the mixture is disqualified by the smallest quantity but with a different species it is disqualified when the prohibited element imparts a flavor Rab and Samuel both declare with all the prohibited things of the Torah should the mixture consist of the same species it is disqualified by the smallest quantity and with different species when the prohibited element imparts a flavor what do the words this is the general rule mean accordingly to include to include all the prohibited things of the Torah are Yohanan and our Simeon Belakish both declared with all the prohibited things of the Torah whether mixed with the same species or not they are disqualified when the prohibited element imparts a flavor with the exception of produce from which the heap offering has not been taken and Yenizek in these instances with the same Species the mixture is disqualified by the smallest quantity but with a different species when the prohibited element imparts a flavor what then do the words this is the general rule mean to include to include produce from which the heap offering has not been taken there is a teaching in agreement with Rab and Samuel and also one in agreement with our Yohanan and our Simeon Belakish there is a teaching in agreement with Rab and Samuel is with all the prohibited things of the Torah should the mixture consist of the same species it is disqualified by the smallest quantity and with different species when the prohibited element imparts a flavor there is a teaching in agreement with our Yohanan and our Simeon Belakish is with all the prohibited things of the Torah whether mixed with the same species or not they are disqualified when the prohibited element imparts a flavor with the exception of produce from which the heap offering has not been taken and yen in these Instances with the same species the mixture is disqualified by the smallest quantity but with a different species when the prohibited element imparts a flavor this is quite right with Yen Nizek because of the seriousness of idolatry but why with produce from which the heave offering has not been taken like its permissibility is its prohibition for Samuel said one grain of wheat can free the heave and we learn to the same effect when the rabbis declared that produce from which the heave offering has not been taken renders a mixture prohibited by the smallest quantity it refers to the same species but when it is with a different species it must impart a flavor Talmud, Mos Abed Azara omission the following are prohibited and render prohibited by the smallest quantity a cask of Yen Nizek and idolatrous objects skins of animals which have holes over the region of the heart and ox which had been stoned and heifer whose neck was broken birds brought as an offering by a leper. The hair offering of a Nazi right the first ling of an ass flesh cooked in milk the scapegoat and non-consecrated animal slaughtered in the temple court behold these are prohibited and render prohibited by the smallest quantity Gemara on what basis does the Tana make his enumeration if he enumerates objects which are customarily numbered then he should include slices of meat from an animal which had not been ritually slaughtered if they are objects which may not be put to any use then he should include leaven during Passover our high Abba another version is our Isaac the Smith said the Tana enumerates the objects to which both criteria apply because they are customarily numbered and may not be put to any use in that case he should include the nuts of brick and the pomegranates of batten because they are customarily numbered and may not be put to any use the compiler of the mission treated of them elsewhere and he enumerated a list of which he stated those which belong to Orla. Fruit come within the law of Orla and those which belong to mixed plantings of a vineyard come within the law of mixed plantings of a vineyard then he should include the loaves of a householder with reference to the law of leaven during Passover the teacher whom you have heard expressing this opinion is our Akiba and the compiler of the mission has already stated there are Akiba adds the loaves of a householder behold these what do these words intend to exclude to exclude things which are customarily numbered but are not prohibited for all use or the things which are prohibited for all use but are not customarily numbered mission if Yenizek fell into a bet the whole of it is prohibited for all use our Simeon B. Gamaliel says the whole of it may be sold to heathens with the exception of a quantity corresponding to the value of the Yenizek and it Gamar Rab said the Halacha agrees with our Simeon B. Gamaliel when a cask of Yenizek has been mixed with other casks but not when it is a matter of wine which is Nizek becoming mixed with other wine. Samuel on the other hand said even when it is wine mixed with wine similarly said Rabbi Barhana in the name of our Yohanan even when it is wine mixed with wine similarly said our Samuel B. Nathan in the name of Arhana even when it is wine mixed with wine similarly said
Only when he coated it with pitch, but if he trod his grapes in a press which had been covered with pitch, scouring is insufficient. This is obvious since the mission is stated covered with pitch. He might have said that the same law applied even when he trod them in it, and the reason why he stated the circumstance of coating with pitch is because he mentioned the customary practice. He accordingly informs us that scouring suffices only when he coated it with pitch, but if he trod in it, scouring is insufficient. As when a man came before our high and said to him, Provide for me a man to purify my wine press, our high said to Rab, Go with him and see that there is no ground for complaint against me in the house of study. He went and noticed that the sides of the press were very smooth, so he said, Here it will surely be sufficient with scouring. But as he proceeded with his examination, he noticed a crack at the bottom and saw that it was full of wine, so he said, Here it will not be sufficient. With scouring, but it will have to be scraped. That is what my uncle intended when he said to me, See that there is no ground for complaint against me in the house of study. Our rabbis taught us for the one press ladle and funnel belonging to a heathen rabbi permits them after scouring, whereas the sages prohibit them. Rabbi, however, admits that flasks belonging to a heathen are prohibited. What is the difference between one and the other? In the latter, he puts wine to be kept, but not in the former. Should the one press ladle or funnel be of wood or stone, he scours them, and if they had been covered with pitch, they are prohibited. But we learned if a heathen covered a stone one press with pitch, it may be scoured and is then clean. Our mission refers to when he had not trodden in it, and the quoted bury the two when he had trodden in it. The master said, As for the one press ladle and funnel belonging to a heathen rabbi permits them after scouring, whereas the sages prohibit them. But we learned if it was a burden where even though he peeled off the pitch, it is prohibited. Rabbah said this last clause of our mission gives the view of the rabbis. Rabbah expounded scald the bat when Rabbah sent empty jars to Harpania, he placed them mouth downwards in sacks of ham of which he sealed, being of the opinion that the rabbis decreed against every utensil into which wine is put for keeping by a heathen, even temporarily with what does one scour them. Rab said with water, Rabbah B. Barhanna said with ashes. When Rab said with water, did he mean with water and not with ashes? And when Rabbah B. Barhanna said with ashes, did he mean with ashes and not with water? Rather, Talmud, Mas Abedazara, did Rab intend with water and then with ashes? And Rabbah B. Barhanna intended with ashes and then with water? Nor is there any difference between them since one was referring to what is dry and the other to what is moist. It has been stated the school of Rab said in the name of Rab the number of Processes is two and three, but Samuel maintained that it is three and four. Thus they taught in Surah, but in Pumadi they taught the school of Rab said in the name of Rab the number of processes is three and four, but Samuel maintained that it is four and five. Nor is there any contradiction in the two versions, since the latter counts the final rinsing with water as a separate process, whereas the former does not. The question was put to Arabab, how is it with wicker nets used by Gentiles? Arabab answered, You have learned the law if his wine press and oil press were defiled, and he wished to prepare wine or oil in them in a state of purity. The boards on the sides, the troughs, and supporting beams must be rinsed, and as for the wicker work, if it is made of willows and hemp, it must be scoured. But if a bast and reeds, it must remain unused for twelve months. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel says he leaves them from one period of wine pressing to another, and from one period of oil pressing to. Another but that agrees with the statement of the first ten of the issue between them is the matter of the early and late ripening of the grapes. Our Jose says if he desires to purify them at once he should pour over them boiling water or scald them with olive water. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel says in the name of our Jose he leaves them beneath a pipe through which there is a continuous stream of water or in a fountain with flowing water for how long and only the same provisions made with regard to yen. Nizek are made with regard to purification but is not the order reversed since we are dealing here with purification rather say they made the same provisions with regard to yen Nizek as they made for purification how long is known our high B. Abba said in the name of our Yohanan either a day or a night our Hanashi and according to another version our Hanabi Shein reported that Rabbi B. Barhanna said in the name of our Yohanan half a day and half a night our Samuel B. Isaac said there is no Contradiction in the two definitions, the former referring to the time of the spring and autumn equinox and the latter to the summer and winter solstice. Rab Judah said filter bags used by Gentiles if made of hair are to be rinsed if of wool they must be scoured and if of flax they must be left unused for twelve months and if there be any knots in them they must be untied wicker baskets and strainers used by Gentiles if plated from strips of palm fiber must be rinsed Talmud, Mas Abedazara. B of twigs they must be scoured and if of flax they must be left unused for twelve months and if there be any knots in them they must be untied it has been stated if an Amhara stretched his hand into a wine press and touched one of the clusters Rabbi and Arhai expressed different opinions one says that the cluster and all that is around it are defiled but the press as a whole is undefiled whereas the other says that the entire press is also defiled according to him who maintained. That the clusters and all that is around them are defiled, but the press as a whole is undefiled. Why should there be a difference? Since we learned if a reptile is found in an oil mill, it only defiles the place it touches. But if there is flowing liquid, it is all defiled. In this latter case, there is no division at all. But in the former, the clusters are separate. The rabbis taught our Jeremiah. Another version is they taught our Jeremiah's son in agreement with him, who says that the cluster and all that is around it are defiled. But the press as a whole is undefiled. Mission: If an Israelite purchases cooking utensils from even those which are customarily cleansed by immersion, he must immerse by scalding. He must scald by making white hot in the fire. He must make white hot in the fire. A spit and grill must be made white hot, but a knife may be polished and is then ritually cleaned. Tomorrow, it has been taught they all need to be immersed in a ritual bath containing a minimum of forty sea. Whence is this derived? Rabbah said, because scripture states everything that may abide the fire, ye shall make to go through the fire, and it shall be clean. Scripture has here added for you an additional process of cleansing. Barkeeper taught from the text, nevertheless, it shall be purified with the water of separation. I might have inferred that a Gentile's utensil requires sprinkling with this water on the third and seventh day. Therefore, the word nevertheless is used, the purpose of which is to make a distinction. If that be so, what is the purpose of the words with the water of separation? It signifies water in which it immerses, and it was necessary for scripture to write both, and it shall be clean, and with the water of separation, if it had only written, and it shall be clean, I might have thought it shall be clean means by any quantity of water. So the divine law wrote with the water of separation, and if the divine law had only written with the water of separation, I might have thought that it only becomes ritually clean at sunset as happens with an so the divine law and it shall be clean i.e. immediately after the immersion Arnaman said in the name of Rabbi Abba even new utensils must be included since old ones when made white hot are regarded as new and for all that require to be immersed Arshis hate raised the objection if this be so shearing scissors should likewise be immersed if obtained from a heathen Arnaman replied the scriptural passage deals with utensils connected with a meal Arnaman said in the name of Rabbi Abba the teaching only applies to utensils which are purchased as then happened but not when they are borrowed our Isaac B. Joseph bought a vessel made from a mixture of earth and animals or from a heathen and thought to immerse it a certain rabbi named our Jacob said to him it was explained to me by our Yohanan that the scriptural passage deals only with utensils of metal or Ashi said utensils of Glass since they can be repaired when broken are like utensils of metal as for a glazed utensil are aha and rub and a different one maintains that it must be treated according to its original state while the other maintains that it must be treated according to its final state the legal decision is that it must be treated according to its final state the question was asked how is it with a new vessel which had been given by a heathen as a pledge Mar son of Arashi said a heathen deposited a silver goblet with my father as a pledge and he immersed it and drank from it but I do not know whether it was because he considered a pledge to be the same as a bought article or for the reason that he saw that the heathen's intention was to leave it with him or rabbis taught if an Israelite purchases cooking utensils from a heathen the unused articles are to be immersed and are then clean as for those which were used for cold things such as cups jugs and flasks they must be rinsed and Immersed and are then clean, but as for those which were used for hot things such as boilers, kettles, and heating vessels, they must be scalded and immersed and are then clean. Utensils used with fire such as
To our sheesh hate we learn a spit and grill must be made white hot but it has been learned with reference to the holy flesh a spit and grill must be scalded with boiling water he replied Amram my son what have the sacred utensils to do with Gentiles vessels since the former absorbed what is permitted and the latter what is prohibited Rabbah said at all events what they discharge is prohibited but said Rabbah what does the term Hagala scalding imply America and Shetaf rinsing and washing Abbe? Said to him what comparison is this America and Shetaf are with cold water whereas Hagala applies to boiling water but said Abbe let his fellow tell concerning him here in the Mishnah he taught that it must be made white hot and scalding also applies and there in connection with the holy flesh he taught that they must be scalded and making them white hot also applies Rabbah answered him if that be so let him teach both in one passage and one of them in the other and then it would be Possible to say, let his fellow tell concerning him, but said Rabbah, in the case of the holy flesh, the cleansing of the vessels by means of scalding follows the reason given by Arnaman in the name of Rabbah Abu Every day scalding was carried out with respect to the preceding day's offerings. This is quite right with the peace offerings which could be eaten on the second day after the sacrificial act. In this case, the process of scalding would be performed before the traces of the offering became left over with the sin offering. However, since it must be eaten the same day as sacrifice and the following night when he cooks today a sin offering, there would be traces thereof left over. So if he further cooked in it on the morrow, either a peace offering or sin offering, then what was left over of today's sin offering would be discharged into the sin offering or peace offering of the next day. I can reply, it is not necessary to arrive at such a conclusion for if he cooks. Today is sin offering, then he again cooks today a peace offering so that the time limit of the morrow's sin offering and the peace offering of the preceding day will expire simultaneously, and then he may cook in it the morrow's peace offering. If that be so, then scalding would likewise be unnecessary. This indeed is a difficulty. Our Papa said the reason is that one is encrusted and the other is not. Our Ashi said the reason is certainly as was originally explained, viz. in the former day. Absorbed what is permitted and in the latter what is prohibited, and as for your objection that what it gives forth when it discharges is prohibited, the reply is that at the time of discharging there is nothing which is prohibited apparent for how long must they be made white hot. Armani said until the accretion falls off, and how is scalding done? Arhuna said a small vessel must be placed inside a large vessel, what however is to be done with a large vessel come and here there was a pot in it. House of Arakibai which had to be scalded so he made for it Talmud, Mas Abed Azarabi a rim of dough around its mouth and filled it with water which he boiled up Rabbah said who could have been clever enough to do this if not Arakibai who is a great man he was of the opinion that as a vessel absorbs so it discharges as its rim absorbs by the splashings of the food which is cooked in the pot so the boiling water would cause the rim to discharge by means of the splashings but a knife may be polished and is then ritually clean Arak Babi Hama said one plunges it ten times in soil Arhuna the son of Ar Joshua said that is in until soil Arkahana said this holds good only of a knife which is in sound condition and has no notches it has been also taught to the same effect with a knife in sound condition and without notches one plunges it ten times in soil Arhuna the son of Ar Joshua said this holds good only to eat cold food with it thus Marjuda and Badi Bitobi were Sitting with King Shippur and a citron was set before them. The king cut a slice and ate it, and then cut a slice and handed it to Badi B. Tobi. After that, he stuck the knife ten times in the ground, cut a slice of the citron, and handed it to Marjuda. Badi B. Tobi said to the king, "Am I not an Israelite?" He replied, "Of him I am certain that he is observant of Jewish law, but not of you." According to another version, he said to him, "Remember what you did last night." 